applied statistics, which is jointly organized by, actually it is organized by Adarsh College Vita and in collaboration with uh, Shivaji University Statistics Teachers Association. So I welcome once again, all of you. And uh, I request uh, Professor, uh, sorry, uh, Principal uh, BG Kode, sir, Give his uh, welcome talk uh, about and uh, some of the today's conference. I request uh, Principal BG Kore, sir, to give his welcome address and uh, theme of today's conference. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning, everybody in this August gathering. Very much happy to be here. To welcome you all in the international conference on recent advances in applied statistics on the online mode. Chief guest of the inaugural function, Honorable Professor Dr. D.P. Chirke, Vice Chancellor, Shivaji University, Kolapur, keynote speaker, Honorable Professor Dr. Sanjay Shete, University of Texas, USA, Founder President of Loknete Honorable Hanmantra Patil Charitable Trust, Honorable Advocate Sadashira Bhav Patil, President of the our Samstha and Senate Member of Shivaji University, Kolapur, Honorable Advocate Vaibhav Dada Patil, Executive Director, Honorable P.T. Patil sir, invited speakers, Honorable Dr. Mrs. Sharda Bhatt, Karnataka University, Darwad, Mr. Vikesh Tarayekar, Principal Statistics Programmer, Sinus Health, Netherlands, Professor Dr. Arel Sinde, North Maharashtra University, Jarga, Professor Dr. V.B. Gutte, Solapur University, Solapur, Chairpersons, Professor Dr. Ramnathan, Savitri Bhai Pune, Pune University, Pune, Professor Dr. P.G. Dixit, Modern College, Pune, Professor Dr. Kalgunda Sir, New College, Kolapur, Dr. D.M. Sakte, Central University of Tamil Nadu, Professor Avsaib Latpate, Savitri Bhai Pune, Pune University, Pune, Professor A.N. Vasugde, Principal Rajaram Bapu College of Sugar Technology, Islampur, Professor Dr. M.K. Pati, in charge principal, PVP Mahal Dele Kotimanka, chief guest of the electric function, Professor Dr. Mrs. S.B. Munnodi, Department of Statistics, Karnataka University, Tarwat, all the participants, organizing committee members, advisory committee members, equity coordinator Dr. Sambhaji Shinde, and all teaching and non teaching staff of the others college Vita. I am very much thankful to Founder President Honorable Advocate Sadashiro Bhavati, President Honorable Advocate Vaibhav Dada Party, and Executive Director Honorable P.T. Patil Sahib for their kind support and best wishes for organizing this conference. I welcome to Chief Guest of this inaugural function, Honorable Professor Dr. D.T. Sethi Sir, Vice Chancellor Shivaji University, Kolhapur, and I express my special thanks to him for accepting our invitation in spite of his busy schedule and present here in this inaugural function and making conference grand success. Also, I welcome to keynote speaker, my friend, Honorable Professor Dr. Sanjay Sethi, University of Texas, USA, and I express special thanks to him also for accepting our invitation in spite of his busy schedule and present here in this inaugural function. He is the key person for making this in conference as an international conference. I welcome you all, more than 106 participants here are made registrations for various from various states of India and abroad and many more participants are joined online on the live mode on YouTube. Now I want to say something about our college and this conference. Others college is located in Vita in Sangli district 
and ability to Shivaji University Kolapur. Look at the Honorable Hanmantra Patil Jayatikal just established this other college in June 1999. The college offers UG courses in BA, BCOM, BSc, BCA, PG courses in economics, Hindi and history. Distance education is also provided by the college. NSS and sports facilities are provided in the college. More than 1400 students are taking education in this college. Administrative building, spacious lecture halls, well-equipped and spacious laboratories, well-stacked library, ladies hostel, dedicated faculties, internet facilities, viewing tank, indoor and outdoor sport facilities. Our college is working as a lead college under the Swaj University Kolab. Presently, the Samstha runs successfully in all 18 units, including senior college, junior college, engineering college, polytechnic college, secondary schools, nursing school, primary schools, nursing, nursery school, public schools, B farm and D farm college, industrial training center, YCMUU center. Now about our statistic department. Statistics play plays a key role in the development of modern science management and many other important applied areas. Within this, with this aim, the Department of Statistics established in 2019 to attain excellence in teaching and research. The department runs BSc1, BSc2, BSc3, BCOM2, BCA2, UG courses. Apart from this teaching, the department has actively participated in research activity and to develop students' overall development. Many alumni of department are currently working in India. Department is trying to contribute to the development of students by innovative teaching, learning, and various research activities. About our Vita city, Vita is a beautiful city in Sangli district. It is very famous for the gold refinery industry, grapes growers, borewell business, poultry farm runners, sugar industry, and spinning mills. The holy place of God, Raven Siddha, is just nine kilometers away from the Vita. Vita is the on the route of Karad Pandarpur State Highway and Sangli Baramati State Highway. Last year, Vita City had achieved number one city award in the India for clean city. Now, the objectives of the conference. The conference aims to bring together researchers, academicians, and corporate people in statistical theory to a common platform, exchange of new innovations and ideas through novel ways, inspiring the young minds to galvanize the research area and expand his scientific horizons of statistical thinking are the important objectives of the conference. It also provides the premier interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary forum for researchers, practitioners and educators to present and discuss the most advanced developments, trends and concerns, practical challenges encountered and the solutions adopted in the field of applied statistics. Now for the participants and case, take active participation in academic programs of the conference. Lastly, I am requesting you all, please stick up with the given time schedule and contribute in, contribute in the in the success of the conference. Once again, I warm welcome you all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, sir, for your welcome speech and uh, expressing the uh, theme of conference. Uh, now I <coughs> request Ms. M. A. Kamali, Madam, Organizing Secretary of today's conference, introduce our today's uh, Chief Guest Honorable Professor Dr. D.P. Shikhtesar, uh, Vice Chancellor, Shivaji University, Kolhapur. Kamale, madam. Good morning to all of you. It's my pleasure to introduce Chief Guest Professor Dr. D.P. Shirke, Honorable Vice Chancellor, Shivaji University, Kolhapur. I introduce shortly to him. He has completed his graduation from the Vivekananda College, Kolhapur, and completed post-graduation from Shivaji University, Kolhapur. He got the PhD from Shivaji University, Kolhapur. He has achieved a CSR 
fellowship for his research. He has the vast administrative experience in Shivaji University, Kolhapur. He has got many credits, achievements, rewards, and awards. He has chairman of many committees of Shivaji University, Kolhapur. He has a 33 years research experience as well as the research collaboration with many institutions in India and abroad. I welcome to you, sir. If at the first you do not succeed, try to the more times. Try to the more times so that your failure is statistically significant. It's my pleasure to introduce the keynote speaker, Honorable Professor Dr. Sanjay Shete, University of the Texas, USA. I introduced him in short. He has completed graduation, post-graduation, MPhil, and from Shivaji University, Kolhapur. He got PhD from the University of the Georgia. He was a member of the Ethical, Legal, Social Issue Committee and currently member of Statistic Scientific Program of the International Genetic Epidemiology Society. He is a fellow of the American Statistical Association. Currently, he is an auditor in the chief of the Genetic Epidemiology Journal. He has got many credits, achievements, rewards, and the awards. I welcome to you, sir. Thank you, sir. At least, sir, continue. Yes, thank you, madam, for your deep introduction about today's chief guest and speaker. Now, may I request? Uh, Honorable Professor Dr. D. P. Shirke, sir, uh, to yeah. give his inaugural you know, address. Very good morning to all of you. I, I hope uh, I'm audible. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You're audible. So, on the occasion of uh, inaugural function of virtual international conference on recent advances in applied statistics. Uh, the keynote speaker, uh, Professor Sanjay Shete, Professor at uh, MD Anderson Cancer Institute, University of Texas. Um, many eminent statisticians who have joined to this particular uh, international conference online in virtual mode, uh, Professor Aril Shinde, Professor uh, V.B. Gute, Professor Sharda Bhatt. Uh, I could not see Vikesh Tarlekar, but uh, he will also be, hopefully will be here and or will be joining soon. Uh, I'm glad to see that uh, uh, Professor Ramnathan, uh, Professor P.G. Dikshit, uh, Professor Sakte, uh, and uh, Dr. Monoli will also be joining to this particular conference uh, at some or other stage. Um, a good number of uh, research scholars, the teachers of affiliated colleges, not only of Shivaj University, but um, outside university and other universities as well. Uh, and the, the organizer of this particular conference, uh, Principal Dr. Uh, B.G. Kore, who has always shown uh, a very active role uh, in the field of statistics research organizing such kind of uh, innovative events. I would say that uh, such conferences are zero budget conferences. Uh, principal is very, uh, I think a very studied person and he knows that how to carry out this kind of organization, uh, how to organize this kind of uh, academic events with minimum cost, I would say. Um, so congratulations, first of all, congratulations to uh, Principal B.G. Kore and his entire team and thanks and appreciation to the management of this particular Adarish College Vita for supporting all kind of support, for extending all kind of support to Principal and his colleagues. Uh, the theme of the conference is um, well known, that is uh, Applied Statistics and Advances in uh, Applied Statistics. And I'm glad to see that uh, in true sense, applied statisticians have gathered over here. Professor Shete 
has been working in the field of um, genetics, epidemiology, and cancer related uh, research. And he is one of the best known persons uh, across the globe, I would say. Not only in publishing the papers, but um, all kind of activities uh, related to applied statistics. We also have Professor Aril Shinde. Uh, you can see some of his uh, work um, in this particular state. Uh, I may recall some of the things which I have seen personally. For example, he has analyzed the data related to uh, crop insurance and the crop insurance scheme, uh, which was uh, uh, offered by state government and uh, how uh, it, it is going to be beneficial and what are the demerits of such kind of scheme. So it is a very, uh, we, we do talk about uh, use of statistics for all, but the use of statistics for farmers, hardly we reach to this particular sector of the society. And Professor Aryal Shinde is that kind of person. Uh, Vikesh Tarade is our student and uh, he is equally involved in data analysis in health sector. Uh, and of course, I'm not uh, saying that uh, rest of the speakers are not concerned with applied statistics. Every one of us is concerned uh, about the application of statistics and in the field of applied statistics, of course. But these people are directly in this particular field and uh, they are trying to get the data, first hand data, collecting the data against all odds, they are collecting the data and coming to a conclusion, recommendation, and uh, the facts. Uh, to the society, uh, through the reports, to the paper publications, and so on and so forth. So congratulations to all the invited um, applied statisticians for uh, their um, wonderful work so far, and I'm sure that they will continue to do in the future also. Um, the next thing is that uh, we have got a very uh, big uh, gathering of uh, young uh, statisticians. Uh, young statisticians in the sense that um, either they are entering the field of research or they are part of the field of research or they will be continuing the this particular research. Uh, especially if there are some students, means master students or uh, uh, doctoral students, uh, research scholars, uh, my advice to them is that uh, we always talk about, uh, we say that we are everywhere. You name the field, we are there. We, we say about that and we proudly say that. And of course, our role is to apply statistical knowledge, statistical techniques, tools, and uh, come up with a solution to the, the problem they are facing. But the, the crux of the matter is how do you get the data? And uh, most of the times, uh, collection of data is a huge task, a very difficult task. And uh, Professor Shete knows how difficult it is. And you have to spend uh, millions of dollars to collect the data. Uh, I am I'm, I'm aware of the fact that sometimes you have to pay to the people for collecting the data also. So data collection is a huge task, needs to be done systematically. And of course, I'm not going into details of theoretical uh, background for data collection and all those things. All of you are aware of that particular fact. Uh, but at the same time, those uh, who are short of funds and still they want to work in a uh, applied field, I think um, thanks to the era of uh, automation, thanks to the era of uh, internet, um, you can find huge data available in the public domain. Literally huge data available in the public domain. Only thing is that you have to open your eyes and look at these kind of data sets available in the public domain. For example, uh, maybe in the, in the last week or this week, I, I don't know, but um, one of our uh, uh, alumni, um, Mr. Um, B.J. Jagdale shared the economic survey of Maharashtra uh, on our statistics group. So it is a document of maybe about uh, more than 300 pages. You can see that. So uh, Director of Statistics and Economics, Economics and Statistics of Government of Maharashtra has published this and they keep on publishing uh, periodically. So you have uh, issues on this particular survey. So don't you think that the data is available over there? So huge data is available there. As far as the health is concerned, um, sometime in the last week, uh, I, I looked into that particular report also. Uh, there is a, a site uh, with uh, all kinds of details related to disease. And that is a global burden of disease. 
and they they periodically again they conduct that particular survey and put the global status of the health country wise status of health uh, disease wise status of the health and its severity and in the changing pattern and all such things and there is a, a a full fledged complete issue a lancet issue on this particular aspect and they have published all the papers related to that so you can uh, again find um, huge data over there not only this data but previous data sets and secondary data sets as well so there is no dearth of data as far as the these important uh, fields are concerned and for us there are two important fields is the one of the fields is farming and the other field is of course the health and of course there are some other fields also which are available wherein you can always find uh, suitable data which you should take up for uh, uh, analysis and come to a, a micro level uh, conclusion see these reports are giving you macro level picture but you can dig it you can slice it further deeper and deeper and you can see that whether you can do something on that particular thing and these are only two examples that doesn't mean that you don't have any other sources of data uh, but i think time is short and i need not go for all kind of such data sources available on internet or authenticated authenticated sites so you can find such uh, data sets available uh, across the globe it could it could be a, a state level data it could be a district level data and so and so forth for example those who are interested in political science and you can see that as soon as the uh, the results are declared you can uh, find the data world wise also so how many uh, voters registered their votes and party wise counts and so and so forth so these kind of things are available only thing is that you only have to know what are your the fields of interest and look only that particular field of interest and try to collect the data from the available authentic sources i am saying authentic sources don't go for a data which is available here and there so it may not be authentic also it could be uh, have, i think uh, you know the the issues that that may be possible uh, in this particular area so such data sets can be taken up and uh, you can apply your knowledge and while applying your knowledge you can find that there are issues uh, with the available tools and techniques you cannot address this kind of issues and the the next step of research starts over there so the first task is that whatever is available you will have to explore the the knowledge out of that and bring it before the society and the government and the agencies and of course the public also individual also and try to see that how best we can utilize our knowledge in bringing the society uh, towards the development or how do we help the the entire nation uh, for the development by using our knowledge so these are the some of the areas i said and uh, i'm sure that uh, similar or different kind of uh, work will be presented by the eminent uh, professors uh, young research scholars and there will be definitely uh, very uh, good deliberations uh, which will take place throughout the day um my best wishes to uh, the organizer and i'm sure that um, with this uh, with such a august gathering this is going to be a grand success uh, and i you can continue this kind of activities in future also because you are well known for organizing this kind of activities you are leader in this particular area and i hardly find a statistician who happens to be a principal and again shows a lot of interest in the academics because principals are burdened by a lot many issues and administrative work and uh, as a vice chancellor i know what kind of difficulties you can be uh, you might be facing every day in the in the administration but in spite of that you find a, the full day for this kind of activity and i made a point to be with you and support you and support your uh, entire team uh, for organizing such a uh, academic events uh on behalf of uh, university because this is a joint event um i thank all the invited speakers keynote speaker professor sanjay shete for being with us and um, i take your leave without uh, spending much of uh, time over here because we have got a senate today and i have to uh, join to that particular meeting uh, but i could not say uh, no to professor uh, gore uh, for because if statistics is there and someone is uh, asking about my presence it it becomes my duty to be there and i made it i think uh, with all the uh, the very best to all of you 
I take your leave. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, sir. Just for this, that, that, uh, yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, yes. I will. I think uh, I have to share the screen, right? Yes. I have made you post. Can you see? Yes, sir. So let us clap for this publication. Congratulations. Thank you, Thank you very much. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, shall I take you and leave now? Yes. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks to all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Pardon, sir, continue. Uh, Pardon, sir, you are muted. Yes, thank you, sir. No. Now I request. Yes, now I request uh, Professor Dr. Sanjay Seke, sir, uh, to uh, give his keynote address for today's conference. All right, so I think like uh, this was a very inspirational talk by our Honorable Vice Chancellor, um, Dr. D.T. Shirke. Shirke. Um, I hope actually um, it's recorded and some of the junior people particularly actually listen to what he said and um, take a lot of things from that because as he said, there's a lot of data out there. What is needed is to make efforts and when I was uh, reading uh, the pro, I was reading the um, when I was reading the program, I was so glad to see so many applied presentation um, that are so relevant to the local area. So uh, with that one, first of all, like, and I do want to thank like you know, my good friend, uh, Principal Honorable Horacer. Um, for organizing the conference, encouraging so many or more than 100 uh, people to attend the meeting because actually the meetings are not only just listen to talk, but I think that gives you opportunity to see what's going on, what are the other people are interested in it, and what's going on in the, not only in the world and now with the internet, with the Zoom, it, we're all coming together. And so, um, when he called me and he said like, oh, we want you to come there. And I said, I can't say no to you. I'm a student of Shiva University. So whenever I come, I, I had to uh, come and uh, uh, present at least what I'm doing. And, uh, and I'm happy always to help in any way I can. So with that one, I really first want to congratulate you for organizing the conference. And as um, Shirkesar said that, uh, statistician principle, a lot of work, and then uh, you still organize it. And then we have also Vice Chancellor, who is also a statistician. And uh, I think this batch uh, on the screen, I had like while uh, Shirkesar was talking, I had like three my classmate, uh, principal uh, Corey, sir, my one batch above me, Dr. Gute, sir. Uh, and then uh, one batch above him was uh, a ship kisser. So that's the three batches that I overlapped at one time. So I was so glad to see uh, all of your faces. So again, congratulations. And it's really, uh, I'm, I'm honored to present uh, today. So with that one, let me go ahead and start my presentation. And you can always uh, uh, put question in the chat or you can unmute yourself. Uh, if you have any question and then ask me uh, any question and I'll be happy to answer any question. So let me just go ahead and share my screen. You can see my screen, right? Yes, sir. Yes? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. So this is going to be a live talk. And I'll try to make it um, uh, at least. Uh, I always think that every talk should have something for everybody, at least something like, you know, uh, get some get some idea about it instead of trying to put lots of equations and a lot of things. So I'm going to kind of give some some of the uh, simpler example. And then um, so the methodology is not complex, but I think it uh, answers an important question, at least I, I think as, as an important question. Uh, 
So my next slide. Um, so I'm going to talk what is a Mendelian randomization. And so it's an, if, uh, it's an approach to estimate the causal effect. So when we do statistical analysis, we cannot really say something is causal or not. There could be something is associated, uh, means there is a correlation, but that may not lead, be the causation of the effect that we observe. So uh, the randomized control trials are the gold standard by which you can um, assign cause and effect. For example, you take the COVID vaccine and you are less likely to get the COVID or severe outcomes of the COVID. So there is a, the intervention is the vaccine and then um, the outcome is uh, a lower likelihood of getting uh, admitted to the hospital. So, but that kind of experiments we cannot do in the general population for all the studies. So even though randomized control trials are, because here we can assign people randomly to two groups. One you can expose uh, some intervention and other one you can uh, are the control or placebo arm. So that means there is no effect on them. There's no intervention on these people. Then you can measure the outcomes after some time. And again, you can measure outcomes in the control group and you can compare uh, how is the, uh, how what are the differences between those two outcomes? Because if the higher outcome is desired, then the those who had the medical intervention will have the higher outcome value, and with the controls will have lower outcome value. So you can compare that. But let's say if you want to do some study, and this is exactly by the way all the technology that's used and how the vaccine gets developed. So many people were on placebo and others were on the uh, mRNA-based vaccine. But not all studies you can do this one because of the um, they they're expensive. There are some ethical issues. So, for example, if we want to find out like what is the effect of the uh, some of the bad uh, exposure in the population, we cannot just say that okay, let's see like you know maybe one batch of students who are going to give this bad exposure. We cannot do that one to identify the causal association. So, fortunately, in some scenarios. There is what's called the Mendelian randomization. So it allow it mimics like a randomized control trial, which is the gold standard. But we cannot divide the people like randomly between control arm and uh, case arm. But the genetics, what we have, is randomly distributed from parent to offspring. And so some of the people will have some genetic variant. Some of the people will not have that genetic variant. And so they can act as exposed and control group. And the genetics are always, uh, you are born with it. So the direction is clear. And so that's always start at the beginning. And then you can again measure outcomes and you can compare the outcomes. So Mendelian randomization study actually uses the laws of genetics to anchor a direction. That way we can connect exposure to outcome in a causal fashion, similar to what the randomized control trial do. Um, so here is an example again. So here is, let's say we have an exposure and we have now an outcome. Um, so the question is, is there any association between that? Now what happens is many times there is a confounder. So there may not be any association between exposure and outcome. But you see that when you do the regression or when you do the study, you see that association. Uh, it could be because of many other factors, which is the confounders. Now, some of the confounders, if you can observe them, for example, age, uh, sex, race, um, you know, the other factors, um, you can measure it, then you can account for it in the model. So let's say you are doing the regression, you can adjust for it because you can observe it. But not all of them can be observed or not all of them can be measured. So when we are doing this study with adults, we, we really don't know what happened in the prenatal when we are in the, uh, inside our mommy's tummy. We don't know what are the kind of exposure we give and the water pollution, uh, the other environmental exposure. So those are difficult to measure. And so, but if those are impacting the exposure and outcome, you are going to see artificial association between an outcome and the exposure. And so that's the uh, problem that uh, we're going to look into. And so, as I mentioned, unobserved confounders can bias the causal inference. Now, 
how do we, uh, so it's the same figure I have. So what, what is needed is really what's called the instrument variable. An instrument variable is, we can be sure that that affects the exposure. So it, it doesn't have to be any genetics, it can be any variable that affects exposure and it anchors in this direction. So this helps us, and I, I'll show you the mathematical formulation. So then when you regress your outcome on the instrument variable, exposure on the instrument variable, you get some parameters. And in the linear regression, you can show that actually you can identify the directionality here. Now, the big question is how do you identify this instrument variable? How do you get that? Um, fortunately, we all have millions of genetic variants that we are born with. And they always come first because we are born with genetics. Uh, we don't start smoking and then we are born. We are born and then uh, uh, you know we have the exposure, and so that direction gets anchored, and that helps us to solve the uh, the problem of exposure with outcomes. There are some assumptions uh, because it, if it were so easy, then it will be done. But there are some assumptions that the genetic variant should not be associated with the confounders. Otherwise, um, uh, it will again create the reverse causality problem. But, uh, but there are some ways that we can investigate these assumptions and then we can avoid the reverse causation. Reverse causation means it's not the exposure that causes the outcome, but it's the outcome that causes the uh, exposure. And that reverse path, we can control it by the instrument variable, uh, also called the generic uh, variance. And because of these are typically genetic variants, and that's uh, and by the Mendelian laws of randomization, uh, Mendel's laws, the parents transmit genetic alleles to offspring equally with equal distribution. So that's really the the law that we're using to get the anchoring in one direction. So. <clears throat> Uh, so I mentioned that there are three assumptions though in this process. One is that genetic variants should not have direct effect on confounders. So that's no. Uh, so, and then second one is that the genetic variant should not be associated directly with outcome. It should be only associated with outcome via the exposure. And that's another assumption. And then the third assumption is that the, uh, there must be a direct relationship between genetic variant and exposure. So you must have this, uh, so the green is you must have it and the reds you should not have it. So those two red, uh, you should not have it, that's uh, crossed and then the green. So these are the three assumptions and if that can happen, then you can establish this arrow and also estimate the effect size. So the instrument variables uh, in itself, how to choose them, uh, because when we do the regression, we don't get uh, a perfect, predictor variable, R square will be very small sometimes. And some of those are called either weak instrument variables or strong instrument variables. And you don't have to have one, you can have multiple because as I mentioned, uh, genetics, there is uh, millions of genetic variants. So you can, you can get hundred of them. And so each one of them can be weak, but in combination, they can be strong. So each one may be explaining only 1% variation in your outcome. But maybe if you have 100 of them, maybe you are explaining about 20 to 25% variation, which makes it a strong predictor variable. Um, and there are ways to estimate that one. So I'm going to skip over that. So, so this is kind of known and people have done. Uh, and so what the problem that we are trying to solve is actually uh, not just the one direction, what if it's indeed like, you know, you have, there is a reverse causality as well, but we want to estimate this path and its uh, effect size and then the reverse path and its effect size. So this is called the bidirectionality. So your exposure affects outcome and also outcome affects exposure. This happens in the cancer field because you have some biomarkers so these are the, you know, maybe because people smoke and that changes their that changes their biomarker. And that leads to outcomes such as cancer. Now, when, once you have a cancer, the whole genetic architecture changes and that impacts the biomarker, the way the gene produces either protein or any other uh, function that the gene may have. So that's the kind of the bidirectionality is there. 
And so our goal is, uh, is actually in this paper is to identify um, the bidirectionality and also assess the effects of them and identify the accurate effect estimation. But what happens is I'm just giving example as obesity and type 2 diabetes because this is the data that uh, we have access to. So the if you see that um, uh, people who are obese or um, overweight, they tend to have type 2 diabetes. And also those who have type 2 diabetes, they tend to be uh, obese or overweight. So that's the dual pathway that we see that. But so we want to see like really how much one you need change in diabetes, how much it impacts the increasing obesity, or the other way around, how much one kilogram in weight increase, how much is the likelihood of obesity. So that's the kind of study that we wanted to look at. Um, uh, the example I'm going to show is the body mass index is the one way the obesity is measured. It's um, a function of height and weight. It's not just high weight, because if you look at like many athletes, um, a particular basketball player, they are very tall, and but they have um, big weight, but that's very good weight that they have. So this actually measures, um, it's a measure of obesity based on the height as well as the weight. And fasting glucose is what you do if you want to measure the uh, type 2 diabetes. So that's one of the things we're going to look at. And the goal is to identify these effect estimates. All right, so as I mentioned that it's not nonstop, right? Because it's a circular and it's a feedback going on. As you're aging, there are factors that are playing role. And that means, um, you know, your uh, weight is increasing and that's increasing your likelihood of uh, um, having higher fasting glucose. And then that's increasing. So it's a continuous process. So that's the feedback loop. And uh, so, the feedback loop can be positive or negative. So one naive solution for this one is just do these two separate equations. First thing is like, you know, you can just look into body mass index and use one of the BMI associated instrument variable and estimate this path size. And then other time use another uh, uh, instrument variable and then estimate this path. So just going back to that. So I have these two paths. I just separated them to, uh, into the two different parts. So that's a simple solution. Why don't we do this one? Turns out that you know when there is a, a bidirectionality, when you try to ignore that, the, your estimates you are going to get are going to be biased. So because it ignores the bidirectional relationship, and so so we really want to model simultaneously this equation and not independently. And so that was, uh, that is one of the goal. So, um, uh, and then also, so these are again, instrument variables for fasting glucose. These are instrument variable, which is the generic variance uh, for body mass index, because we need something on this side to anchor this direction. And we need also something on this side so that we, we can anchor that direction. Um, so now in notation, Let's say, uh, and so that was just an example, but let's say you have a Y1, one outcome, Y2 is another outcome. As I, in my example, it was uh, fasting glucose and obesity. And then there is a relationship GABA1, 2, and 2, 1 are the effect sizes. Then I have this my instrument variable X1, which is associated with the beta 1, 1 is effect here, and beta 2, 2 is effect here. And I have one confounder, which impacts both of them. Now I'm giving this as a one confounder, but if you have multiple confounder, it doesn't matter because you can just model it similarly. Really. So that's the, and then epsilon one and epsilon two are the random errors. I, either, and that could be measurement errors or all the factors that you didn't model in the data because uh, uh, they all go into the error terms really because there's no other location that those effects can be coming. So here's the equation that's written there. When I have y1 is my outcome, I have beta 0, 1, that's my intercept, plus beta 1, 1 times x1, that's this variable. Then plus I have confounder times beta c1, that's here. Plus I have this y2 times gamma 2, 1, which is here. Plus I have epsilon 1. So that's the equation that I'm writing. Similarly, one can write the equation for y2. And now if you can see that there is, again, um, we can't just ignore 
that there is a direction and there is a y1 on this side too. Otherwise, you could just simply, so doing the uh, two equations separately is really equivalent to saying that, oh, I'm going to do this, this equation, I'm going to estimate gamma two one, and I'm going to do this equation, and then I'm going to estimate gamma one two. By the way, I'm showing this one as a, what might look like a linear model, but it doesn't have to be because I'm not putting link function. It could be y1, could be the, you know, binary, or it could be sensor variable. Um, but in this particular talk, I'm going to talk only about the continuous variable because it's easy to show the uh, uh, tractable um, formula. Uh, when you have nonlinear regression, such as like you know, logistic or other spline related one, then uh, those are not, um, uh, um, uh, the solutions cannot be written explicitly, but there is an implicit solution. And I think with the computational power now, it really doesn't matter uh, whether you need uh, have to have an explicit formula because the goal is to estimate and not to show the formula. So based on this one, and uh, 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 having that recursive relationship, I can do this uh, recursive equation. And after under certain condition, I can show that actually this converges under some assumption as long as, for example, gamma one two times gamma two one, absolute value of that is less than one, it converges to this formulation. Now you may wonder, like, you know, where, how would I know that this is going to be less than, uh, you know, one? But there are ways you can transform your data, uh, and but you can't do it always. But whenever you can do it, then you have at least you have a solution for this one. So, uh, so what I'm going to show you is that. When you have this one, then you can, what you can do is you can regress your y2 on x1. So I'm regressing y2 on x1. Then the coefficient of that one is gamma 1, 2 times beta 1, 1 divided by this. So that's the coefficient of x1 when you regress y2 on x1. On the other hand, when you regress y1 on x1, you get beta 1, 1 divided by this quantity. Now the denominator is same. In this side, I'm getting beta 1, 1 divided by this quantity. Here, I'm getting gamma 1, 2 times beta 1, 1 divided by this quantity. Now, if I take the ratio, what will be left is gamma 1, 2. And so that's the simultaneous estimation. And similarly, you can estimate gamma 2, 1. So that's what I'm showing here is that when you regress y2 on x1, that's the estimated value, the coefficient. And similarly, when you, uh, you regress y1 on x1, you get this one, and you can take the ratio. Now, statistically, it's not going to give you an unbiased estimator because you have got, um, rate, uh, you have actually the whole quantity is estimated, but you can see approximately, uh, you can't cancel it, but you, approximately you can see that that <coughs> estimate of gamma one two. So that's going to be our, so this ratio is going to be our estimate of gamma one two. And once I get the, so this is what I'm trying to get. So this is the gamma one two I'm estimating. I can do the same thing and I'm going to estimate the gamma two one in the same simultaneous equation. So all I'm doing, I will, all I will be doing there is that time I'll be regressing y1 uh, in the x2 formula. So that's this coefficient. And then y2 also on x2, which is beta two two divided by that. And if I take the ratio, again, I get the other side estimation. So that's the estimation of gamma one two and gamma two one. So this is, you can do the simultaneous uh, estimation, which is what I'm showing you there. So this is how similarly you can estimate. Now, uh, probably this is my uh, the one of the most uh, last uh, technical slide. But I remember, I said like you know you don't have to have only one x one in your model because you can have many many generic variants. If you have a strong x one as a predictor of y one, you can use that one. But generally, it is not. There are many, many uh, you know, predictive variables that you have to use to get a good estimate and a good anchoring so that you can estimate that. So once you have, but the same methodology works. So you can use for each of these x1, x2, xk, you can simultaneously estimate each of those parameters. And then you can do the inverse variance, the uh, weighted estimator, ratio estimator, which is the most optimal way to uh, do the uh, weighted estimation, and that's how you can do the uh, weighted estimator. So it's basically est um, weighting your estimator by the inverse variance, and which is the most optimal way to do that.
So that's how one can do. And so this is, I'm going to call it, by the way, it's a ratio method because I took the ratio of it. It's a multiple IV so because I, I'm using multiple X's in there. And it's a bidirectional because now I, I use this simultaneously. I'm not taking them separately. Now, so this is a good estimate. But remember, I, while I was talking about it, I said that even though it looks like, uh, you know, if I don't have hacks, it looks like, yeah, I can cancel out and what's left is gamma 2 in here. But that doesn't happen because, you know, you have an estimate and then you are taking the ratio. So there is a, some bias that comes in there, particularly when there is a multiple uh, uh, instrument variable that you have to use. So what another alternate way one can look into that. So uh, just one comment here is that when there are multiple IVs, uh, the, the ratio method is slightly biased. But what you can do is that you, since you have the model, you can do the full maximal likelihood estimator because you can put the model, you can do the parametric estimation, and you can put the full maximal likelihood estimation. But what happens is that when we have this model, this is not the entire model because we the true model is always unknown because there, there could be many other factors that we don't know, and so we cannot model it. And so putting the full maximum likelihood means you assume that we know the full model, but we don't really know all the model. But what we know is only some features of the model. We don't know our entire model. So what you can do is uh, in that time case, so you use what's called the limited information maximum likelihood estimator, which overcomes the limitation of full uh, information maximum likelihood estimator because you don't have to specify the model entirely. All you need to know is the at least certain equation structure, and particularly that inclusive parameter of interest. And so that's called limited maximum information, maximum likelihood method. And that actually can really uh, help you get more robust estimates uh, compared to full maximum likelihood estimate. So again, this is the equation that I'm, I'm rephrasing the equation. The, so now, uh, the, I, I'm not going to go over uh, with the short time I have, um, but it's again bidirectional model and it's a limited information maximum accurate method. And so what you can do is like, again, you can put it in the matrix equation formulation and you can see that all these parameters of interest that you have, uh, gamma one, two, gamma two, and all of them are modeled there. And there's a way you can actually um, uh, uh, with assumption, like whichever the parametric model you like, typically on we always model the error terms as a normal distribution, and then you can estimate those parameters. So that's another way I'm estimating. So one, is, one way is just naively estimating as if there are two separate equations. And then we propose two equations. One is the bidirectional ratio method, and other one is uh, limited information method. So those are the two types of approach they use. Next, I'm going to show some uh, simulation results. And then, uh, so I'm going to skip all that, but these are the four methods I'm comparing. The first ratio means just a ratio method, but it's, uh, it's uh, doing it individually. By ratio is ratio method, but it's about it's accounting model correctly. Limited information is uh, doing it singly and by limited is the, using the bidirectionality. There are sets of parameters. We use some weak instrument, some strong instrument variable, and we measure the performance using the, um, median absolute bias or relative median absolute bias. So that way we can see how they do. Um, I'm going to uh, just tell quickly like what the simulation was. One was that when the model is unidirectional, actually the model is not truly bidirectional, but it is unidirectional, but we're going to apply the bidirectional model. And we're going to see how the model is robust when truly the data is simulated as a single direction, but we are assuming there is a bidirectionality. And then other time is there is a bidirectionality and you have a strong variable that instrument variable that you can you have access to, or you have only access to weak instrument variables. So those are the two, three scenarios that we have. So here, what, what I'm showing is that, and I'm not going to go over the numbers, is that the relative mean absolute, the median absolute bias, is lower when there is a bidirectional limited information model or the bi ratio method compared to the ratio or LML. So that basically what it's showing is that the 
uh, unidirectional or bidirectional method are doing exactly identical when the truly the model is unidirectional. So there is no loss of power uh, because you are doing you are over parameterizing it, but it's still doing good. Second scenario is showing that now that I simulated the data using the bidirectional model, so uh, and so the bi ratio and the bi limited information model is doing much better than the just naively applying the directional method. And lastly, um, I was showing that between the two ratio method and limited information maximum accurate estimation, uh, the second one does better because again, uh, it it doesn't do the all this uh, inverse variance. Because the problem is not the estimate, it's the problem is the variance gets estimated poorly when you have multiple instrument variables. And that's and because your overall estimator is based on the inverse weights, where uh, inverse proportional to the variance, that's where the bias comes from. There. So this is like, you know, we had done like this my work with my PhD student, and uh, we had done a lot of the simulation to look at a range of parameters and where. Uh, the method breaks and how they so these are the all the heat maps showing where that could be biased uh, when you have one thing is like for example you have weak instrument variables and there is a few of them then there's not going to be any gain like yeah so this method you can see the lighter the color is better for example the bias the more biased the darker it is but you can see it's still biased but as the number of instrument variable goes up, then it starts getting more lighter compared to the other methods. So in the field of genetics, it's not a big problem, but in the other field, it is a problem because they cannot get so many uh, variables that they can get in them. I'm going to skip over that. There's a lot more simulations. And um, we had actually, again, the data uh, with large amount of data. And I'm going to leave for, for one minute and then we, actually found that there is a relationship between the body mass index and the obesity. And then we estimated the effect sizes and they were quite well across different race ethnicity. And then they were showing significantly associated. So that's like kind of my scientific slide. And so this work is again done. She's my PhD student finishing and she's going to most likely join one of the company. Uh, Dr. Rajesh Talur is my student many, many years ago. Now he's a professor at, um, uh, at uh, University of Mississippi, and there's a funding from this one. And I will stop here, and I'm happy to take any questions and um, give opportunity to ask yeah. other questions. And again, before I end, like thank you so much for organizing, uh, Dr. Kore, sir. I think it is helping. Hopefully, it will help a lot of junior people. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Patil, sir, continue. You are Patil, sir. Yes. Thank you, sir. Sir, uh, Shetty, sir, thank you very much for your nice and bright presentation, uh, your keynote address. If anybody from audience wants to ask, Questions, uh, please ask quickly due to uh, time restriction. Good morning. Uh, I am Ramnathan. Sanjay, uh, this is Ramnathan. Hi. Uh, yes, hi. How are you? I am good. How are you? Yeah. Yes, I'm good. That was excellent. So I just wanted to, I mean, just out of curiosity, like if you have dependent kind of setup, like a time series kind of data, this rural, this restricted information maximum likelihood, has this been applied? Because causality is very common and then people satisfy there with grandeur causality. Uh, right. Of course, it may not be one-to-one -one that what you have discussed, but I was just wondering whether there is any application or this kind of thing there. Uh, I think there must be there. So uh, my next cha actually chapter, my student is working in like we're looking at the longitudinal data, but not the time series data. Okay. We're okay. looking at because these changes occurs over time, right? You know, it's not after set cross sectionally. So they change with the time. Yes. And so, uh, uh, yeah. So we're looking into the longitudinal model. But as far as I know, I don't think anybody has done even the, in the time series. And also, I don't think. You know, even at the beginning, I mentioned that one can look into the nonlinear models. Uh, I think right. it, in theory, can be done, 
but I, I, as far as I know, nobody has worked on it. I think there's lots of unknown and uh, there's a space to work on uh, these questions because the, uh, I think it's a, it has a lot of application, but the more complex model we start working on it, the math gets more complicated as well as, but with the computational, I think there are there are ways to solve it, but it, as far as I know, not many, uh, that not, nobody has worked on that topic. Okay, good, thanks. Thank you, nice sir. to hear your voice. Hello. Patrick says just continue. Your Patrick says just continue. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, due to uh, short of time, we'll stop here. Uh, now I request uh, Mrs. M. B. Shinde, madam. Uh, to you, of thanks. Good morning, all. I am here to propose vote of thanks. I thanks to Honorable Professor Dr. D. T. Shirke, sir, who was the chief guest of inaugural function. Now, I also thanks to the Honorable Professor Dr. S. S. Shete, sir, who was the keynote speaker of this inaugural function. I thanks to our Honorable Professor Dr. B. G. Kore, sir, for successfully organizing international conference. I thanks to all member in organizing committee and special thanks to all participants, teachers, and teaching staff of our college for their active participation. Thank you. Yes, thank you, madam. Uh, now we'll uh, start uh, invited talk. Professor, am I right? Yes, yes. So, yeah. So, first, uh, today's first invited talk is uh, Professor Dr. Mrs. Charma Bhatt, madam, and uh, she is from, from Karnataka University. And uh, title of her talk is Non-Parametric Approach to Estimation in Regression Analysis. Uh, chair of uh, uh, chair for this uh, session is Professor Dr. Ramnathan P. V. Uh, he is uh, from Savitri Bai Phule University, uh, Pune. I think much more introduction is not required for both of these. Uh, but madam, you continue. Yeah, shall I start? Yeah. Yes, please. Uh, am I audible? Yes, yes ma'am. Okay, so if I am fast, please uh, stop me in between. Uh, I won't be able to understand that. Uh, respected professor, so I uh, request. Yeah. Okay, so respected professor T. V. Ramanathan, chair of this session, professor B. G. Kore, professor D. T. Shirke, professor S. S. Shete. Professors from various institutes, invitees, and dear delegates. First of all, I congratulate Adarsh College Vita and Shivaji University Statistics Teachers Association for jointly organizing this online international conference on recent advances in applied statistics. I thank the organizers for this conference. Uh, the, for this conference and for inviting me to share my thoughts with this August gathering. Uh, now I will share the screen and continue my talk. So can you see the screen? Yes, madam, yes. Okay, so yes. the topic on which I am going to now share with you all is about non-parametric approach to estimation in regression analysis. I will be uh, sharing the thoughts 
of uh, the work that uh, I carried out with my present student, uh, Srinath, and the past uh, doctoral student, Dr. Bhargavi. I will be discussing on uh, what is regression analysis and applications of regression analysis in various fields, then non-parametric approach to uh, regression analysis, parametric regression analysis, then about non-parametric regression, what is non-parametric regression, and the approach to non-parametric regression, that is kernel regression estimator. Many of us know, all of us know that regression analysis is a set of, set of statistical tools for investigating and modeling the relationship among variables. So we are going to focus on relationship between dependent variable and independent variables. Dependent variable is also called as criterion variable or response variable or endogenous variable. Whereas independent variables are called as predictor variable, regressor variable, design variable, exogenous variable, or explanatory variable, depending on in which of the fields we are using this, we are going to use all these terminologies. Regression analysis estimates conditional expectation of dependent variable, that is average value of the dependent variable when the independent variables are fixed. In all the cases, function of the independent variables called regression function is to be estimated for estimation problem. Regression analysis widely helps in prediction and forecasting. The term regression was coined by Francis Gal Galton in 19th century. Then Udney Yule and Carl Pearson, they gave more general statistical context to this particular re regression work. And what we see is in the basic regression model, we have unknown parameters denoted by beta, which we call as slope parameter. Then alpha will be the intercept parameter, which may beta may represent scalar or vector. Then we have independent variables x and dependent variable y. So the regression model relates y to a function x and beta, and expectation of y given x will be f of x comma beta. To carry out regression analysis, the form of the function f must be specified. Regression analysis provides the tools for finding a solution for unknown parameter beta. And usually we have the method of least squares that we have been studying from our graduation. Under certain statistical assumption, the regression analysis uses the surplus of information to provide statistical information about the unknown parameters beta and predicted values of the dependent variable y. Application of regression analysis includes data description, parameter estimation, prediction and estimation, and control system. We have seen that it is used in various fields like engineering. Uh, usually, they may collect considerable amount of delivery time and delivery volume data, and regression model would provide more convenient and useful summary than a table or graph. Parametric estimation of the regression can also be used by chemical engineers. They use michaelis menten equation given by y is equal to beta 1x divided by x plus beta 2 plus epsilon to describe the relation between velocity of reaction y and concentration of x. The applications of regression involve prediction of response variable. We may wish to predict delivery time for a specified number of cases of soft drinks to be delivered and so on. Regression models may be used to control for control purposes. Chemical engineer could use regression analysis in developing tensile strength of a paper to the hard wood concentration in the pulp. Regression equation could then be used to control the strength to suitable values by varying the level of hard wood concentration. Regression analysis is widely used in biological, behavioral, and social sciences too. Trend line represents a trend long-term movement in time series data after other components have been accounted for in epidemiology, in finance, in economics, environmental sciences, machine learning. Now, I'm, I'm going to discuss on non-parametric approach to estimate beta 
in simple linear regression. Suppose x and y, xi and yi are taken from bivariate distribution fxy say, the simplest relational form among x and y is given by simple linear regression model given by equation number one, where yi is a response variable, xi is a predictor variable, and alpha is the intercept parameter, beta is the slope parameter. And we assume ei is iid, random errors with zero mean and finite variance. The slope parameter beta represents rate of change in y with respect to x. Familiar methods such as linear regression and ordinary least square regression are parametric. And non-parametric reg regression refers to techniques that allow the regression function to lie in a specific set of functions, which may be infinite dimensional. Legender 1805 and Gauss 1809 developed a popular method known as method of least squares for estimating the regression coefficients in simple linear regression model given by equation number two. And Gauss in 1821, uh, further developed the theory of least squares and including the version of Gauss-Markov theorem. We were impressed by this particular paper, Bose 1938. He developed estimation procedures for estimating slope parameter in simple linear regression model. For the methods proposed, he assumed that X observations are at equal distances, say the distance is D. So he took n is equal to 2m, that means m is equal to n by 2, half of the data. That is when observations are even. And for the odd, he makes some kind of manipulations. So taking different kinds of differences among the observations, he develops three estimators. One was beta cap ES, that was estimator using method of successive difference. And then uh, using the method of differences at half range was given by beta cap EH and the method of range by beta cap ER. And if at all the observations are odd, then the last observation is excluded in the method of successive difference. Middle observation is eliminated in the method of uh, differences at half range and uh, beta cap EH is replaced by this particular uh, value. So these estimators were compared with least square estimate, which I am uh, writing as beta cap EL here because the X observations were taken as equidistant and it is expressed by beta cap EL given here. Nayar and Srivastav 1942 generalized the procedure given by Bose 1938 by dividing error equations in optimum number of groups to increase the relative efficiency of the estimates. So what we thought is, uh, why there should be equidistant between x's. Therefore, the methods proposed by Bose are applicable only for the data sets where xi's are at equal distance, such as inflation or gross domestic product of a country in successive years, observing stocks and shares in successive quarters, noticing the growth of certain microbes at equal differences of increasing temperature, etc. However, in numerous situations, the distances among xi's need not be equal. So Bose's estimators can be modified to include such situations. So we modified Bose's estimators and we suggested some adaptive Bose estimators. And our suggestion was given a bivariate data set, suppose xi's i goes from one to n are arranged in increasing order, then ith order statistic is replaced by xi. So we order all the xi's. Let the corresponding y observations be yi star. Then the adaptive Bose's estimators are, again, we just go with the analogy of Bose's uh, estimator, beta cap us, beta cap uh, and beta cap ur given by equation number six, seven, and eight. But what we are seeing here is there is no equidistant. Now, let me just tell you, what is a successive difference? Say, for example, if I order x1 to xn, then I will be taking the differences as x2 minus x1, x4 minus x3, x6 minus x5, like that. So the difference at half range means if at all there are 10 observations, now I will, uh, I will divide at 
fifth observation. Now x six minus x one, x seven minus x two, things of that sort. Range means the last observation minus the uh, first observation. The above estimators, which we have uh, defined in equation number six, seven, and eight, reduce to both estimators when distances among x i are equal. So, in addition to these estimators, we also uh, define some more estimators that was on consecutive difference among consecutive xi. Consecutive xi means x2 minus x1, x3 minus x2, and so on. That reduces to again beta cap ur. Then we took the differences between all the ordered observations equally lying on the side of the half range. That means x6 minus x5, x7 minus x4, the distances are taken like this. And then we took the difference between odd values and even values. So this is how we constructed around seven estimators. And the proposed estimators were unbiased and their variances are given by this table. We observe that variances are inversely proportional to the distances among the ordered predictor variables. So suppose I take relative efficiency of A with respect to B as variance of B by variance of A. Now, I will be giving the uh, relative efficiencies of the estimators that we have defined and with respect to the estimators that was uh, with the equal distances that was constructed with equal uh, distances and that these three estimators beta cap es eh and er are due to both and el is for uh, least square estimate and beta cap ee is due to what we had defined and this is the relative efficiency among the proposed estimators and we can take relative efficiency as row wise with the column wise estimators. To illustrate the relative efficiency, we have considered two examples. One was due to Walters, where the variable x is number of boat registration and y is number of manatees killed by boat in Florida from 1977 to 1990. And the second example was due to Grable, explaining the distance of a particle traveling with time x. So when we calculated different estimates to this particular data set, what we see is the relative efficiency with respect to, uh, relative efficiency of beta cap US with respect to beta, beta cap UH is 0 0.0144. Beta cap UH with respect to beta cap US is 66.8032. And we see beta cap UE with respect to beta cap UH is 0.8356. Now, if relative efficiency of beta cap uh, UE with respect to UH is 0.8356, then we see that beta cap UH is 16.44% more efficient than beta cap UE. Similarly, if as beta cap UH with respect to uh, beta cap US is 66.8032, beta cap UH is better than beta cap US, and how this can be calculated is 1 minus 6, 60, yeah, uh, 1 minus 1 by 66.8032 into 100%. So that is how we calculate the relative efficiency uh, to say what percent, by which percentage the estimator, newly constructed estimator is working better. Otherwise, just looking at these values, we can see that all the estimators are better than the estimator that is based on successive difference. And we observe same thing in for the example two also. So looking at these examples, we can conclude that uh, beta cap US is actually underperforming than all other estimates. And, uh, and we also see that uh, Beta cap UE is working better than beta cap UR. So now we will just discuss about what is non-parametric regression. What we have discussed is about linear, simple linear regression model and different uh, estimators by non-parametric approach to estimate 
beta cap or the slope parameter in simple linear regression. Now, non-parametric regression is a different concept, wherein here, non-parametric regression, we develop a model-free basis for predicting the response over the range of data. The predictor does not take predetermined form, but is constructed according to information derived from the data. Non-parametric regression requires larger sample sizes than the regression based on parametric models because the data must supply the model structure as well as the model estimates. Non-parametric models almost always reflect pure empiricism. Now, one of the non-parametric approaches to non-parametric regression is kernel smoother, which uses weighted average of the data. Let y vehicle be the kernel smoother estimate of the ith response. The kernel smoother y vehicle i is equal to summation j goes from 1 to n yij uh, wij into yj, where yij is taken as the weight and summation of yij is given to be 1. As a result, y vector is equal to s into y vector, where s is wij is the smoothing matrix. Typically, the weights are chosen such that wij is almost equal to 0. That means very small weights are chosen for all yis outside of defined neighborhood of the specific location of interest. These kernel smoothers use a bandwidth h to define this neighborhood of interest. A large value of h results in more of the data being used to predict the response at the specific location. Consequently, the resulting plot of predicted values becomes much smoother as h increases. The kernel smoother approach is called so because it uses kernel function to specify weights. The kernel functions have the following properties. k of u is greater than or equal to 0 for all u. Integration of k of u over minus infinity to infinity is equal to 1. This is called normalization. k of minus u is equal to k of u. This is called the property of symmetry, where u is equal to x minus xi by h. xi is each observation and small x is a point at which we want to estimate probability density function. We have different kinds of kernel functions, uniform kernel function, triangular kernel function, Apanechnikov kernel function, quartic uh, kernel function, triwet kernel function, Gaussian kernel function, and cosine for kernel function that is given on the right hand side here. And i of u is actually the indicator function. And the specific weights for kernel smoother are given by wij is equal to k of x minus xi by h divided by k goes from 1 to n, k of x minus xk by h. We have two kinds of uh, uh, designs that can be considered in non-parametric regression. Say, for example, if we have x, xi, yi from the bivariate uh, distribution f of xy, the regression model that establishes the relation between x and y is given by y is equal to mx plus epsilon, where y is a response variable and epsilon is a, a random error. If m of x is a function with x being fixed, then this is called as fixed design. And if x is random, then this is called as random design. I will be discussing about kernel regression estimator for random design. Okay. So non-parametric estimation actually deals with estimating the function m of x itself. But in parametric, what we see is m of, m of x is already specified, whether it is simple linear, quadratic regression or any kind of regression, already the form of the m of x exists in parametric regression, whereas in non-parametric regression, we have to uh, see the functional form uh, to be decided by the actual data. We have already seen that Gasser and Muller have already, Priestley and Cavo, they have already given two estimators to fixed design and we have myself and Bhargavi also worked on fixed designs. Uh, of course, with the help of uh, Professor Ramanathan, uh, we had discussed with him uh, about the fixed design model. And we also have developed some kind of uh, uh, adaptive Gasser-Muller and Priestley-Cavo estimators. 
For random design, the first estimator studied was due to Nadaraya and Watson, and both of the scientists gave the estimator separately, and that, that's why we acknowledge both of them for kernel estimator, the first kernel estimator given by them to random design, and it, it is given by equation number 19. Then the adaptive NW estimator based on varying bandwidth uh, was given by MCAP AX. We can see the difference between 19, uh, equation number 19 and 20. You have KH here, where H is actually representing the fix, uh, fixed, band, uh, fixed bandwidth, whereas HA means varying bandwidth. That is the only difference, but it makes a lot of difference when we work with. So HA is H lambda with lambda equal to F wiggle X divided by G of F wiggle X raised to minus delta, where F wiggle X is pilot density estimates and G of G dot is function of uh, F wiggle X and delta is the sensitive parameter. Abramson established that the adaptive NW estimator performs well for delta equal to 0.5. So MA cap X was studied by Silverman, considering G dot as geometric mean, Demir and Toktamis using G dot as arithmetic mean, Aljuhani taking G dot as range, and Joshi and Deshpande using R by N to the power three of F Beagle. Now we construct uh, the adaptive uh, estimator by taking G dot as R by two, which we call as half range. This is about the distribution of the estimator. We derive all those things and expectation of MA cap of X was given by equation number 28. It's bias by equation number 29 and variance of, um, okay. So using all these equations, we uh, derive the distributional properties of M cap HR, that is the adaptive uh, random uh, cap, uh, adaptive, a kernel for random design and expectation of MCAP HR and bias and mean square error of MCAP HR is given by equation number 32. Now we make a comparative study by using relative efficiency uh, given by FAN 1992 and we uh, consider the relative efficiency of MCAP HR with any other estimate that is about Priestley Cavo, Gasmuller, and Aljuhani Alto uh, uh, estimator, we calculate for these different three random functions that we consider. And then under different functions, we calculate RE, relative efficiency of MCAP HR, with even Nadaraya Watson estimator we consider. Yes. So here you can see the relative efficiency in percentages. For F2 also, you can see the relative efficiencies. And for F3 also, we can see the relative efficiencies here. And what we see is for all the functions, MCAP HR was working better than other estimates. When, we, when performance of MCAP HR under all the three kernels are observed, uh, we find that for F1 and F2, RE of MCAP HR is better than any other estimator for Epanechnikov kernel. And relative efficiency uh, is increasing as the sample size increases, whereas relative efficiency with respect to fixed design estimator is decreasing as the sample size decreases. And we are representing the confidence band and as the N in for different functions. And as the N increases, actually we are uh, seeing that the confidence, uh, width of the confidence intervals is decreasing. And uh, to demonstrate the working of our estimator, we took a data from the prestige data set from our library and Data consists of 102 observations for Canadian occupations measured across six variables and MCAP HR, MCAP NW and MCAP R uh, using Epanechnikov kernel, we have plotted the data. And here we see that this line is actually MCAP HR estimated by MCAP HR. And we see that this is actually a better fit for the uh, data as compared to MCAP NW and MCAP 
are defined by Aljuhani algorithm. So here I end with my uh, talk. Uh, I thank all of you. Uh, any questions, please. I acknowledge my students, Srinath and Dr. Bhargavi for working with, with me uh, about these concepts. Any questions? Thank you, madam. Am I in time? <laughs> yeah, thank you in time. Thank you. Yeah. Sir Ramanathan, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Ramanathan, sir, you are an expert comment. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now that, that was interesting. Uh, so I think uh, I have only one query that I would like to ask. That yeah, GX, yeah. GX that you choose, how do you choose hmm. it? Which one, sir? That uh, the, uh, the adaptive smoothing that you make using that huh. uh, uh, some, what is that? Uh, there is a GX in that, in the denominator. So what is the... Yes, sir. We, ha that? Uh, we, we have pilot densities. Okay, we, we take the simulation, random variables, we simulate. Then from the simulated uh, observations, we get the G of uh, uh, that particular pilot density. Uh -huh. G, G of that means it could be uh, pilot density is arithmetic mean. It could be the uh, geometric mean of pilot density, range of pilot density. So the first thing is we have to simulate pilot density. Then G of dot is calculated. So different uh, 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 authors have uh, uh, taken different functions. They considered arithmetic mean, geometric mean and all and range. Then what we thought is, why not we think about different statistical functions? Like we have uh, uh, done some more work with this. That is what uh, we took uh, uh, range. Then we took different functions of the range. We took uh, standard deviation and we worked with then even as a non-parametric measure we took the deviations of the observations from median okay so how and this impact the mise well. so how huh. does this impact the mise mise or uh, msc or whatever i'm that you are computing yeah 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 huh. it it actually depends on the functions we are choosing sir Okay. When we take deviations uh, of the observations from the median, that is working better than the half range function and standard deviation okay. function like that. So there is no optimal way to do that. No, no, no. Okay. We we just go with different kinds of functions, and uh, the, depending on the uh, comparison we do with MISC and for different functions and uh, different kernel functions, then we try to come to a conclusion okay. that such and such function is working better. No. Okay, fine. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Okay. Are there Thank any you, madam? Questions? Thank you, sir. But sir, just continue. Yes. yes. Yeah. Thank you, both of you. Uh, but madam and Ramnathan, sir. Uh, now. Uh, but madam, you yes. just stop your screen sharing. Ha, ha, ha. Yes, please. Yes. yes. Now, second innovative topic, uh, Mr. Vikesh Parikar. Yes. In your help, Netherland. Uh, his uh, title of talk is Role of Statistics in Life Science. And uh, chairperson for his talk is Dr. Uh, D.M. Sakte, Central University of Tamil Nadu, Hiruvaru. So let me. Yes. Uh, let me introduce in brief. Uh, Parekar, uh, uh, let me not uh, go in uh, much more. Uh, he is uh, a certified based uh, programmer for SAS. He is uh, postgraduate and uh, graduate from Shivaji University. And of course, uh, Dr. D.M. Sakte sir is a graduate from uh, Shivaji University, postgraduate from Shivaji University, doctorate from Shivaji University. And now he is 
I think, uh, head and associate professor at Central University of Tamil Nadu. I will give charge to both of you. Uh, okay, sir. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you very much, sir. Am I audible? Yes, yes, you are audible. Yeah, I guess we can start because we already five minutes passed. Yes, yes. So I request the uh, invited speaker of this session, Mr. Vikesh Taravega, to deliver his talk. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Sir Tisar. I'll start with that uh, respected Honorable uh, DT Shirke, Sir, Honorable BG Kore, Sir, and other Honorable teachers. Maybe I know or don't know about other teachers, so I cannot take the names and all. And thanks to the Deepak uh, to start, uh, give me this special introduction. And actually special thanks to the BG Kore sir to giving me this opportunity to talk in this great event. Actually my uh, topic is mainly interested uh, to the student who's going to the uh, current corporate market soon. So I will talk about the roles of statisticians or statistics in the life science industry. So for that, I will share my screen first. Please let me know if you are able to see my screen. It's visible. Yeah. Yes, yes, sir, it is visible. Yeah. Okay, just I will uh, talk about the uh, statisticians, uh, where statisticians land in this life science industries and what are the roles they are performing. I'm not going to the uh, details in of the statistical methods, what they use, uh, what kind of this, but I will uh, talk about high, higher level of the picture of the statisticians roles in the life science industry. So I will start with the uh, the pharmaceutical industry, uh, how big it is and uh, what the impact of the country or uh, their countries. So for example, I took here the Europe, the pharmaceutical industry supports a total of 1.4% of the Europe GDPs. And they have created almost 2.5 million jobs in their uh, pharmaceutical industry, whole Europe's. So there are others uh, areas also uh, they can create the jobs or work our uh, st uh, statisticians like manufacturing, regulatory affairs, sales and marketings. So there are other uh, regulatory industries who regulates uh, the uh, medis uh, medicines, vaccines. They give us an approval about uh, the medicines and vaccines. So here I'm taking an example of the Europe. Uh, and that uh, agency name is EMA, European Medicines Agency. So every country has a different uh, regulatory authorities. And let's see uh, what are the aims of this pharmaceutical industry. First, they start. First, they start with the discovering of the medicines, vaccines to prevent the diseases, and improve on the medicines. I just give an here example of the improvement medicines that you recently seen uh, in the corona vaccines that some of the vaccines are 70% uh, uh, having the uh, curing rate, some of the having 92. So this kind of uh, the improvement they did in their medicines, new device, there are a lot of devices they have created for the treatments, method of diagnosis and the last is the better of educations to provide uh, the other others people students and all so uh, all of these uh, fall under the first four points are fall under the drug development and th there is the primarily uh, where statisticians and statistics are involved so let's uh, go go to the uh, stages of the drug development process so first the discovery which is in the lab, and then it's tested on the preclinical development. That means uh, that that drug will be tested on the animal. And once it's uh, safe, then it will move on to the clinical development. That means it will be tested on the human. And then it will go into the uh, market. And after market also, the analysis is required about how it's performing. So post-market analysis 
will be there and the next let's see uh, check the from the beginning how is the roadmap for the drug development process it starts with the begin uh, with the idea so once uh, we have an idea how to create uh, or what to create uh, the drugs then the teams will set in and create the plan accordingly then will they start with the develop of the component compounds they will screen it and it will be tested on the first animals in the early safety studies and then they will improve their uh, medicines that candidates before go to the human they uh, in the phase one they give this medicine to first healthy subjects and once that is passed they the reports reports are good to go to the further steps then it moves to the phase 2 study and the samples are being increased over there in the phase 2 studies and there will we also check the safety ness of the drugs and if that pass then it moves to the uh, phase 3 and they uh, increase the candidates at medicine to tested in around 3 to 10000 subject but this is just a number it depends upon the medicine or vaccines who, who are we working on and once we have all data the statisticians are uh, create the analysis reports and once the report is ready uh, they send it to the regulatory authorities and once the uh, we got the approval of the medicine then we can uh, sell that medicines in the market that's the high level road map of the drug development process and let's see where are we uh, in this uh, development so we are mostly involved in the all of the uh, uh, phases of the clinical trials however we also work with the non clinical statistics in area like drug discovery safety toxicity pharma pharmacy and production manufacturing and statisticians also available uh, also work in the regulatory authorities who approve uh, the drugs i have given here example of the regulatory as mhra in the uk and ema in the europe so every country has their own regulatory uh, authorities so what type of companies uh, can statisticians work uh, in this it's it can be a small scale or local company or large multinational company there are a lot of locations available where we can work then in the pharmaceutical companies with the clinical and non clinical uh, sector there are the clinical research organization in the clinical non clinical basically clinical research organization is uh, they conduct the clinical trial for the pharmaceutical industries and the, in the regulatory authorities that's I, we already discussed about mhra european medicine agency ema and the central drug standards control organization that's it's india so how is a clinical statisticians involved so it begins with the trial design and they will help to determine the design objective and end points of the trial calculation of the sample size in every phases what how much a patient can be enrolled in the study for our analysis so protocol outline how the trial will be run and the analyzed randomization schemes and blindings is involved there should not be a biased and in the blinding blinding means what they do uh, in the there are two types of blinding at first blinding that the subject doesn't know what treatment or what medicines uh, he's taken and the uh, second level blind is even that doctor also doesn't know what kind of medicines he is given to uh, that subject or patient so this kind of uh, methods they have used uh, to analyze and this case report form development this is nothing but uh, the questionnaire uh, to collect the data to ensure that we are uh, collecting the correct data for our analysis 
and how is a common statisticians involved in the clinical statistician involved in analysis and reporting so pre specify key study analysis when we uh, uh, start with the uh, trial then we need to pre specify our uh, study analysis while the study is running statisticians sometimes run analysis and also review the data so uh, the process of creating a drug is uh, huge, uh, very long sometimes it took 5 years 6 years nowadays it reduced to 3 years so uh, statisticians uh, runs their reports uh, and timely basis it might be a monthly it might be a quarterly it depends upon there are some uh, steps where they uh, at that time they perform their analysis and analyze the reports so i end up at the end of the study statisticians analyze the data that's true and he is the uh, first uh, person who knows the results whether uh, the drug is worked and statistician has to help uh, to interpret and present the results write up the results and provide input to the uh, clinical study report it may be involved in the publication of study results so must state our intention up front is the protocol I mean the protocol is the actually bible of the study uh, it will contain all uh, details about the study and it says also uh, about the statistical analysis plan that's the analysis plan who uh, stati uh, statisticians are uh, responsible to uh, create this uh, statistical analysis plan and with 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 that plan they have to do some Uh, on the analysis and once they're done with their analysis they have to verify uh, that our drug is worked or analysis is going in a positive direction and they have to uh, generate the reports uh, for it so what we do in day to day work in the industries as a statisticians or statistical programmers so first we need to do uh, write the statistical uh, analysis plan that's our primary uh, responsibility discussing uh, the plans for analysis with clinical and programmers attend the project meetings design work for the new studies review the study reports responding to the questions from regulatory of course we are going to submit our reports to the regulatories and there also some statisticians are there they reviewed your report they have some questions we have to respond in well manner for their performing the exploratory analysis resolving differences in interpretation of programming specification between the programmer and validator how graduate statisticians spend their time when we uh, enter into the new market and joined as a fresher in the in the company then what uh, we face actually uh, in in the initial stage that's the face to face discussion or maybe nowadays in the teleconference uh, pc based programming that's the sas is the old one i'm i'm, I'm not saying it's the old one but now there are other programming languages also in the market who, which are taking place uh, of the sas like r programming then python and we a uh, regular discussion with the supervisor that what you are doing is in the in the well direction take a uh, timely feedback from our supervisors group meeting with other statisticians to get the uh, knowledge of their experience and ongoing technical trainings so these kind of uh, activities we do when we join uh, the recent uh, join as a fresher in the company so we use statistics to help inform and understand so does that uh, does the drug hit the target example uh, the tumors receptor once it all the target does it do anything can we measure who and what diseases are we aiming to treat whether it will work and be safe in a wider population 
how we can differentiate from other medicines, which compound to progress further. So I think we are the main pillar uh, pillar of the, um, to make this decision of the drug to be uh, go into the market or what the improvement required there. So we can suggest according to our reports. So what kind uh, what kind of people you interact in the within your company or outside of the company? There are other teams are uh, regulatory there that uh, medical writers, sales, data management, and the programmers and all all other teams who you need to interact. Other than that, the regulatory from the outside company where we uh, submit our reports, we, we need to interact with them as well. <clears throat> so in next, uh, how is clinical statisticians involved in the regulatory? So I taken here example as a EMA, European Medicine Agency. So once we received uh, the application uh, from a pharma company about the new drug, then we are uh, as a statisticians we need to review their uh, review their uh, <clears throat> reports assessment of the clinical trial methodology strength of evidence for the efficiency of the drug contribute to the decision on whether a medicine should be licensed for use in the Europe as I take an example of the EMA so I mentioned here as the Europe it might be a other country where who uh, regulate uh, that reports or that assessment. So agreeing that standards for drug development with pharmaceutical companies through scientific advice, training of medi uh, medical accessories in clinical trial methodology. So there are a lot of other responsibility as well uh, where statisticians are involved. What are the challenges for the futures? So finding the inno uh, innovative uh, drug for uh, drugs efficiently need for stronger risk benefit and cost benefit. So here uh, there are uh, in every company or every industry we have a challenges. So what kind of challenges uh, you will face when you here in the futures so that's what I was describing that finding innovation drug efficiency and that will help to improve the drug uh, accountability. Uh, and the second one is escalating cost of drug development. Expected mergers, speed of drug development need to increases because currently uh, the drug development process took a lot of times, five years, six years, it depends upon the drugs now we need to uh, speed up the process. That means we need to uh, analysis uh, faster and uh, provide the reports to uh, the regulatory agency and analyze timely manner, check how uh, the drugs uh, development process is going and the loss of patent and on-site uh, onset of uh, generics that uh, this is that once we uh, create a drug and it's in the medicines we'll get a, a patent but not for uh, for more than few years because afterwards it should be a generic so other companies can also uh, create those and it will be uh, in bit cheaper in the market and there are highly regulatory hurdles from the regulatory authorities. They have their pointed other agencies to uh, regulate, regulate the de drug development process. Also, they have uh, added uh, their, their teams to uh, review uh, the reports in, in uh, details and they require some details uh, reports of where wherever they required, we need to provide uh, those details immediately or in timely manner to the uh, to the teams. So these are challenges we are facing and we have to work when we enter in this industry on this one. What are the key skill uh, 
required as a statistician when we, you work in the life science industries. So uh, you sounds understanding of uh, statistical methodology and how to apply it. You need a good communication and presentation skill must be a confident, competent and challenging speak up and influence to other people's can work well in a team and independently an eye on detail you should be a well organized logical thinker that's as a we are statistician always think uh, analyze we our mind is also analyzing something when uh, in the uh, our day-to-day -day life situation also we analyze so we have that logical mind and that we need to use uh, in in the programming skill so you can use your logical thinking in the program build up the, your own algorithms and it just matter of then programming language you can use any language uh, to interpret the, uh, your logic it just matter about the syntax then you need the good statistical programming skill that's what i was talking that in our uh, also i think in department also there are some programming languages uh, are using to uh, perform the practicals so can we use the latest uh, the language which are in the market? I think SAS is old one now, R, Python. There are other uh, languages also. There are R Shiny. R Shiny, what it will, it will develop the web page in the R. So you can create your own report and publish it in the, in the web page. So these kind of things you can include in our uh, practicals so that will help student uh, to get uh, in the market. I think that's qualification. Yeah, it's, a, it's a graduation, post-graduation for the statistician, also same for the programming language, which we can do. So that's a required. Working environments, good career progression. You can be the expert in your area, never stop the learning. Large variety of work you will get generous benefit competitive salary yes you will get the competitive salary i have seen a lot of uh, african students who does who does the post graduation postdoc in the europe and once they done their uh, their, their uh, educations they will get uh, the market european market for the jobs so you can also think about or you your student can also think about to do any post graduation or postdocs in uh, other countries and uh, work abroad. So there are excellent working conditions. When you work as a statistician, you will be a well reputed and respected in, in the industries and it will make you a real difference in your life. Thank you, thank you very much to listening this patiently and bear with me for these 30 minutes. Thank you, Vikesh. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Vikesh, very much. It was nice to hear you after a long time. And oh, yes, see long you. time. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I guess we are uh, seeing each other after 2009, right? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, I think almost 2008 or 9. Yeah. 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 So it was nice uh, hearing you. You gave a nice uh, explanation about how statisticians uh, play a vital role in the field of pharmacy. So I guess uh, the young participants of this conference might have got their piece of cake today and yeah. they might be enjoying it. <laughs> uh, thank you, uh, uh, Vikesh, once again, and thank you, Principal uh, Koresar and uh, Shiva University Statistics Teachers Association for inviting me uh, to be here as a chairperson and be a part of this wonderful conference. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you, Patuk. Thank okay, you. Thank you sir. I will thank stop you, my uh, sharing. Yes, sir. And... Mm. Thank you for both of you as a chairperson and resource person. <clears throat> okay. Now I request uh, next, uh, today's next uh, uh, resource person, uh, Professor Dr. Vibhi Bhute, sir, from Solapur University, Solapur, of course. Ahilya Devi, Pune Shlok Ahilya Devi Solapur University Solapur. And uh, 
uh, chair for his talk is professor dr pg dikshit sir uh, from warden college pune uh, let me introduce in brief uh, gute sir uh, is uh, post graduate doctorate from shivaji university uh, he is student of uh, uh, professor dr dt shetke sir and at present uh, i think he is uh, head at department of uh, mathematical sciences at uh, shiva uh, solapur university of course he has worked as a registrar uh, i think at present he is not not working as a registrar anyway and next uh, chair person is professor dr uh, pg dikshit sir he is from modern college he has published around 100 i can say textbooks on his uh the record and of course he has uh, more than 40 years of teaching experience at present he is the uh, head and vice principal at modern college pune so with this brief introduction and due to short of time i give short uh, chat to both of you uh adikshit sir ha um. hello hello do you listen yes, me hello yes yes, yes. So, you are audible yes i request yeah i request dr gote sir to start his lecture okay. uh, first uh, i would like to thank principal dr bg kore sir for organizing such an international conference and uh, invited me to share my uh, some research ideas in this uh, conference so uh, the topic that i have selected may I audible yes sir yes sir yes yes you are audible the topic uh, that i have selected uh, for this uh, presentation is improved monitoring of uh, simple linear profiles as we know the control charts are very important statistical process control tools that are used to monitor the process parameters generally process parameters to be monitored in a statistical process control is process mean and process variability and uh, traditionally short x bar chart it is more popular for monitoring process mean and uh, short uh, r chart or s chart these are the control charts that are used to monitor process variability now these charts are very simple to understand simple to implement but they have one uh, drawback or limitation and which is these charts are not efficient for detecting small shifts in the process parameters so process parameter means if we want to monitor process mean then we use control chart x bar and if there is a shift in in control mean mu then our expectation is that that shift should be detected as early as possible by the control chart but short type control charts are not applicable for this now working of control chart as we know uh, we require a sample periodic sample from the production process then we calculate upper control limit lower control limits central line and from the production process whatever sample we have calculated based on that we compute some statistic like x bar or s or r and we are plotting the points on the chart if the plotted points are within the control limits then we say that process is in control if any of the point lies outside the control limit then we say that the process is out of control now our in statistical process control is our objective is how to detect as early as possible the outgoing of the uh, out of control process now when we develop another control chart as alternative to traditional control charts then we have to compare performance of our chart 
earlier chart. If, if our control chart, proposed control chart, detect shifts in process parameter earlier than the existing chart, then we say that our control chart is superior to earlier chart. In general, average run length, it is a measure that is used to measure the performance of control charts. There are some other measures also, like average time to signal, uh, average number of observations to signal, and so on. Here, ERL is used as the performance measure, which is a popular measure. And uh, when we use the control chart for the production process, then we consider process in two states. First state is process is in control. That means there is no shift in process parameter. And for such in control process, ERL is given by ERL is equal to one upon alpha, where alpha is the type one error of the control chart. And in other state, when process goes out of control, then the ERL is denoted by ERL one, and which is obtained by one upon one minus beta, where beta is the type two error of the control chart. So these are the two measures which are used for in control as well as out of control processes. Now when process is in control and if control chart shows out of control point, then that process, that point, we call it as the false alarm because process is exactly in control, but our control chart shows it out of control. So this is a false alarm. So for in control process, what we require? We require maximum or large in control process like 200, 370 or 500 and so on. And for out of control, ERL should be as small as possible. That means if there is a shift in process parameter, we must identify such a shift as early as possible. So in control ERL should be large and out of control ARL should be small, then that control chart we call it as the ideal control chart. So for a traditional control chart, we take a random sample of size n from the production process, we take measurement, then we calculate the control chart statistic x bar for each of the sample, where the sample mean is considered as in control mean mu zero and standard deviation is sigma zero and we consider these parameters are known. That means we are in phase two monitoring. When these process parameters are unknown, then we have to estimate these parameters from the in-control process or historical data and such analysis or estimation of parameter, that stage we call it as the phase one. So here parameters are known, that means we consider phase two process and this is our in-control mean. When process mean changes, that means there is a shift of size delta in the process, and we have to identify or we have to detect this shift as early as possible. If this delta is equal to zero, then we have new shifted mean is equal to original mean. That means there is no change in the process parameter. Now, in order to construct the control charts, we require control limits. For shear type control charts, control limits are obtained by LCL, that is lower control limit, mu zero minus K into sigma X bar. And for upper control limit, mu zero plus K into sigma X bar. And once we obtain these control limits, now here K, K is called the constant or control limit coefficient which can be decided by the in-control ARL. And based on in-control ARL, we can detect the value of K. For example, for three sigma control limits, we take the value of K as three. For two sigma control limits, for one sigma control limits, we can change the value of K. Once we obtain the control limits, we are plotting the points on the control charts, then we have to see whether in-control ARL is 370 or not, depending on, on alpha. If we take type one error of the control chart is 0.0027, then in control ER is, ERL is 370. Its interpretation is that even the process is in control, 
after 370 point plotted on the chart our control chart shows and point out of control which we call it as the false alarm so in this case once alpha is specified we can determine the value of k as minus phi inverse of alpha by 2 where this phi is the cumulative distribution function of standard normal variance so these are the measures that are used the or the traditional control charts and by using these measures here we observe the exact uh, performance of the control chart in first part we take type one error as point double not phi so that one upon alpha means in control error is 200 for second part we consider type one error point double not 27 uh, so that in control error should be 370 and uh, we take different sample size gain equal to 10 15 20 for both the cases and first column of the table shows shift in the process mean which is denoted by delta so in first row delta is equal to 0 that means there is no shift in the process mean so when there is no shift our in control arl for different sample size remains same that is 200 similarly for second case it is 370.37 and uh, next if we have a shift of size 0.1 in the process mean that means process mean has shifted so the traditional shehort control chart requires approximately 138 points to be plotted on the chart to detect shift of size 0.1 For detecting shift of size 0.1, x bar chart requires 138 points to be plotted on the chart. Then the control chart shows out of control situation. For next shift 0.2, we have to plot 66 points. Shift of size 0.3, we require 31 points, and approximately 32 points to be plotted on the chart. So this means as the shift size increases. shift size in the process mean increases control chart detects that shift earlier than the uh, smaller shift size for example here for detecting shift of size 0.3 control chart requires 32 points but for detecting a shift of size 0.4 control chart requires 16 points to be plotted on the chart so this is the interpretation now second how sample size affect the performance of control chart for n equal to 10 for detecting a shift of size 0.1 chart requires 138 points to be plotted if we take sample size 15 instead of 10 control chart requires 118 points that means earlier than 137 for sample size n equal to 20 control chart requires only 103 points to be plotted on the chart that means as sample size increases the performance of control chart to detect the shift in process parameter increases so this is entire about the shear control chart now in shear control chart what are our assumptions for shear type control charts we have some assumptions and out of this first important assumption is that quality characteristic is normally distributed second assumption is that the observations or measurements are independently distributed so if these two assumptions are satisfied then we can use shear procedure to construct the control chart but there are many situations in which the quality characteristic to be monitored is not a single variable x but it is a function and that quality characteristic we call it as the profile so profile monitoring so in this case we consider two variables first variable we call it as the response variable y and second variable is explanatory variable and we assume that there is a linear relationship between y and x and that linear relationship is denoted by equation number 6 where y is expressed as a0 plus a1x plus epsilon 
and which is nothing but our simple linear regression model. In simple shear type control chart, our objective is we have to monitor only a single parameter mu, process mean mu. Or in case of uh, R or S chart, our objective is we have to monitor process standard deviation sigma. But if the quality characteristic is of this nature, that means it is a linear function, then we have, in order to monitor such a quality characteristic, we have to consider this relationship, linear relationship between response variable and regression variable. Now, in this uh, linear relationship, we have to monitor three parameters. First parameter, this parameter, we call it as the intercept of the simple linear regression model. This parameter, we call it as the slope. And one more parameter to be monitored in the simple linear profile is the process standard deviation, which is noted by sigma. Now, when the quality characteristic is in the linear regression form, we have to monitor three parameters. So many times the quality characteristic may be a function of more than one explanatory variables. So in that case, we have to consider multiple linear regression model and accordingly, we have to monitor parameters of this model. So in this model here, we have considered only the simple linear regression model. Now our objective is we have to monitor these parameters. So first parameter is intercept, second parameter is slope, and third parameter is sigma square, which we call it as the error variance. Now, what is traditional method that is existing in literature? Traditional method developed by Gupta and others is they have constructed separate Schoer type control charts for each of these parameters. That means first Schoer control chart for uh, monitoring intercept, second Schoer control chart for monitoring slope, and third Schoer control chart for monitoring error variance. And based on these three control charts, they have taken the decision about the process, whether in control or out of control, if any of the control chart shows out of control situation. That means any control chart, for any control chart, the point plots outside the control limits of these charts. We shortly review this process, and then we will see how we have improved the performance of this profile monitoring control chart. So in order to construct the control chart, we require control chart statistics. For example, in order to monitor process mean mu, we use the control chart statistic as X bar, that is sample mean. Why we use sample mean? Because it is a sufficient statistics for population mean mu. So in the same way, in order to monitor intercept, slope, and error variance parameter, we have to estimate these parameters from the samples. So we have sample of size n based for y1, y2, yn, also for x1, x2, xn. And based on this bivariate data, we can obtain this y bar j, x bar, sxy, sxx, all these quantities. And based on this, we estimate these unknown parameters of the simple linear profile model. And uh, one more condition for the uh, control chart is that if we use control charts two or more control charts for monitoring, jointly monitoring the parameters of the control charts. Our one more assumption is that these parameters should be independent. In order to construct joint monitoring of X bar, uh, joint monitoring of mean and process variability or mu and sigma, we use X bar chart separate, we use S chart separate, but when we consider joint monitoring, so we require X bar and S to be independent. Therefore, 
these parameters in order to convert these parameters as independent instead of taking the data of uh, variable x directly we take their its deviations from sample mean x bar so we use new data x i dash for our model and if we use all these transformations in earlier model so our simple linear regression model now becomes y i j equal to beta not j beta 1 x i dash plus epsilon i j and next so we have to monitor this new parameters beta not beta 1 and sigma so estimates of these parameters are obtained by beta not j is equal to i bar j beta 1 j is equal to a 1 j and uh, using this we construct c shear type control charts in order to monitor intercept parameter beta not we use this as the control chart statistics and uh, control limits for this chart are denoted by lcl i ucl i i for intercept because we are simultaneously using three control charts one for intercept second for slope and third for error variance so limits of this intercept chart is denoted by lcl i ucl i and we call this chart as shear i chart shear intercept chart similarly this statistic is used to monitor the slope parameter of simple regression model and this chart is called shear yes chart and it has the control limits lcl shear yes and ucl yes and if this condition satisfies means any point plotted point on the chart if it is less than lower control limit or if it is greater than upper control limit then we say that the process is out of control and a third one is in order to monitor error variance we use mean square error control chart the statistic for this chart is given by msj which is nothing but 1 upon n minus 1 summation y i j minus y hat i j bracket square and these are the control limits for the third chart that chart is shear type e chart now these are the separate control charts if we use combine use of all these charts in order to monitor the parameters of profile monitoring we have to consider overall alpha and that overall alpha is nothing but 1 minus 1 minus alpha raised to 3 and in this case the overall alpha is used to construct the in control arl of the combined chart so this chart we call it as the uh, shear free chart which was proposed by gupta and others in 2006 now in this section uh, we use the method of synthetic control charts to improve the performance of earlier chart then we will see the comparison uh, arl comparison performance and in that case we will see that the synthetic control chart performs better than the shear c control chart the procedure is simple all of you know in literature there are many control charts synthetic type control charts are developed as the improvement over the shear control chart synthetic control chart shows superior performance over the traditional shear type control chart so same technique here we have applied for monitoring the linear profiles in this case we first constructed three types of synthetic control chart first synthetic control chart for intercept second synthetic control chart for slope and third in uh, synthetic control chart for error variance and then we combine all these three synthetic control charts so the new control chart we have denoted it as synthetic shear free control chart now in order to develop the procedure of synthetic control chart we have uh, prepare a general structure and we call it as the shear z chart 
so when this z is replaced by beta not head then it is the shevard beta not head charge it is beta 1 or mean square error so we can generalize the procedure of synthetic control chart synthetic control chart it is a technique where it requires two types of control chart first control chart is shevard type or any kusum type ewm type chart and second control chart is confirming run length chart which is an attribute control chart and we combine the chart so the combined chart we call it as the synthetic control chart so here earlier chart we have called it as synthetic z chart it may be synthetic intercept slope or error values and when we combine this synthetic z chart with crl chart so we get the synthetic z chart now synthetic z chart it is one sub chart crl sub chart and we combine these two again here this synthetic chart has lower control limit lcl upper control limit ucl and crl chart we have only the upper control limit so these are the criteria when we combine these two control chart in order to decide the performance in control or out of control of that chart we require these two control limits in traditional control chart what we uh, do if the point goes outside the control limit then directly we say that the process is out of control but in synthetic control chart we plot the points on cr type z sub chart first sub chart and uh, once the point goes out of control at that stage we do not declare process as out of control we do not even the point first point plotted on the out of control we do not declare process out of control we just count the confirming run length of that point what is confirming run length confirming run length means the number of points plotted on the chart until first out of control is detected so first point in control second point in control third point in control and suppose fourth point is out of control so in traditional chart we say that process is in control but in synthetic control chart even the fourth point goes out of control so we count the number of points that are required or that are plotted on the chart and that number we call it as the crl so in this case when fourth point goes out of control so crl value is 4 crl value is 4 and that crl value is plotted on the crl sub chart crl sub chart and then we decide whether the process is in control or out of control so here the ucl and lcl is a criteria to determine the sample as confirming or non confirming and where value of l is criteria to determine the process is in control or out of control so in shevar sub chart if point goes out of control we call that sample as non confirming sample we count crl and plot that crl value on the chart and if the value of crl is less than l that is lower control limit of crl chart then we say that process is out of control so in order to obtain the synthetic control chart what we require we require two sub chart first sub chart we call it as the shevard z sub chart where this z can be replaced by intercept slope or error variance and uh, secondly what we require we require lower control limit of the crl control chart how to decide this uh, control limits we have uh, uh, see in table number 1 and as in traditional procedure we take a sample of size n from the production process and from that we compute the control chart statistic just like in shear type control chart by taking a sample of size n we calculate x bar i in the same way taking a sample of size n we calculate intercept estimate or slope estimate 
or mean square exponent. Generally, we call it as the z. And we plot this point in the corresponding control charge. If the value of statistic lies between control limits, then we call that sample we call particular at the confirming sample, and we go for second step again. That means take another sample, compute the statistic, plot it on the chart. And uh, if it is lies between control limits, then process is in control. Otherwise, out of control. And once the process goes out of control, that sample we call it as the non-conforming sample. And for that out of control point, we calculate CRL. And that CRL is plotted on the control chart. If CRL is greater than L, then entire process based on our decision based on both subchar is in control, otherwise the process is out of control. That means first subchar, CR subchar is used to decide whether the sample is confirming or not. If it is confirming, then we continue that chart. If it is not con non-confirming, that means corresponding point goes out of control, then we count CRL and plot that CRL value on the CRL chart so that the decision can be taken about the process. So this is the general structure. And in this synthetic general structure, we can replace Z by beta naught hat for synthetic. Intercept slope chart, uh, synthetic intercept chart, slope chart, or synthetic error variance chart. So these three control charts can be obtained by using this procedure. And uh, when we say process is in control, out of these three charts, say our uh, synthetic I, synthetic S, and synthetic E, if any of the charts shows uh, outside control limit point, then we say that the process is in control. Now, combination of these three synthetic charts, we call it as the synthetic Sehor 3 control chart. Now, these are the control limits for first subchart, and this is CRL subchart. So, these are the control limits, lower control limit, upper control limit for synthetic intercept chart, synthetic slope chart, synthetic error variance chart. And uh, for each case, we require CRL subchart. So for first chart, we consider lower limit L1, for second L2, for third L3. Now, next problem is how to obtain the performance of the synthetic control chart. So these are the ARL values. And this delta denotes the shifting process parameter. It may be in uh, intercept or slope or error variance. This is the general formula. When there is no shift, that is delta equal to zero, then we call it as the in control area. So this is the formula for obtaining the in control and out of control area value. For example, for detecting a shift of size delta. Delta one, this notation is used to denote shift in uh, intercept. Delta two is used to denote shift in slope. And gamma is used to denote shift in error variance. So by substituting corresponding probabilities here, we can obtain the ARL values of synthetic intercept or synthetic scale and uh, synthetic error variance. So these ARL values we can easily obtain. These are the optimal design parameters. And uh, lastly, I will show only the results. See here, synthetic control chart, these are the shifting uh, second parameter. So for large shift, this synthetic control chart performs better than the other chart. Similarly, for error variance, propose the synthetic CR control chart performs better than the other methods. Other methods exist uh, in literature are assorted tree, CR3, Hotelling T square, 
so all these charts are dominated by the synthetic shear charts so this is the main advantage of the synthetic control chart we have further illustrated these charts by using the illustrative example and uh, in this way the synthetic control chart performs better than the traditional control charts uh, in order to monitor simple linear profiles so this is about the uh, research work uh, presented in this thesis if you have any queries or questions you can ask thank you thank you good day sir thank you now uh, the session is open for question answers if there are any question you may please ask it was a very brilliant presentation from gotesh side dr gotesh side please continue for question answers sir your comment and then it is over so gotesh sir yes sir ah uh, just i have one simple question uh -huh. there are three control charts Yes. Which is to be plotted first, and uh, is there any choice over that? Uh, generally, in a in a X bar R chart, we prefer to plot oh. variability control chart first. But mm -hmm. in this case, uh, the decision is any of the if we use separately, then any of the control chart shows out of control, then the entire process is incorrect. But yeah, we, true. Uh, mm -hmm. When we uh, consider it as jointly, then we have. Uh, But we use the error estimate in earlier yes. two charts, no? Yes, yes. SI yes. chart and SS chart, we may be using sigma estimate. So first, yes. we have to control over error. Error, error variance. Other. But we have to consider error variance chart. Yeah. And True. if it goes out of control, then we have to. Uh, bring the process in control with respect to this error variance. Mm. Re-parameterize the uh, process, and then mm. we use another control chart. Okay. So, thank if you. there thank are no questions, uh, yeah, please. Thank you. Thank you, both of you. Sir. If, if you, no sir. questions, then thank you, uh, Dr. Gote sir, for a nice presentation. Thank, thank you. you all the participants kore sir thank you dikshit sir thank you thank you thank, thank you both of you dikshit sir gote sir yes okay. uh, thank you sir thank you gote sir and professor uh, dikshit sir for taking uh, the session and uh, gote sir for his nice talk uh, now uh, we'll move for next invited talk so uh, resource person is uh, professor dr arel shinde sir and uh, chair for this session is professor dr a, a. kalgonda sir so brief introduction about today's resource person for this session is uh, professor dr agil chinde sir is a senior professor at uh, kavayatri bainabai choudhury uh, north maharashtra university jalgaon uh, he has uh, uh, more than 30 research publications he is working and work on various committees various bodies uh, then uh, chair person for today's uh, means for this session is uh, professor dr a kalgunda sir uh, though he is retired from new college he is working there uh, he is a uh, uh, student of uh, professor uh, as our kulkar research from shiva university uh, i mean he, he did his phd work under his guidance uh, he has uh, many research publications and of course he has uh, reference books on his credit so with this brief introduction due to short of time i give charge to both of you uh, kalgonda sir kalgonda sir you are muted you unmute yourself yes kalgonda sir you unmute yourself and please continue okay thank okay. you thank you for your introduction sir and i take this an opportunity to thank uh, dr kore uh, principal of the college for giving me an opportunity to chair the session thank you now i would like to request 
uh, Professor Sinde, North Maharashtra University, Zalgao, uh, to deliver his talk. Thank you, sir. Welcome, sir. Can you see my slide? Yes, sir. Yes, yes. We see it. And we hear. Okay, this is a topic of presentation is multivariate process capability indices. In fact, uh, we all are familiar with univariate process capability indices, which are being used in industry. Many uh, industries are using still uh, univariate capability indices. Some of them are using multivariate process capability indices also. So let us uh, go through this presentation on multivariate process capability indices. This is work uh, with my PhD student. He is a college professor, Professor Kharsei from MJ <laughs> College, who has completed PhD and some recent work also on this area we have. Multivariate process capability indices. So here content of this talk is process capability, objectives of capability indices. PCI means uh, I will be talking about univariate process capability indices, PCI. And then MPCI means multivariate process capability indices. Third generation process capability index and its multivariate version also we will talk about. And then uh, PCI is uh, for non-normal distributions processes. And then uh, MPCI is for non-normal processes. This is what I will be discussing. Process capability uh, refers to performance of process when it is operating under statistical control. If the process is under statistical control, then only we will be talking about its capability. Control chart and histograms are graphical tools generally being used for assessing the uh, capability. For I am now talking about uh, invariate point of view then we'll move to multivariate to compare the uh, what are the objectives of process capability indices to compare the process performance with specifications that means process dispersion with the amount of dispersion allowed that is what we compare this is the major motto under the uh, process capability indices objective of this to compare different processes that means we are looking for unitless measures also to come uh, provide information about processes su such as proportion of non-conforming product or closeness to target how process is working close to target that also can be uh, judged through the process capability indices to pro provide direction for quality improvement to uh, choose the aim point for process mean in order to minimize the proportion of non-conforming. These are all objectives of process capability indices. Sometimes process is off-centered, then we look for which is the uh, proper point of process mean so that we can get the maximum possible proportion of uh, conforming product. Basis, uh, basic capability indices uh, all those are process capability represents the performance of stable process that we have just now we have discussed. Original motivation underlying the PCI is as given by uh, Ken in 1986 was to talk about the proportion of non-conforming product. In order to monitor the proportion of non-conforming product, our motto is to uh, keep the non-conforming product as less as possible. Uh, uh, but we are we were not directly dealing with proportion of non-conforming. We were dealing with CP, CPK, CPM. Uh, Ken 1986 gave the useful discussion on all these basic capability indices in this paper. Uh, basic cap, uh, process capability indices are defined under the assumptions that process is under statistical control and tolerance of speci uh, is specified 
by lower specification and upper specification and target is at the midpoint of the specification level and the process follows normal distribution under these assumptions the three capability indices were given the first of them is cp then cpk and cpm cp is uh, upper specification minus lower specification limit divided by six sigma uh, uh, this is also known as process capability ratio this measures the potential capability of the process what potential the process is carrying in regard with maintaining the standard deviation or process variability that can be measured through this cp cp is greater than one this is the situation where specifications are larger than six sigma. If specification band is exactly matching with six sigma, then CP is exactly one, PCR is one. If the uh, PCR less than one means specification band is lesser than the six sigma band. It is very uh, first process capability index CP. Then CPK and CPM are developed due to the inherent inability of CP to consider process mean and target several indices were proposed at later stage in order to consider process mean and target into account. Uh, those are those two important indices are CPK and CPM. CPK is that major the actual capability. Yeah, we are talking about univariate uh, till and CPM is also uh, major the capability, but which is based on the loss function approach, which takes care of the where is your target. In CPK, target is not considered into account, whereas mean and sigma both are considered in CPK, whereas CP deals with only uh, uh, sigma is taken into account and uh, CPM which deals with uh, tau that is tau square is nothing but variation measured from the target whereas sigma square in which variation is measured from the mean. So if mu is exactly target if your process mean is at target then all three CP CPM uh, and CPK are, are same. Process capability indices based on probability are uh, to be discussed here now. Assuming normality and symmetric tolerances again, let us talk about P1 is a probability that X lies in lower specification and upper specification when mean is at target. This is my P1. P lower is probability that X lies in lower specification to mean. P upper is probability that X lies in mu to uh, upper specification. And P is two times minimum of P lower and P upper. P2 is uh, exact proportion of conforming product based on the where the process is working. Actual proportion of conforming P2. P1, one can call P1 as a potential proportion of conforming. P1 can be called as potential proportion of conforming. P2 can be called as actual proportion of conforming. Potential means when we are uh, purposefully putting mu at T. That is why P1 is potential proportion of non-conforming. And P2 is actual proportion of non-conforming. And P lower and P upper are defined like this. P3 is defined like this. It is a proportion of conforming when process mean is at target and variation is measured from target. This is P3. This is P3. Okay. And accordingly, uh, CP, CPL, CPU, CPK, CPM, uh, all these indices can be redefined alternative definitions for all these indices using these proportions can be given in the following manner. CP P1 is equal to minus 1 by 3 pi inverse of 1 minus P1 by 2. Similarly, CPL lower, CPU uh, uh, P upper, CPK P, 
CPK P means minus 1 by 3 phi inverse of 1 minus P by 2, where P is 2 times law, uh, minimum of P lower and P upper, where CPK P2, where P2 is uh, actual proportion of conforming, CPK P2 is minus 1 by 3 phi inverse of 1 minus P2. Forms are uh, same, all forms are same. So these are alternative definitions of uh, these indices. Those who are still uh, strictly want to use the old fashioned indices, they can get converted these uh, values in this manner. Or you can directly deal with these proportions also as a measure of capabilities. And if you are not uh, familiar with proportions uh, as a measures of capability, still you want to use your old fashioned indices, then convert them in these fashions and then use. So uh, CP. Uh, M P3 is your uh, parallel index available for CPM. Okay, phi inverse uh, where standard normal dist uh, inverse distribution function. We estimate CP uh, P1, CPK P, CPK P2, CPM P3 by using their estimates of these proportions accordingly just replace their proportions in those forms. Uh, here, uh, x follows normal mu sigma square and symmetric tolerances are given. T is center of the uh, specification. Then Cp is equal to Cp P1, Cpl is equal to Cpl P lower, Cpu is equal to this, this result we have already proved in uh, Kharsian Sinde 2009 communication uh, in statistics journal. Uh, these results are given there. But interestingly, CPK is not uh, equal to CPKP2. This P is nothing but two times uh, uh, minimum of P lower and P upper. But uh, if you put here P2, uh, uh, exact proportion of confirming actual proportion of confirming then it is not matching with cpk that we are going to observe here in this table uh, for example i have a process where mean uh, uh, target is 50 sigma is 5 cpk comes out to be 0.8 cpk uh, these values are like this and whereas another process where uh, mu is 48 sigma is 4.8 5, their CPK and CPKP are same. These are same. Uh, but CPKP2 is differing. CPKP2 is differing. And therefore, uh, this is very interesting result. Uh, this CPKP2 can be used uh, as an index which exactly reflects the proportion of defectives proportion of confirming product for B process is larger and that is reflected through this index. This index is taking larger value. Whereas these two indices are taking same value, therefore they are not reflecting the change in the process. So therefore uh, CPKP2, we have introduced this CPKP2 can be uh, the uh, good major when you, you want to talk about the actual process capability in the sense of univariate sense. So these are the issues associated with univariate cases. Now multivariate process capability indices, those are given in the literature uh, long back in, from 1993, around 30 years back, the first index came into uh, literature uh, on the multivariate process capability. Those were uh, based on specification regions as hyper uh, rectangular region, ellipsoid region or other complicated region. Uh, we'll be using notation CP, uh, MCP for potential capability, multivariate process capability, which measures the potential capability, MCPK, which measures the actual capability, which is based on mean and variance both, and MCPM uh, capability index based on loss function. 
some multivariate process capability indices uh, studied by authors in general mpc is uh, constructed using the ratio of tolerance region to the process region given tolerance region and what is the exact process region their ratio can be treated as the mpc this was the approach then probability of non conforming product this is another approach which we we also focus principal component analysis based approach also used for mpcis other approaches are also based on the loss function uh, mpci based on modified tolerance region uh, time 1993 this is the first paper uh, about the multivariate process capability index and other uh, papers are uh, like this uh, mpci on modified process region process region can be modified uh, sherrer in 1995 then mpci based on probability approach chain 1994 first of all uh, introduced the probability approach then uh, shinde and khadse and uh, khadse and shinde these are uh, some articles based on the multivariate process capability uh, through probability approach then window of opportunity approach then uh, relative importance of quality characteristic also we have uh, studied because many variables are there and their importance may not be same in the product uh, so mpci based on principal component analysis uh, these are also studied by these authors then mpci based on non normal processes multivariate process capability indices for non normal processes these are the uh, uh, indices okay so uh, we have here multivariate process capability indices mcp p1 mcp k p2 mcp m p3 uh, for the uh, these indices we need p1 p2 p3 where uh, assumptions are processes uh, statistically under control and normally uh, multivariate normal distribution is there and hyper rectangular specification region is given so p1 is probability that x vector belongs to v v is your uh, tolerance region okay and provided mu is at target purposefully you are keeping mu at target so that this uh, p1 gives you potential capability potential proportion of conforming product similarly p2 gives you exact proportion of conforming product and p3 by keeping uh, mean at target and sigma also uh, measured from target sigma t is expected x minus t into x minus t prime these are vectors so uh, in this manner mpcis are defined in this manner mcp p1 mcp uh, mcp k p2 mcp k p3 these are defined this way and they are uh, they are measuring first one measures the potential capability second one which is equivalent to our usual cp in invariant set setup second one is uh, mcpk which is uh, parallel to our invariant uh, setup cpk and third one is uh, that takes care of target also that is parallel to our invariant uh, setup cpm uh, third generation uh, process capability index is defined by uh, first time in invariant setup it was 1992 per given this uh, index c p m k c p m k uh, c p m we know that takes care of uh, target but again k is attached there so separately for two cases for uh, 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 upper specification minus mu is less than equal to mu minus lower specification in that case this one otherwise this one this was given in 1992 
later uh, this cpmk appro appropriately combines cpk and cpm if you observe this carefully this combines cpk and cpm properly okay to give alternative definition of cpmk we introduce two different probability p lower and p upper in this sense p lower is x lies in lower to up, uh, mu where mu mean is mu and variance is sigma square t measured from target similarly p upper is defined like this and then uh, you you take c p m k p that is minus 1 by 3 phi inverse of 1 minus p by 2 where p is two times p uh, minimum of p lower and p upper uh, so this is what the alternative uh, definition of CPMK and here we have established their equivalence. This equivalence, I will skip this equivalence group. Uh, indices uh, SPK and SPKM with the alternative definitions. Using CP and CPK, we can find the proportion of non conforming product uh, Johnson and Code's books uh, 1993 on process capability indices. Uh, this relationship has been established. Uh, CPK alone fails to pro uh, provide exact proportion of conforming. Directly, it won't give you exact proportion of conforming relationship. But uh, combining this CP and CPK, that will give you proportion of uh, conforming. Uh, this That is what this equation says. Uh, cons considering the lacuna of CPK, which uh, never provides direct relation with P, uh, Boyle's 1998 uh, 94, given the another index C, SPK in this manner. Uh, alternative uh, form of SPK, which is already uh, we have discussed in 2009 paper, that is CPK P, where P is probability that X lies in lower and upper specification the P pro provides the exact proportion of conforming product. E exact proportion of conforming product. Actual proportion of conforming. If you take P, then alternative to this can be obtained as this uh, index. So our index by using P in this fashion, uh, which matches with this index. Uh, then... Uh, Process capability index CPKP can also be written as CPK P is equal to 1 by 3. This is the alternative form for the above CPKP. The 1 by 3 instead of minus 1 by 3 phi inverse of this, you one can write like this. This is due to symmetry, one can get this. And uh, as discussed in the uh, universe setup by Hersey and Sinde in 2009, claim that PCI given by Boyle, SPK is same as uh, CPKP in this form. So it's uh, we are looking for the uh, development of this index in the form of multivariate setup. That is what uh, this uh, elementary discussion is needed from univariate setup. And then one can uh, proceed to uh, this. I will skip some equivalence of SPMK uh, and SPMK. P star. So this is the uh, index which is equivalent to that. Uh, okay, so uh, S multivariate setup of SPKP and uh, SPMK P star. Those are established here. Uh, assuming that again, uh, multivariate process uh, is stable and the hyper rectangular region you have and the quality characteristics of distribution are uh, PM variate normal and uh, you have MCPKP works out like this where process, process this is actual proportion of conforming. 
where is uh, here you talk about the process me uh, variation is measured from the target in p star and that gives you third generation uh, capability index multivariate uh, version m uh, ms p m k p star where uh, this is the form okay so uh, if uh, this is one then what we conclude the the proportion of defectives are point uh, uh, confirming product is 0 0.9973 if this index is greater than one so proportion of conforming is greater than 0 0.9973 this can be concluded from here uh, estimation of uh, uh, these indices is described here uh, i will skip this one example is this uh, taken from the real life data on uh, where x1 x2 x3 uh, three variables are there length of uh, x1 is length x2 is inner diameter and x3 is depth uh, this is used in uh, one uh, vehicles process X1, X2, X3, uh, this data uh, and the process uh, rectangular region for tolerance, that means X1 lies in this region, X2 lies in this and X3 lies in this. This is the uh, your tolerance region and T is a ta target value. These are T1, T2, T3 uh, target. Then after going through, uh, once you apply this, on the multivariate process capability index for third generation index. Uh, those are, uh, that value is obtained here, 0.51. That means poor capability is there. This is for actual proportion of conforming if you take into account. And then if you take the potential proportion of conforming into account, then it is 0.56. There is a scope for improvement by shifting the process mean and non-normal processes uh, quickly I will go through. These are two indices which we know from the books of uh, Montgomery's book also. You can observe these two indices for univariate setup uh, for non-normal processes based on their percentiles of uh, distribution of quality characteristic are uh, taken into account. And uh, there uh, another uh, index is like this CP and CPK. Uh, probability based process capability indices for non normal multivariate processes. Uh, uh, the, those are if you have multivariate data and the uh, two setup we have assumed here, XIs are depend, independent, and then another case is XIs are independent. First of all, uh, sorry, first case is independent XIs, but non normal distributions. Uh, multivariate non-normal data and in this case we obtain the p1 is equal to p11 multiplied by p12 multiplied by p uh, p1m these are probabilities uh, that the uh, xi lies in uh, their tolerance limit xi lies in its tolerance limit specification limit yeah and because of the independence the uh, P1 is equal to product of these PIJ, P11 multiplied by P122, P1M, and P2 also product. Only thing is that while calculating these probabilities, uh, in first case, we take mean at target, and in second case, mean uh, original mean as it is. So potential capability and actual capability can be measured through P1 and P2 which we convert in terms of multivariate process capability index in this fashion. Uh, MCP P1 and MCP P2, this measures the potential capability, this measures actual capability. These are, this first case was for independent uh, excise, but they are non-normal. Uh, those can be handled through probability in this manner. Example is discussed here, but uh, we don't have much time. Uh, this is again interesting example where independence was uh, observed and due to destructive test, 
independence uh, correlation matrix and due to destructive test for x1 x2 x3 uh, uh, this is industrial data on 100 observation uh, we have taken bonding process and here we uh, x1 uh, distribution were identified weibull distribution x2 weibull and x3 normal distribution uh, and the capability was uh, actual pack capability for multivariate situation 1.31 that is good capable process uh, observed similarly under case 2 uh, xi is are linearly independent consider here uh, xi uh, x vector is non normal but xi are linearly dependent in this case uh, so uh, here also interestingly we have a big process here uh, you have a, a data uh, and then uh, uh, let me go to directly development of potential capability index first of all d is equal to d1 d2 dm uh, these are distinct vector from the components uh, and uh, your m1 m2 mn these are medians we have, you have to observe uh, m1 m2 m these are medians of the variables so ti minus uh, the uh, target values minus median these are dis so your process is off target and uh, you have consider uh, these differences as dis then zi is equal to xi plus di this transformation is done <coughs> then on zi we have uh, made the uh, principal component analysis is applied on zi and accordingly the uh, reason for principal components uh, y1, y2, yk were identified principal component. Those express the about 90% uh, variability. And then probability P1 is equal to probability that y, y1 belongs, uh, y vector, this y vector belongs to the uh, this region of process cap, uh, specification region for uh, principal components. Uh, obtaining this region itself an uh, important job here and uh, in this way one can get the process capability uh, how to uh, compute these capabilities uh, for, for by using simulation tools we have used uh, the, we have uh, obtained this p1 and p2 uh, these simulation tools are expressed in our paper also uh, uh, i will skip this uh, one example real life example is taken here from the literature itself 10 variable and its capability uh, through principal component analysis these are dependent variables all their uh, variance covariance matrix and uh, principal components five principal components are identified beta beta laplace laplace and beta distribution of principal component originally if x follows normal then principal components are uh, already normal. But here our uh, data is non-normal. So uh, process capability uh, for actual capability comes out to be 0.79 and uh, estimate for the capability, uh, potential capabilities pointed. There is no much scope for improvement for by shifting this process mean. Some other uh, decision is required that is go through individual capabilities and uh, identify where is the scope for reduction of variability in uh, some variables. So the, uh, these are some references where uh, our references are also uh, red color references I have given here. One may go through uh, these 2020 or 2021 papers to get more discussion on non-normal uh, multivariate process capability and new index for <clears throat> third generation index. Uh, okay, uh, this is the presentation from my side. Uh, sorry, I'm, I have taken extra time. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Hello, uh, audience, uh, any questions? If you have any question or query, you can ask. I have one question. Yes. Uh, in some cases, if the capability is found to be poor, or uh, confirmation is poor. In yeah. one example, you have shown it is less than 0.5. Yeah. So uh, how to identify 
which variable is responsible whether mean is responsible or whether relation between the variables is responsible how to identify no the, in that case first of all actual capability one has to see if, if the actual capability itself lesser and okay. uh, uh, and potential capability is higher potential capability is higher mcp uh, uh, p is okay. higher in that case it seems that there is a potential in the process variability is working good variability is lesser but process mean has shifted the, those two uh, in inured case also one can very easily see cp and cpk if you observe cp is my 1.5 but cpk is 0.3 that means process mean has shifted uh, somewhere else cp uh, gives you uh, the real potential in the process that does not mean that process is really uh, actually capable when cp is high and cpk is low cpk is 0.3 suppose so very low, uh, poor process capability in uh, actual capability sense but cp is 1.5 that means CP process has lot of potential in regard with maintaining uh, variability but only process mean has shifted and process shifting a process mean uh, to uh, desired value is a easier job in industry or anywhere generally as compared to reduction of variability okay okay thank you thank, thank you, you uh, as a chairperson i would like to put a comment that presentation was very neatly presented uh, they have he has started from very fundamental things uh, references are also given uh, very well uh, thank you very much uh, again i will thank the organizer for giving me an opportunity to chair the thank session thank you to college and professor uh, kore for Thank giving you. me opportunity to uh, interact with uh, your uh, college and uh, these participants. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Yes. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Okay. Uh, Thank you, Talmada, sir, and uh, Shinde, sir, for your uh, chairing session and uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you very yes. much. Yes. So due to short drop time, uh, we proceed further. Now, a technical session will start from here onwards. Uh, first technical session, of course, these are not uh, parallel, these are in series. First technical session is the uh, 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 chair for this session is Dr. Ausaheb Latpate, sir. Uh, he is uh, associate professor from uh, Savitri Bhai Phule uh, University, uh, Pune University, Pune. So I request uh, Latpate, sir, to take a charge and start your technical session. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, I, I am uh, thankful to the organizers uh, for calling me uh, while conducting uh, the, this technical session. I request the first uh, person who is presenting this session, uh, who, who is uh, giving the talk, A. Bhagat. I am here. Okay. Am I audible, sir? Yes, 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 yes. yes, yes. She, she, she will present uh, his work on price discovery and extent of price volatility of tomato in major markets of Maharashtra. Ma'am, please go ahead. Okay, sir. Sir, my screen is visible? Yes, yes. Yes, yes. yes it is visible. Thank you, sir. Uh, I am Dr. A. Bhagat, uh, Assistant Professor of Statistics working at Zonal Agriculture Research Station, Ganesh Kind Pune, under the Mahatma Phule Krishi Vidya Pit Rahuri. Uh, the title of my paper is Price Discovery and Extent of Price Volatility of Tomato in Major Markets of Maharashtra. There were three objectives. First one, to study the variability in arrivals and prices of tomato in selected markets of Maharashtra. To study the correlation between arrivals and prices of tomato in selected markets. And third one, to assess the price volatility and co-integration among selected markets of 
tomato then in introduction see here the prices in uh, some markets are depend on the prices in the other market means they are co integrated with each other and also the prices uh, and also the arrivals in a particular market the market integration shows the extent to which the prices in different oh, markets right. moves together efficiently functioning and connected with each other the high degree of market integration indicate indicates the competitiveness of the markets the present investigation has been undertaken to study the relationship between the arrivals and prices of tomato to assess the price volatility and co-integration of tomato among the selected markets in Maharashtra. The location was Maharashtra. The source of data, the monthly data on arrivals and prices of tomato were collected for the five markets and that, uh, that was Mumbai. <clears throat> that were the Mumbai, Nagpur, Nashik, Pimpalgao, and Pune for the period of nine years from 2011 to 2019. And that data were collected from the NHB database, National Horticulture Board database. And here in material and methods, here first I have applied the augmented decay fuller test. And in addition to that, also I have applied the Phyllis Perron test to see the stationarity in time series data. Then after that, I have also applied the Shapiro-Wilkes normality test here to check the normality in time series data with the help of Shapiro-Wilkes normality test. Then after that, I have applied the Arch and Garch model to see the price volatility in time series data. Then I after con then I have applied the Johnson co-integration test to see the long run price relationship between the selected markets. Then after that, finally, I have applied the Granger causality test to see the direction of causality between the selected market pairs. Then this is the first result table. This is the variability in arrivals. Uh, during the study period. And here I found that the maximum coefficient of variability observed during the month of August in Pimpalgao market and the overall maximum coefficient of variability was observed uh, in also the Pimpalgao market. While in case of the Mumbai, it was observed during the month of June. And in case of the Nagpur, it was observed during the month of November. And uh, in the case of the Nashik market, it was observed during the May month and for Pune market, it was observed during the July month and the maximum mean arrival was observed here. Uh, in case of the Mumbai, it was observed during the, uh, in case of observed during the January for both the markets, Mumbai and Nagpur market. And while in case of the Nashik, it was observed during the December month. And while in case of the Pimpalgao market, it was observed during the month of August and for Pune market, it was observed during the May month and the maximum uh, arrival was observed in a case of the Mumbai market overall maximum arrival I observed in Mumbai market maximum arrival then similarly here next I have also seen the variability in prices for all the selected markets and here I found that the maximum coefficient of variability was observed in Pune market during the month of November, for, for, but for the uh, overall, uh, during the study period, the maximum coefficient of variable, uh, coefficient of variation was observed in Pimpalgao market. And here, uh, we, I observed that the maximum mean prices was observed during the month of July, during the study period for all the markets. And the maximum coefficient of variation was observed during the month of August in case of Mumbai market. And for remaining market, I observed that the maximum coefficient of variation during the month of November. Then this, these are the graphs of the actual data. Month-wise mean arrival in metric ton and mean prices rupees per quintal of tomato uh, for the selected markets. Then this is the correlation between the arrival and prices of the tomato in selected markets. And here I found that uh, in case of the Nashik market here, I found that the, there is a negative correlation between the arrival and prices uh, of tomato uh, in Nashik market during the month of March and May, while in case of the Pimpalgao market, March, April, May, having the negative correlation, significant negative correlation between the arrival and prices. And uh, for the overall period, I observed that here, the negative significant correlation between arrival and prices in the uh, in Nagpur market.
then uh, these are the results of the shapiro wilkes normality test and the results are significant it means that we can say that the the data not follows the normal distribution then i have converted the actual prices into the uh, uh, log form by taking the log to the best 10 then i have converted the actual prices into the log form and that logged prices i have used for the further analysis and then i have applied the adf and pp test to see the stationarity in time series data then at level the time series data uh, non stationary one then after taking the first difference the data is stationary one by taking the difference then these are the uh, output of the arch and garch model and here in case of the mumbai nagpur nashik and pimpalgaon market here the sum of alpha and beta is uh, uh, nearer to one it means that we can say that there is a uh, long there is a price volatility persistence for a long period of time in these uh, four markets because sum of alpha and beta is nearer to one then the next i have applied the johnson co-integration test multiple johnson co-integration test means i have uh, considered all the selected markets at a time and then apply the johnson co-integration test then these are the res results of the that hypothesized a number of co-integrating equations i found that the results are significant it means that we can say that there is a co-integration between the markets then after confirming the co-integration then i have considered the possible pair of markets and in that also so I have uh, seen that the pair of markets are also co-integrating with each other with the help of the two tests, uh, a maximum eigen test and the statistics test. I found that the results are significant for all the market pairs. And finally, these are the results of the Granger causality test. And here I found that the market pair Mumbai Nagpur, Mumbai Nashik, Mumbai Pimpalgao, Mumbai Pune, Nagpur Nashik, Pune Nagpur, Pimpalgao Nashik, and Pune Pimpalgao have the unidirectional causality between the prices of tomato. It means that unidirectional means the price change in Mumbai market is, uh, is affecting the price change in Nagpur market. But the price change in Nagpur market is not feedbacked by the price change in the Mumbai market. But here I found that the Nagpur Pimpalgao and Pimpalgao Nagpur having the bidirectional causality between these two pairs of the market. It means that here the price change in Nagpur market is affecting the price change in Pimpalgao market. And also the price change in Pimpalgao market is also feedbacked by the price change in the Nagpur market. And uh, these are the some conclusions, final conclusions. The maximum variability of tomato in arrivals was noticed in Pimpalgao market among the months as compared to Mumbai, Nagpur, Nashik and Pune market. The maximum variability of tomato in prices was noticed in Pimpalgao market among the months as compared to Mumbai, Nagpur, Nashik and Pune. The overall significant negative correlation between arrivals and prices of tomato in Nagpur market was noticed. It indicated that the arrivals and prices of tomato have moved in opposite direction in Nagpur market during the study period. The volatility shocks in the prices of tomato are quite persistent for a long time of period in all the selected markets except the Pune market. The maximum... <coughs> One second... Uh, sir, uh, how to hide this uh, about tab? The month July during the, the maximum price. Okay, the price of tomato are co integrated. It indicated that the pair of markets moves together and efficiently functioning, competitive and closely associated. The market pair Nagpur Pimpalgao have bidirectional causality and the market pairs Mumbai Nagpur, Mumbai Nashik, Mumbai Pimpalgao, Mumbai Pune, Nagpur Nashik, Pune Nagpur, Pimpalgao Nashik and Pune Pimpalgao have the unidirectional causality. It concluded that very high price volatility of tomato present in Mumbai, Nagpur, Nashik and Pimpalgao markets. It should be minimized and need to protect the price security for uh, farming community. Sir, slides are not moving. Okay, okay, okay. You okay. stop saying. Uh, but, uh, huh. okay, 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 okay. Uh, just conclude now. Or concluded? Yes, yes, concluded, sir. Concluded. Okay, okay, okay. My presentation is over. Okay, okay, okay. From the audience, do you have any questions? If not, I have a question. Ma'am, you 
uh, you, you did one logarithmic transformation, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, and earlier you, you shown that one, the model is additive in nature or multiplicative. What is your model? Model is in, uh, all the models are additive in nature, right? Actually, not added to multiplicative in nature, no? because tomato, the Caesar, the prices of tomato are fluctuating in nature. Okay. The prices are increasing or decreasing. Okay. Not only added to, not only increasing the prices. No, no, no. But the prices no, no, are no, fluctuating no, no. in nature. Wait, wait, wait. You had shown the earlier models. They are, they are in, in terms of additive in nature, right? After the log transform, it becomes, uh, see, uh, Whenever the model is multiplicative in nature, after the log transform, it becomes additive in nature. Am I right? Yes, 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 sir. Yes. Sir. Uh, are you taking care of that? Yes, sir. Okay, then under that scenario also, you had uh, tested the stationarity. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay, the, I request next student. Thank you, sir. Uh, okay. Next student is Dr. P.Y. Patil, who is presenting the work on distribution pretest for testing symmetry. Dr. P.Y. Patil. Please, please allow me to share screen, sir. Uh, allow hello. Me, allow me. They, I think this is the right of that. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Allowed, sir. Yes. How much time I have? Just five minutes. Okay. okay. <laughs> so myself, uh, P.Y. Patil from Devchan College, Arjunagar. Title of my presentation is uh, Distribution Free Test for Testing Symmetry. It is, of course, my PhD work with my uh, research guide, Professor R.N. Gatihali. So abstract of my presentation is here. Uh, we consider problem of testing null hypothesis that distribution is symmetric about zero against alternative that distribution is not symmetric about zero. Uh, that zero is, of course, uh, you can take anything, but that should be known. Point of symmetry is expected to be known. We propose a test based on L1 norm between CDF of signed rank and CDF of negatives of signed ranks, and expression for proposed test statistics are in terms of signed rank obtained. A uh, null hypothesis remains invariant under increasing true symmetric transformation about zero and a signed rank vector being maximal invariant under the group of such transformations, the distribution of R remains the same under null hypothesis. Expression for exact null hypothesis, uh, null distribution of R is given and due to computation limitations, uh, we compute its exact distribution for n less than equal to 25. And when is n is greater than 25, uh, we use the simulated null distribution of uh, these statistics. Uh, and of course, by using Monte Carlo studies, uh, we perform uh, uh, perform study of W and R is done. Uh, by, of course, uh, performance is uh, detected by using uh, symmetric distributions and of course, uh, uh, by incorporating that asymmetry parameter in that distribution. And we have seen that uh, our proposed statistic R is as good as or better than W, okay? So let me go fast. So here, uh, this is, uh, uh, these are observations from symmetry distribution, point of symmetry is known. And uh, motivation is here. So here, uh, Distance between G and F star, that is infimum of uh, distance between G and F is considered as a measure of symmetry, uh, sorry, measure of asymmetry. And uh, then uh, one may go for their empirical versions, but uh, those empirical versions are not distribution free. And that's why uh, we go for uh, next, uh, whatever uh, that we are going to propose here. So instead of uh, that empirical distributions, we go for uh, ranks and of course, uh, so this is not a linear function of ranks uh, that is to be noted here. So we develop integral test statistic based on invariant principle and two count functions that count typical observations. So here, first is use of invariant principle 
So these are R1, R2, R1, R2, R2. These are ranks corresponding to the mode of exercise. And SX, this is a uh, vector of sign ranks. Proposed test is uh, use of invariant principle here. Uh, of course, uh, how it is invariant, etc. It is uh, the only reference here, Lehman and Roman 2005, uh, section 2.6.2. So here we uh, motivation is this L1 or between G and T and one minus G N of minus T, where G N is a distribution function responding to the sign rank vector. So here uh, we have defined this G N T and this G bar approach, and under the null hypothesis, of course, expectation of this difference is zero. Uh, test statistic is this T X is given here. Uh, okay. Now, cost test is this. Uh, we use count functions. So here, what we do is k equal to total number of positive observations in x and this r1 plus, r2 plus, and rk plus. Of course, these are ordered. So these are order ranks for k positive observations and uh, remaining these r1 minus, r2 minus, and so on, r n minus k minus. These are ordered ranks for n minus k negative observations among mod x to xn and uh, what we do is of course uh, we define this at and bt function so this uh, is uh, indicator of rj is greater than t and this is bt stands for indicators of rj minus greater than t and uh, of course they both follow norm, uh, binomial distribution of course under symmetry and uh, we propose these statistics Rx is uh, absolute difference between AT minus BT integrated this and uh, it can be seen that Rx equal to R of minus X due to symmetry of uh, symmetry distribution of X and Tx equal to two times of Rx. So this is the expression for R. So these are possibilities. This k may be less than n minus k. These positive observations are less than negative observations. Uh, k greater than n minus k means positive observations are greater than negative observations, or both may be equal. And in those situations, we have defined this. And in terms of sign ranks, it is given. Uh, this expression is given for that. So null distribution of R. Uh, so of course here uh, we are looking for positive observations and rank. So all these. Uh, of course, you know, there are two raised to n number of such ranks, and these all are equally likely. And, and pole. So, this is a giant distribution of these positive ranks and this number of positive observations. And of course, under null distribution, uh, statistics based on this factor definitely is independent of F, and we are doing that now. So here, uh, null distribution of Rx. Uh, we are, of course, possible values for R are noted here. And this is uh, just, these are extreme values I'm writing here. Uh, it is not always possible to do such close for equation. And for that purpose, uh, here we give a table just for sake of understanding. So what, it, what we are doing here is, R takes values uh, from, as we have seen that, uh, integer part of n plus 1 by 2 to uh, n, n plus 1 by 2. And what we do is possible values for R I have noted in this table. Uh, we count how many uh, sets are there which results into R equal to 2. And so as, as if these all are equally likely, uh, and in all these are 16 in number in this case, uh, this, this is a probability mass function of R. Note that this R is an integer and uh, of course, it has its priority mass function. Uh, this is actually obtained. So this is extreme case. No positive observation, all are positive observations. In that case, your arc statistic take value 10. In all, there are only two uh, such vectors and it's probably this two by six. So, of course, we have obtained null distribution for R and there is, we found there is a restriction maybe uh, due to uh, computational limitations. We obtained it for n less than equal to 25. And uh, we, we are not able to obtain it. It may be possible for others. If possible, they can do. 
and that's why we uh, shifted to simulation uh, of uh, distribution of r and of course for that purpose we took uh, any symmetric distribution you can take maybe uniform maybe normal maybe gaussian and uh, using that we obtained simulation and uh, here we are plotting uh, error on this actual r and uh, that simulated r and of course this we have done for n less than 25 because we want to uh, check whether uh, error is in uh, i mean less or not and it you can go observe that these errors are not too much means that distribution is close simulated and exact distribution and we recommend that you can use simulated distribution for testing uh, or for using uh, distribution of r null distribution of r we have done here a uh, test for testing uh, i mean performance of uh, this statistic r and uh, statistic w wilcoxon and rand test statistic and for that purpose we have taken uh, these two families of distributions uh, here is a uh, one F one x delta here delta is playing a role of uh, incorporating asymmetry in that distribution of course it is symmetric about zero but due to this delta uh, you can incorporate asymmetry in that similarly this second one uh, this theta is incorporating asymmetry and for that for these two distributions we have seen uh, performance studies done here and we just observe that r is always performing a uh, better than w in that case okay now next we take a uh, asymmetric distribution with non zero median about r uh, distribution with zero median and this is uh, f of g a is equal to g of x x nest less than or equal to zero and this is of course their median is not zero it is different than zero there is condition on a and b and uh, in that case again Of course, that A is a parameter for asymmetry. We measure that uh, asymmetry as one upon A minus one. So when A is equal to one, definitely it is um, there is no any asymmetry. Uh, but when A is above, beyond one, it is there is asymmetry incorporated. And in this case, if you just observe performance of R with respect to W, with Coxon and Rank test, uh, the R is performing. Uh, as good as that of w so conclusion is this from a uh, problem of testing the null hypothesis that the distribution is symmetric about zero is considered this hypothesis being invariant under the group of skew symmetric transformations a test based on a uh, sand rank vector is proposed by using l1 norm it is to be noted that So proposed test is the function of sand rank. It is not linear. This is important. It is not linear function of ranks, and hence theory of linear rank statistics is not uh, applicable directly here. So expression for exact null distribution of R is of course as as I have told you initially possible for us to obtain for n less than twenty five, but beyond that we are not able to compute it, and we may go for this simulation. Uh, simulated version and these are references yes thank you sir okay from the participants do you have any questions if not uh, so this is not a question but just one uh, query suppose uh, if you employ your procedure for discrete data is it applicable distribution pre test we have considered here continuous uh, distribution means those x initially came from continuous distribution so no no, no. that things we i had seen the, you had simulated data from any form uh, yes uh, minus no, one, one or from normal or those arbitrary or distributions yes yes but suppose if you generate the data from as like a poisson Is it your test procedure applicable? What happens is there is a possibility of repetition of rank in case of discrete observations. Hmm. This is yes. one aspect. An another? Yes. Another? Ah, uh, means I mean uh, that is not continuous distribution. That is our 
I mean, uh, that I am writing on the distribution of uh, those uh, positive observations and ranks, positive ranks. So, okay. uh, due to okay. this nature, there may be repetition possible, and I may not be able to write uh, that uh, uh, probability, joint probability distribution of that number of positive observations and ranks as 1 upon 2 raised to n. Okay, sir. Yes, next student. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Please share stop Yeah. Next student, M.M. Deshpande. Yes, sir. Good afternoon. I request him to present his talk on process capability index CPM under autocorrelated process order 2 year 2 model. Please go ahead. Is my screen visible? Yes, it is visible. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, all. Myself, Mahesh Deshpande. I am working as a research scholar under the guidance of Professor V. B. Gutesar at Solapur University. Today, I am going to present uh, my talk on process capability index CPM under autocorrelated process of order 2. So, just now we have seen in the presentation by Professor Shinde sir. So this is uh, similar to that, but I'm presenting for univariate uh, process capability index CPM. So we'll start directly with introduction. The process capability index are used at various levels of uh, given process as an important statistical quality control measure. The first basic index was proposed by Juron and then uh, Ken in 1986, Chan et al in 1988, or Netol in 1992, uh, they modified the basic uh, process capability index CP uh, for processes with different mean target values. Uh, above indices are obtained by assuming that the process is in control, uh, the characteristic follows normal distribution, and the observations are independent for uh, symmetric tolerance limits. Uh, there are many studies by researchers to investigate the effect of non independence, non normality out of control and asymmetric tolerance limits uh, and for generalization of process capability indices. The few researchers have studied uh, the effect of autocorrelation on the indices. Uh, Shore in 1997 identified the effect of autocorrelation on sampling distribution of the indices. Uh, he studied the indices CP and CPK. Then Jang uh, in 1998 studied the effect of autocorrelation on variance of sampling distribution of uh, the estimates CP hat and CPK hat. Then Guerra and Vargas in, in 2007 studied the effect of autocorrelation on the variance of uh, CPM hat and CPMK hat. The purpose of uh, this uh, study is to uh, the effect of autocorrelation on the commonly used index CPM, it is also known as second generation index, and also to propose some uh, new sampling procedures. Mr. Despande, don't read. Each okay, and every word. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Please take a good time. So the index CPM is defined by the equation one, where USL and LSL are the specification limit, upper and lower specification limits. Uh, mu and sigma are the process mean and standard deviation. So generally, process mean and standard deviation are unknown. So we estimate the index using sample mean and sample standard deviation given in equation two. So these are calculated under the assumption that process is under control and uh, characteristic follows normal distribution. So here in this study, to generate the observations from uh, autocorrelated process, we consider autoregressive process of order two, that is defined by equation two. The mean and variance of uh, the characteristic follows autoregressive process of order two is given as uh, expectation of t and variance of x t. Now, uh, we will first identify the effect of autocorrelation on the index CPM. For this, uh, we consider the example given in Shore uh, 1997, where the process mean is 40 and standard deviation is 7. For CPM, uh, the target values are considered as 42, 45, uh, as 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, and 45. Uh, the standard deviation uh, is considered as a 7. So by using equation one, we obtain uh, the capability index CPM 
and it is presented for all combinations of the parameters of autoregressive process of order 2 uh, so here we uh, identify that for the first no autocorrelation uh, the index for different target values where d is the difference between mean and target value it is decreasing but also uh, for a different autocorrelation levels as we increase the uh, autocorrelation levels uh, the capability index decreases so same study is performed by using uh, simulation for uh, different sample size and uh, th this is for the estimate of uh, capability index and the results are shown in the next table here uh, this is for uh, table is shown uh, without autoregressive process of order 2 and with autoregressive process of order 2 so all combinations of uh, parameters are considered the observations are there is a considerable uh, difference between the estimated value under independence assumption and autocorrelated data uh, the index is overestimated if the autocorrelation effect is neglected and the value of index uh, depends on the autocorrelation level higher the autocorrelation level it lowers the capability index uh, the value of capability index estimator also depends on the sample size we can see that uh, it in, uh, decreases as the sample size increases now as i suggested in the objective uh, when we consider sample uh, or subgroup, uh, we generate the sample by assuming that it is a simple random sample. Uh, to uh, reduce the effect of autocorrelation, we consider uh, new sampling techniques as skip and mix sampling techniques. So, skip sampling technique was first used by Costa and Costalia for uh, X bar control chart uh, to uh, reduce the effect of autocorrelation on X bar control chart. Basically, in skip sampling technique, uh, we form the subgroup by considering observations by skipping uh, one, two, or more observations. So that is the skip sampling procedure. And uh, the subgroup sample is formulated. And by using that subgroup, uh, we obtain the uh, estimate of capability index. So uh, the autoregressive process of order two is to be modified for this skip sampling technique. So we consider particular for uh, to skip sampling because uh, since we are considering AR2 process, we have to consider to skip sampling. So the equation four represents the AR2 model for uh, to skip sampling method where epsilon t dash is again given. Uh, another sampling, uh, the subgroup sampling formation method is considered as uh, mixed sampling, which is proposed by Franco in 2014. Uh, in mixed sampling technique, we consider two consecutive samples and uh, the observations are considered. So it is represented diagrammatically here. So the mixed sample is obtained by using current sample and previous sample, where you can see that here, for example, of sample size 5 is considered, but in our study, we consider samples of size 10, 25, 50, 100, and 200. So here, as you see, for generating mixed sample of size 5, we require uh, two subgroups of size 7. So similarly here for generating samples of size 10, 25, 50, 100 and 200, we require subgroups of size 15, 39, 75, 150 and 300. So by implementing these sampling procedures, again the index is estimated. So these re uh, tables represent uh, the estimates. Uh, so from these tables, the observation is to skip strategy performs well in the presence of autocorrelation for all considered levels of autocorrelation. And mixed sampling strategy shows slightly improved performance, but not as compared to uh, uh, to skip sampling technique. So these are overall conclusions which already stated that there is a considerable effect of autocorrelation on the estimates of uh, capability index CPM and uh, proposed sampling methods use uh, or uh, that will improve the estimates of index CPM. So these are the references. I would like to thank the organizer for giving opportunity for presenting my work. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Sir, you are not audible. Thank you, thank you. Okay, sir, thank you, sir. From the audience, do you have any question? Stop your screen sharing. Okay, sir. From the audience, do you have any question?
Okay. If not, then I have just little query. Uh, okay. In two skip methods, in two skip sampling method. Yes. As you claim that one that is superior under under the zato correlation setup, right? Yes. Yes. As a researcher, how how is it superior? What do you think? See, in this case, we consider auto regressive process of order two, which means uh, the current observation is dependent on past two observations. Correct. So in order to reduce that effect, uh, we have to skip at least two observations so that effect of two two reduces. past observations. Yeah, yeah, two past yeah. observations so that effect will be reduced. Okay. Okay. Then the next question is that one. Then then what is motivation for using this uh, second order uh, uh, auto regressive model? Uh, we already studied for uh, auto regressive of order one, and uh, for other indices also we have studied auto regressive of order one, order two. So this is uh, for the case of uh, auto regressive of order two. Uh, actually, no, no, uh, in no, real no, life no. also, yes. No, 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 no. In real life, you, you, you are skipping the earlier impacts, right? Yes. yes. And 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 you are using that model to capture the uh, motivation of the past uh, past information, right? Yes. yes. And, and that information you are skipping. Yes. This so uh, skipping, see again. Uh, actually, I have, uh, no, 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 have to my, mention no, 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 no. My point here is that one. This is the complete uh, artificiality uh, you are introducing. That is my point. Sorry. Okay, you are completely uh, doing the artificial way. Uh, yes, uh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, uh, you, 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 sampling formation. Uh, yeah. Subgroup yeah. formation. Yes. Okay, okay, okay. That's fine. Okay. Now, who, who is the next speaker? Uh, that is uh, Ragini Chawan. Ragini Chawan. Are you here? Ragini Chawan. Then skip it. Then next. Okay, next one is Namrata Nagwekar. Nagwekar. Yes. Hello. Uh, I request her to present her talk on status and policies of electric vehicles in India. Yeah. Good afternoon, sir. Am I audible? Yes, you are audible. Uh, okay. Oh, uh, so I am not able to share the screen. Sir, allow her. <laughs> Allowed. Okay, one minute. Uh, is it visible, it's, sir? Yes, it is visible. <laughs> okay. okay. Yes, it is visible. Okay. Oh, shall I start? Yes, yes. Within five minutes, you have to finish. Okay. So good afternoon all. Uh, since I'm going through the first phase of literature survey and collection of data, this topic is related to my PhD work with my guide RL Shinde. So uh, let us take an overview of automobiles, their problems and need for electric cars. Automobiles are a key part of modern transportation and they are powered by internal combustion engines which burn fuel to create energy that is used to move the vehicle. However, they come with a variety of problems, including air pollution, because they emit pollutants such as carbon dioxide, nitrogen oxide, and particulate matter into the atmosphere. Noise pollution, which can be disruptive to people and wildlife. Automobiles require resources such as oil and gas, which can be depleted over time. Traffic congestion can lead to delays and increased fuel consumption. Road accidents, which can cause injury or death. Of course, we cannot tackle all these problems at once, but some of them can be handled. And one solution to this above problems is the need for electric car. So what is an electric car? It is a vehicle that is powered by an electric motor instead of an internal combustion engine. They are powered by electricity stored in batteries or fuel cells, and they are typically more efficient because they produce fewer emissions than the traditional cars. So talking about the benefits and uh, challenges that we face in electric cars, electric cars produce zero emissions and they do not contribute to air pollution or global warming. Also, they require less maintenance uh, as they have fewer moving parts and uh, they can be powered by renewable, uh, renewable energy resources such as solar and wind. This leads to cheaper operating cost. Finally, electric cars are quieter, making them more pleasant to drive.
talking about challenges obviously uh, they are relatively higher compared to the traditional uh, petrol or diesel cars because of their high cost of batteries and other components also they have limited range due to their battery capacity so it makes difficult for the car owners to travel long distances without having to stop their cars for charging uh, the charging infrastructure in country like india is still uh, way behind it is not always available in all the areas there are very few charging stations which uh, make it difficult for the electric car owners to find a place to charge their vehicles secondly uh, the battery production is a problem in country like india because 60% of the manufacturing cost can be attributed to the raw material cost and india right now depends on imported lithium ion cells owing to limited local manufacturing capacity and scarcity of raw materials India currently also lacks a commercial scale recycling system because the retired batteries which can cause explosions when reacting spontaneously with moisture they are all hazardous elements and they get piled up and discarded in landfills without being adequately treated so let's just have a comparison between an electric car and the normal traditional petrol car electric cars from the price you can see that they are uh, comparatively higher however the maintenance cost and the carbon dioxide emissions are much much lower the range per charge uh, could be around 200 to 490 km per charge and the same when we compare it with the uh, petrol cars it is 15 to 20 km per liter this costs around uh, 1 to 2 rupee per km as uh, compared to the petrol car which costs at least 5 rupees per km then let us talk about the trends in india and abroad uh, according to a, a report by international uh, energy agency uh, the number of global uh, the number of electric cars globally has grown from 17000 units in 2010 to 7.2 million in 2019 this growth has been driven by a combination of government policies technological advances and consumer demand looking at the uh, numbers at uh, in in india it was just 1000 units in 2010 which has gone up to 1.2 million in 2020 additionally india uh, indian government has also set a target of having 30% of all its vehicles on the road by 2030 According to a report the global share of electric cars compared to the IC cars outside India was 2.6% in 2020 this is a significant increase from 0.2% in 2010 according to the society of manufacturers of electric vehicles in India the total uh, share is just 0.2% which is less than 1% however the sales have been increased significantly in the last few years the major players are mahindra mahindra tata motors hyundai mg motors and audi and from the second graph you can see that uh, mahindra is capturing a larger share in the ev market for india if we do a country wise comparison then we can see that norway is the leading country in terms of adoption of electric vehicles which leads to 117 persons per 1000 who own an electric car if we do the same analysis in the various states of india uh, we can see that the state of uttar pradesh is uh, it tops the list for uh, ev sales followed by maharashtra and delhi this is due to the widespread use of electric rickshaws in several cities of uttar pradesh talking about the global policies uh, the higher leading or the leading nations who have adopted electric vehicles have taken various initiatives uh, uh, such as reduction in the company car tax annual road tax most of them give exemption in the purchase tax subsidies are given to buy or switch to an electric car uh, incentives are also given for building infrastructure like installing chargers others include low parking charges tolls access to bus lanes or higher tax for uh, carbon dioxide emissions and so on uh india is on the ambitious goal of having 30% of its vehicles by 2013 and in this direction many initiatives like clean fuel policy bharat stage emission standards etc were taken uh, 
However, no concrete steps were taken uh, until 2012-13 with the launch of National Electric Mobility Mission Plan, whose main purpose was to address the issue of energy security, vehicular emission, and domestic manufacturing of electric vehicles. This has uh, led to the launch of faster adoption and manufacturing of electric vehicles that is the fame scheme in 2015 which is currently india's flagship scheme for promoting electric mobility which was launched by the uh, department of heavy uh, industries uh, currently india is in its second stage and it has a budget allocation of 10000 crore which includes spillover from phase 1 of rupees 366 crore uh, this initiatives are still not uh, enough because more has to be done if we have to achieve our targets in time. So what is the impact on the economy? The impact of electric cars on the economy is expected to be positive because electric cars are more efficient. Uh, they require less energy to operate and produce fewer emissions. This could lead to energy cost, lower energy cost for consumers as well as reduced air pollution and improved public health. Electric cars are expected to create new jobs in the automotive industry as well as in the renewable energy sector. This could lead to increased economic growth and improved standards of living. According to a report, uh, adoption of electric vehicles could reduce India's import bill by up to $60 billion by 2030. As Right now, currently, India spends about $150 billion annually on its oil imports. The increased demand for electric vehicles would create new jobs in the automotive industry as well as in the manufacturing and installation of charging infrastructure. With this, I end with my presentation. These are some of the references. Any questions are welcome. Thank you. Yes, any questions from audience? If not, then under this scenario, as you had presented the electric vehicle status, yes. here no, I think no methodology you had employed, right? Uh, sir, comparison was uh, made, yeah, and it was more of descriptive data uh, that has been done. You know what kind of comparison are the statistical comparison? Uh, where, is, where is that? So only the figure, I mean, the data collection has been done and uh, overall comparison of the policies and the figures have been done. Like, what was the status? Uh, wait, 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 wait. What kind of idea you have from this uh, topic? Uh, sorry, can you repeat the question, sir? What, ki what kind of the models or techniques tools used from the statistics for this data? Uh, sir, not uh, any particular technique as such, only comparisons have been made, sir. Not any particular model has been employed. Okay, are you using the primary data or secondary data? Uh, sir, most of them I'm using uh, data from reports of uh, agencies like SMAV and uh, so on, uh, the International Energy Agency reports. Okay, okay, okay. thank you. Okay. Yes, next, next student is Sejal Kadu. Kadu who is, yes, sir. Am I audible? Yes, yes. Who is presenting okay. consumers' perception towards organic versus inorganic products? Please yes. go ahead. Yes. So, uh, good afternoon, all of you. My name is Sejal Kadu. I am from TYBSC Sathe College. Under the guidance of Mr. Sanjay Karande, sir, I have done my research. My topic for the day is application of correspondence analysis, consumer's perception towards organic versus inorganic food. So, ever since the pandemic hit the world, people have deep down understood that health is real wealth. Our Honorable Prime Minister of India, Sri Narendra Modi have also been uh, identified organic products and organic farming is our national priority. And he is working to change the consumer's perception towards this direction. So my main objective for the study is to examine the consumer's perception towards organic versus inorganic product to determine the significant reason for choosing organic product. 
who study the barriers that exist in purchasing organic product for non-organic buyers. For this, the data was collected from the 191 consumers using uh, the simple random sa sampling technique. The graphical representation, chi squared uh, test through Excel, correspondence analysis through R software is used to analyze the data. Correspondence analysis. Correspondence analysis is a statistical technique that can be used to analyze relationship between categorical variable in a data set. It is usually represented in the form of scatter plot, where each point represents as a category and the distance between points reflects similarity between them. So here are uh, the steps for uh, getting the correspondence analysis by plot. Here is my first variable, income versus reason for choosing organic product. From this graph, we can see that the respondent with above one leg income choose organic product because they think that organic products are fresh than conventional product and they want to support local farmers. At the same time, the income from 50,000 to one leg uh, respondent think that organic products have high quality, high safety, and they think about family health first. My second variable is age versus reason for choosing organic product. Here we can see that the uh, age above 50 respondent think that uh, organic uh, organ, uh, the age above 50 think that uh, buy organic product because they want to support farmers. The age group from 41 to 50 buy organic product because they think that organic products are fresh than conventional products. Uh, they have high safety and high quality. At the same time, the age group from 25 to 30 uh, think about family health first. My third variable is qualification versus reason for choosing organic product. We can see here the respondent who are graduate, postgraduate buys organic product because they think that uh, organic products have high safety and they think about their health and family health. The respondent who are doctorate want to uh, buys organic product because they want to support farmers. The respondent who are undergraduate uh, wants to support, uh, worry about environment and they uh, show aversion towards MNC. My fourth variable is occupation versus reason for choosing organic product. Here we can see that the respondent who are in service buys organic product because they think that organic products are fresh than conventional products. A uh, housewife thinks that the organic products have high quality and the re uh, retired one thinks that they have uh, uh, they have a uh, family health. So from graphical representation, we can see that the consumers prefer to buy organic product because they have healthy, they have high safety, high quality and ecological. They are, thus, we can say that they are the main significant reason for consumers to choose the organic product. But at the same time, for non-organic consumers, we can say that uh, the, the prices of the organic product is a main barrier for them while purchasing the organic product. Consumers like to buy organic product if uh, they are low in prices. Here we can see in this graph. Uh, Chi-square test. I have also used the Chi-square test. Chi-square test is a used to know the association between two categorical variables. Uh, it is compared, uh, it compares observed result with expected result. So my null hypothesis is if there is an association between two variables. Here from uh, this table, we can see that income and choice of the product, there is an association between them. Uh, the uh, locality, locality and the choice of the product has also an association. Gender and the choice of the product does not have an association. And the lastly, we can say that inorganic customers are not willing to pay, pay the premium price for organic product. So uh, at the conclusion, we can conclude that uh, with the raising personal health consciousness and awareness regard and regarding environment issues, organic products slowly but gradually has created its own niche in the market. Most of the consumers from urban area prefer organic product than rural area. High prices of the organic product is the main barrier that exists in purchasing organic uh, product for non-organic buyers. The, uh, the non-organic consumers would like to buy organic products if it will be less expensive. So thank you, sir.
Thank you. Thank you. Okay, any questions from the audience? The student have given very nice uh, data collection and presentation and all the uh, work he did, he, she did is quite uh, good, but just little bit uh, reality of our country with population 140 crores. If we switch towards the organic farming, what will be its impact? So, uh, sir, uh, uh, as we know, the uh, organic products are uh, more nutritious. We can say that. Like, 100, uh, 100, 100% true. But what will be its another uh, impact? So, uh, sir, gradually it will happen. Not like uh, fast, but gradually it will happen. Uh, like, uh, it will happen. Uh, our predecessors do the organic farming, right? <laughs> in 1970, we switched towards inorganic farming with green revolution. Yes, it's, sir. Its reason is, is that we have huge population. It is yes. impossible to feed them. <laughs> yes, sir. That's why. That's why we switch towards. But but another, uh, as you had mentioned, another thing is that one. One should look after their health also. Yes, the next student. Thank you. Thank you, next, sir. Next student is Arti Kore. Arti Kore. Yes, sir. Good afternoon, sir. She, she will present uh, her uh, her talk on an overview of higher education statistics of India. Yes, sir. Am I audible, sir? Yes. yes. Yeah. Thank you, sir. I will uh, share my screen. Sir, is my screen visible? Yes. Yeah. So myself, Aarti Kore, Assistant Professor from KJ Sumaya College of Science and Commerce, Mumbai. My topic for today's presentation is an overview of higher education statistics of India. It is basically uh, a part of initial phase of my PhD work. Um, my smallest, yeah. So basically, um, education is, plays an important role in economic, social, and scientific development of country. Quality education is required to form a good human being who plays significant role in building of a nation. And higher education helps students to think innovatively and find solution to societal issues. NEP 2020 is to be implemented from this academic year. In view of this, an overview of higher education statistics of India is done in this particular study. So for that, what is higher education? It is defined as the education which is obtained after completing 12 years of schooling or equivalent and is of the duration of at least nine months or after completing 10 years of schooling and is of the duration of at least three years. India's higher education system is the third largest in the world next to the United States and China. Now, this roadmap shows us the growth of uh, Indian higher education in the 75 years after independence. At the time of independence, there were only 20 universities, 500 colleges, and 2.1 lakh students were enrolled in higher education. While in 2021, we can see that the universities are 50 times folded, uh, colleges are around 80 times folded, and uh, you, uh, in case of student enrollment in higher education, 200 times folded. There are also 11,296 standalone institutions along with the colleges in India currently. These numbers are based on the AISHA reports. AISHA uh, is All India Survey on Higher Education. So these are um, these graphs are showing trends in some of the higher education. Uh, indicators, we can see that the number of universities and number of colleges, they are increasing over the years. The third graph shows that average enrollment per college in major states, and we can say that Bihar, 
followed by Delhi. They have major, uh, they are topmost in average enrollment per college. Then uh, the next graph, which is uh, in the form of circles, I'm sorry. Oh. It is the number of colleges and eligible population. Now, eligible population means the population within the age group of 18 to 23 years. It shows that in Uttar Pradesh, the number of colleges are more and the eligible population is also more. The last graph, which is in the form of histogram and OJIU, it shows that around 60% colleges in India, they are having less than 500 enrollment in higher education. So these are some highlights, numbers showing the current status of Indian higher education. There are 1,113 universities, 43,796 colleges, 11,296 standalone institutions. Number of colleges per lakh eligible population is 31. Currently, 4.13 crore students have enrolled in higher education. Current gross enrollment ratio for India is 27.3. About 78% students have enrolled for undergraduate courses and 11% students have enrolled for postgraduate courses. In undergraduate courses, the enrollment is highest in arts followed by science, commerce, and engineering and technology. At postgraduate level, the enrollment is higher at social science stream followed by science. At PhD level, enrollment is highest in engineering and technology. Around 48,000 foreign students have, high, uh, have enrolled for higher education in India, and they are from 163 different countries. If we talk about the passing percentage, around 95.4 lakh students have passed out in 2021. At undergraduate level, the passing percentage is more in BA followed by BSc, BCom, and then BE and BTech. At postgraduate level, the passing, per passing percentage is more in arts faculty followed by MSc, then MBA and MCom. The highest number of PhD was awarded in science followed by engineering and technology. So this data is based on the ISHA report, uh, which was for 2021. Now, here we have seen the trend analysis for the number of students he, who have enrolled for higher education. The data shows, of course, increasing trend um, over the years. Number of students enrolling uh, for higher education, they are increasing. This is the graph for GER. Now, GER, that is gross enrollment ratio, is a universal indicator for the level of participation in higher education. It is universally indicator for the level of participation. And it is defined as number of students enrolled in higher education to eligible population, that is the population between the age group of 18 to 23. Now, this is worldwide accepted major indicator to uh, express the enrollment in higher education. Currently, our uh, GER for India is 27.3, which is um, lower than the world average GER, which is 29%. And it is much lower than the GER of the developed countries like USA, Germany, and UK. Uh, we can see the GER for male and female. Um, the graph clearly shows that the gross enrollment ratio in higher education for female, it is increasing. Whereas for male, it is showing somehow uh, within these two years, the GER is decreasing. And that may be a cause of concern because we expected equality among male and female. So uh, there is a measure which is required to be taken 
uh, so that the GER for male will also increase. Now, as I told be before, the GER for higher education of India is 27.1 currently, which is lower than the world average. Also, it is much lower than the um, average uh, than the GER of USA, Germany, UK. And it is lower even than the emerging economies such uh, of the countries like Brazil and China. So nowadays, there is another major that is EER, which is eligible enrollment ratio is in discussion. It is nothing but the ratio of number of students enrolled in higher education to the total number of students eligible for higher education. Now, if we look at this particular graph, it shows that though we are not that good in GER as compared to the other country, if we consider ER as a major, we are at a satisfactory level. So nowadays, there are articles and discussion regarding which is the better major to represent the enrollment in higher education. Um, so with this, uh, the conclusion is increasing GER for female and lowering GER for male is the cause of concern. Uh, by Calculating the compound interest, I can uh, I could find out that annual growth rate in GER for the period of 11-12 to 20-21 is 3.06% currently. With this growth rate in GER, till 2035, India GER will reach up to 41.63%. Now, in NEP, we are expecting to, we are, we have a target to achieve GER to 50% by 2035. If we want to achieve that target, the required growth rate in higher education enrollment should be 4.42%. Now, with this, if we uh, want to achieve this much GER, then around 16 lakh students should enroll more students should enroll in higher education per year progressing geometrically and accordingly the number of colleges should be uh, uh, created and uh, infrastructure should be provided the number of teachers should be hired skilled and training to the teachers should be given which are the challenges before higher education so with this these are the references and uh, thank you. This is about my presentation. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Okay, from the audience, do you have any question? If not, I will call the next student. Yes, K Power. Yes, K Power, are you there? Hello. Hello. Uh, yes, yes, sir, I am there. Yes, yes, I am there. Here sir, am I audible? Yes, yes. yes. He okay. will present his talk on confidence interval estimation of reliability functions at some fixed points for continuous distributions. Please go ahead. Yes, sir. So let me share my screen, okay? Yes. Okay, fine. So is my uh, presentation visible, sir? Yes, yes, yes you are visible. Okay, okay. Fine. So this is the first page so in this paper mainly what we are doing we are actually focusing on the reliability function so relative function is one of the very important aspect in statistical inference so what we are uh, going to do is uh, on the basis of generalized feudal quantities of uh, parameters uh, we are actually suggesting a confidence interval for the reliability function okay so <clears throat> The reliability function of a probability distribution is a very important phenomenon in reliability theory. In specifically in engineering, confidence interval estimation for reliability function is primary interest. And the accuracy of uh, such estimation directly influences the engineering investments. So the two parameter Weibull, Pareto, log normal, inverse Gaussian, gamma, these are the some uh, very important probability models in such applications. 
And in this paper, what we are going to do is we propose one confidence interval for relativity function at some fixed points of the distributions for which the generalized pivotal quantities exist for their parameters. Okay. So the main focus is uh, on such distributions or estimation of relative function of such distributions where the generalized pivotal quantities of parameter exist. Okay. And for the distributions where the GPQs do not exist, uh, we have not tried it. Okay. So it is uh, there in the, in that case, it is a, a little bit difficult to propose such a interval. Fine. So the proposed method is explained by constructing confidence interval for relative function for Weibull, Pareto, log normal, extreme value distribution of type one of minimum exponential normal for complete samples. We have also tried for the type two sensor samples also, but in this paper, I'm trying to focus on the complete sample case. And the performance of this proposed method is actually evaluated, seen, observed uh, on the basis of uh, 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 Monte Carlo simulation method. And uh, we have actually computed the coverage properties of the proposed method for various sample sizes. And we have seen that for small sample size also, this proposed method actually works very well. Okay. So let me go to the introduction. I will skip the introduction because it will actually cover the references relevant to uh, generalized variable approach, the literature survey about the GPQs. So I will go ahead. Also very briefly. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. So I will focus only on the definition of GPQ on the basis of which the entire thing is there. Okay. So GPQ is what? It is a quantity. Okay. It is a random quantity T theta. Okay. Which satisfies these two quantities, uh, conditions C1 and C2. So G theta, that is T theta is a free from nuisance parameter. And second property is that its distribution is actually uh, free from any unknown parameter. So if any quantity satisfying these two conditions is there, it is called as a GPQ. In examples, we will see the uh, exact form of the GPQ, okay? So this is the definition. So this is the proposed method. So relative function is actually, see if Xi's are uh, these random variables from Fx theta, then uh, Rt theta, this equation is uh, generally the relative function, okay? And uh, See, GPQ for RT theta is this equation. This is very important. So this is one minus CDF T and instead of theta, we are actually using the GPQ of the parameter. Okay, so this is the GPQ for relativity function. Once we can find uh, GPQ for the function in which we are interested, then the things are very easy. So we have got if GRT theta is GPQ for relativity function, then what we are going to do, we are going to follow this algorithm uh, on the basis of which we are going to compute the confidence interval. So see, uh, suppose, see, uh, GRT theta is a GPQ for a relativity function, then we uh, obtain two-sided confidence interval for GT theta based on GPQ GRT theta using these two steps. What we are going to do, we have to find out first uh, actually MLEs of the parameters. And for these observed MLEs of parameters, we just follow these two steps. What we will do in first step, we are going to compute the GPQ for our parameters and we uh, uh, put substitute the GPQs in the relative function equation so that we can get the GPQ for GR theta. And simply we obtain alpha by tooth and one minus alpha by, uh, alpha by tooth quantiles of this grt uh, quantities and those will actually form confidence interval for rt theta that's it it is so simple okay so and this uh, see there is one transformation uh, in uh, lawless uh, there is uh, one suggestion one monotron transformation this theorem is useful actually for one to one transformation just i will state it and proof is very simple if x is the continuous random variable with this PDF, CDF, and relative function, then LU be the two-sided generalized confidence interval for relative function, okay? If y is one-to-one -one monotonous function of x, then its inverse function, g inverse y, exists 
then two sided generalized confidence interval for lead function of y is simply we have to inverse the corresponding function that is gl and g okay and this transformation is actually useful to compute the uh, reliability function of location scale family of distributions so that is the application of that uh, one to one transformation fine so simply i have studied so many examples uh, i have computed uh, 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 reliability function for uh, various distribution continuous distributions where the gpq is for parameter exists for example for wavebull uh, there are two parameters for two parameters emily exists for both cases uh, for complete sample as well as uh, uh, sensor type 2 sensor samples so emily's are there so these are the actually gpq is for the parameters and this is the reliability function okay and rw is the actually uh, generalized p order quantity for uh, reliability function of wavebull distribution and simply we have implemented the previous algorithm for this reliability uh, function gpq and similarly for exponential distribution and uh, normal distribution we have actually uh, implemented the same thing for extreme value distribution of type 1 pareto log normal that one to one function is monotone transformation is implemented so that we can obtain the confidence interval for a light function of the inverted uh, random variables okay and actually we have studied the simulation study for these distributions for the proposed method okay fine so this is the log normal distribution okay so for a simulation study we have actually chosen uh, uh, parameter combinations for various distributions and studied the performance of the proposed method so these are the actually uh, parameters we have chosen for the simulation study and we have computed the uh, coverage probability of the uh, confidence interval by proposed method and i will directly show the uh, performances so for, we have chosen the coverage probability as 0.95 okay and rt means what uh, reliability has a 0 0.05 0 0.25 and 0.5 etc if you see the graphs so generalized variable method is the first method see the coverage probabilities we have actually shown the box plots by box plots we have shown the coverage probabilities and if you see the coverage probability is the proposed method actually uh, concentrate at the nominal level that is 95% okay for variable distribution we have compared with uh, two methods which are actually available in literature so uh, from the graphs it seems that actually it works very well even for small sample size that is 5 okay so similar results are actually uh, visible for the various levels of uh, reliability functions as well as various sample sizes so the generalized variable uh, variable approach actually works very well the coverage probability is estimated coverage probability is exactly coincide with the nominal coverage probability so it seems that the method works very well right so, so come to the conclusion to... yes 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 i will come to the conclusion so this is the overall conclusion i have so in this article we have proposed a confidence interval for large function of any distribution for which gpq exists for its parameter the proposed method is elucidated explained for location scale family of distribution under complete and type 2 sensor sample uh, it is easy to use and it explains exact coverage probabilities very close to the nominal coverage probability even for small unsensored sample as as small as 5 and type 2 right sensor samples as long as proportion of sensor observations is up to 70% means up to 70% of sensor samples are there it works very well so this is the actually uh, performance evaluation and method was very well sir so that is thank the end sir. of the presentation thank you thank you sir okay. Uh, okay. yes any questions from the audience uh, yes sir one question yeah, if yeah. i just use mle in your unknown parameter theta no so if i use yes. mle if it exists yes. uh, then what happens so we have to use the mle only sir mle is also ml is ml we have to use ml because ml actually works very well uh, if we use i have used the moment estimators also if you use any other estimator then uh, the estimated coverage probabilities uh, uh, 
violate a little bit, but those are actually close to the nominal also. But if, if you use maximum likelihood estimator, the estimated coverage probabilities exactly goes to the nominal one, very close to the nominal. That means you are giving pivot to MLH. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Okay, uh, okay, okay. but the, uh, just uh, in addition to that, as sir said, uh -huh. is there any problem of overestimation and underestimation under MLE? No, sir, no. It exactly works. Exactly work. That is the beauty of this concept. But in some uh, some cases, EMLE need not be the unbiased, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. Under these scenarios? Yeah, if some cases the EMLE need, need not be unbiased, in that yeah. case also, sir, it works well. Are you sure? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> uh, I will call the next student. Or oh, sir, yes, stop sharing. Yes, yes. Sir, power. Yes, sir. I, I request uh, them to present his talk on double moving average control charts for process variability with auxiliary information. Okay, sir. May I share the screen? Uh, Arika Power. Yes, one minute. Am yes. I able to share, sir? Yes, yes, you can share now. Okay. And be fast, madam. Yes, sir. yes, sir. Yes, sir. Within five minutes, you have, you have to finish. Yes, sir. Really not sharing. Sharing, sir. Yes, now it is. Sharing. Is my screen visible, sir? Yes, yes. <coughs> Good afternoon, everyone. I am Sarika Power from Punya Shlok, Ahiladevi Holkar, Solapur, University, Solapur. I am presenting my work entitled as Double Moving Average Control Chart for Monitoring Process Variability using auxiliary information under the guidance of Dr. V. P. Gutesar. So this is the plan of my presentation. Introduction, control chart is one of the most widely known tools of the statistical process control, that is SPC, which is extensively used to monitor changes in the process parameters. Two types of control charts are generally used to monitor production processes, namely the location chart and the dispersion chart. The location chart is used to monitor process mean and the dispersion chart is used to monitor the process variability. It is a standard practice to use the Sheva X bar chart for monitoring the process mean and R or S chart for monitoring the process variability. Some practitioners recommend a control chart based directly on sample variance S square control chart for monitoring the process variability. A major disadvantage of the Sheva type control chart is that they use only information of last sample observation and ignores, the and ignores the past information of the process, which makes it insensitive to small shifts in the process parameters. Memory-based control charts, such as Kusum chart, exponentially weighted moving average, that is EWMA chart, and moving average, that is MA chart, are also developed in the literature as alternative to the Shevard charts for the detection of small processes, process shift in the process parameters. They are constructed using past information regarding the production process and are more sensitive to monitor the small and moderate shifts in the process parameters. Relative to the Kusum chart and EWMA chart and MA chart are quite basic. The EWMA chart uses a weighted average as a chart statistic, while the time-weighted MA chart is based on simple moving average. The moving average statistic of field W is simply the average of the most W most recent observations. This is the literature review. In order to increase the sensitivity of the traditional control charts, many new modifications and improvements in the control charting procedure have been suggested in the SPC literature. One of such modifications is the development of auxiliary information based, that is AIB control charts, which have an excellent speed in detecting shifts in the process parameters than those based without it. Such control charts are based on a statistic that utilizes information from both the study and the auxiliary variables. The information on auxiliary variable is generally known prior to the sampling procedure 
and it assists in estimating the steady variable with increased accuracy madam just comment don't on your slides you. don't read each and every one okay sir so this is the shevat compose chart for process variance then this is the shevat type auxiliary information based the v chart this is my test statistic and these are the control limits mean and variance of the statistic then moving average and double moving uh, control charts for variability so in this section we develop a moving average and double moving average control chart for detecting the small changes produced in the process variances the proposed moving average and double moving average chart based on auxiliary information based the v statistic denoted by mav and double moving by dmav chart so simulation study is conducted to study the arl performance of the proposed charts so these are the limits for the moving average chart then double moving average statistic is based on the twice of the subgroup average of the ma statistic the moving average statistic for sequence of subgroups variances with time i and with w so this is the double moving average these are the limits of the statistic then performance evaluation so in this section we evaluate performance of mab and dmab chart carried out by the simulation study uh, with the sample size in equal to 10 15 and 20 with the for different correlations 0.3 0.6 and 0.9 uh, let us assume that the in control process is a bivariate normal distribution without loss of generality a standard bivariate normal distribution is considered as in control process distribution and the out of control process is a bivariate normal with the same means of both auxiliary and steady variables with changed variances of steady variable the out of control arl and sdrl values of the control chart for various shifts in the process vari variability of the steady variable are then computed using the 50000 simulations for each shift of the magnitude delta in the process variance of the steady variable to compare the performance of the proposed mav that is moving average chart and double moving average chart with shevat chart and shevat s square chart uh, each chart is designed so that arl 0 is approximately 200 the uh, control limit constants arl and sdrl values of all the charts are obtained using simulation so these are the tables so here we take the sample size in equal to 10 uh, correlation value 0.3 so here we can easily see uh, see that that s square gives the out of control signal at the point 72 and b chart gives the out of control signal at the point 46 and ma chart which is moving average of the v statistic is give the at w equal to 2 span 2 it gives the out of control signal at 36 then for same uh, for double moving average at uh, span 2 it gives the shift at 34.65 65 so here we can easily see that the uh, detection of the shift is early in the double moving average than the um, traditional charts so here also we can see that Uh, early detection of shift in case of double moving average is happened here so these are the tables so here also we can see that for n equal to 20 the uh, early detection of the shift is possible at the 20 point means if we increase the sample size and uh, correlation coefficient then we uh, detect the early detect the shift for any range of shifts in the process parameters the double moving average uh, charts consistently produces smaller out of control arl than the moving average charts and shevat type charts that means proposed double moving average charts early detect shifts in the process parameters than the other charts out of control arl values of double moving average charts decreases as rho increases and out of control arl values of double moving average chart decreases as w increases so this is the literal illustrative example So in this example, we take the sample size 15, and the 15 subgroups. Lambda is one. So first eight samples, we take it out from out of control, and after um, first seven sample, and after uh, from eight sample, we give the shift of 1.5. So here we can easily see that for V chart, we does not detect any shift in the process. Then for moving average chart, we detect the shift at the point 13. and for the double moving average chart we uh, observe the shift at the point 11 so conclusions in this paper we have proposed the auxiliary information based the moving average and double moving average control chart to efficiently monitoring the variability of normally distributed processes the proposed control chart utilizes information on auxiliary statistic x for monitoring the uh, monitoring of the process variability with respect to a single quality characteristic y 
using extensive Monte Carlo simulation, the run length characteristic of the proposed chart has been computed. The detection ability of the proposed chart are compared with those of its existing counterparts, and it has been found that the proposed chart performs better in detecting the different variances shift sizes. So these are some differences. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Madam. Yes, any questions? Madam, stop sharing. Okay, ma'am. Okay, sir. Any questions from audience? Okay, ma'am. Uh, this auxiliary information uh, or auxiliary variable is it correlated with that study variable? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, how much correlation should be there among these? Um, it may be variable, sir. Uh, uh, zero correlation to up to perfect correlation. Even though they, it will detect. Yes. No. If you say zero correlation, then how they are auxiliary variable? I mean. Ah, yes, sir. Sorry, sir. <laughs> there is no correlation. Sorry. <laughs> Next student. Vike Gadge. Vike Gadge. Is it there? Vike yes. Gadge? Yes. yes. I, requ I request him to present his talk on improved non parametric control charts for process location. In brief. Yes, I mean, in brief, within five minutes. Okay. Yes. Yes, it is visible. Yes, thank you, sir. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. Today's my topic is improved distribution free control chart for process location. I pursue my PhD degree under the guidance of Dr. E. V. Gute. The plan of registration is introduction, non parametric test for scale. Non parametric test for location, sorry, location, non parametric control chart using FRS scheme and RS scheme. Mm. Baumgartner suggested a two sample test in 1998, proposed a distribution free two sample rank test for general alternative for combined samples. Let R1 is less than R2 is less than Rn and H1 is less than H2 is less than HM. We know the ranks of X and Y value in increasing order of magnitude respectively. Uh, Murakami modified this uh, Baumgartner initially in 1998. Baumgartner suggested statistics, distribution tree, uh, two sample state statistics. And Murakami uh, proposed a modification in this statistics. One is the uh, max uh, b2 that is the b2 statistics which is the maximum of b1x and b1y where b1x is equal to this and b1y is equal to this and also monokami in 2012 suggest another modification of the statistics that is b3 the idea of the modification is to be replaced by the weight function as follows b3 is equal to half b3x plus b3y where b3x is this in this uh, the difference between b1x and b3x is we, uh, it takes the square of denominator and here we consider two uh, schemes SRS simple random sample, sample scheme and uh, regressive sample scheme. Here let x is equal to x1 x2 xn and a simple random sample of size n called a reference sample has distribution function f and let y1 y2 ym be the random sample of size m from the continuous manufacturing process having distribution function g. Here, F and G differ in location parameter only. The problem is to monitor location of the process. The stat state statistic B2 and B3 define the above equation 1 and 2 based on the SRS are usual charting statistics for the proposed control chart and monitoring the process location and chart. The charts are respectively generated by SRS LB2 and SRS LB3. And the second is we collect a random reference samples of size n and test samples of size m 
and we find the upper control limit by using the Monte Carlo simulation study under SRS scheme and under RSS scheme, rank reset sampling scheme, we develop the SRS LB2 and SRS LB3, two charts, as the charting statistic B2 and B3, lower control limits are zero and charts require only upper control limits. Rank reset sampling scheme is first introduced by McTire in 1952. Sample software by this method will be the rank using other variables that related to the variables of interest or variable to be actually measurement. The procedure for selection of samples using RSS scheme is given below. We take a random sample of uh, select n square units from each sample, randomly allocate these n square units in n groups, rank the first unit of each group ascending order of magnitude by personal judgment or visual inspection by using some auxiliary variables. Select sample, smallest value from the first group and second smallest value from the second group. The procedure will be continued. The last sample units corresponding to largest value of <coughs> from the nth group. And this gives the rank reset sample of size here. We calculate the upper control limit by using simulation study. And these are the values of UCL. And uh, we take reference sample 10, 20, 20, and 40 and test sample 10, 10, 20, and 40. The equal sample size, reference sample and test samples are equal, and there is a 20, uh, 20, 10, these are unequal random samples, and these are the, under SRS and RSS scheme, these are the values of upper control limit H. The performance of these statistics under two distributions, one is the normal distribution and second is the double exponential distribution. We take a, 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 for in control process reference sample of side N and test sample of side M under the both SRS and RSS schemes are based on the observation generated from normal 0, 1 distribution. For out of control process, reference samples under both SRS and RSS scheme are based on the observation generated from normal 0, 1 distribution, whereas the test sample under both SRS and RSS scheme are based on the observation generated from normal delta 1, where theta 1 is equal to theta naught plus delta sigma naught. Magnitude of shift in process mean is considered as delta is equal to 0 0.1.2, 1, 2, and 3. With SRS scheme, the values of chart statistic B2 and B3 for SRS LB2 and SRS LB3 charts are computed using equation 1 and 2 respectively. Similarly, with RSS scheme, the value of chart statistics B2 and B3 for RSS LB2 and RSS LB3 charts are also computed using equation 1 and 2 respectively. All these uh, charts are calculated, calibrated with in-control ARL of 500 with various combinations of reference and test samples in and M. The values of UCL are obtained by designing the charts. To have ARL not is equal to 500, ARL not, not means in control run length. The out of control ARL and SRL values of the chart are found with 50,000 simulation for each shift of magnitude delta in the process name. These are the uh, for uh, N is equal to 20 and M is equal to 10, that is unequal to it. Here we observe that the RSS for uh, if it shift is 0.1, SRS LB2, the value of ARL is 394. And under SRS scheme, the value of this chart is 202. That means we here observe that the RSS scheme shows better performance than SRS scheme. This is for normal distribution. And this is for n is equal to 40 and m is equal to 40. This also shows that here for point one, the SRS under SRS scheme, the ARL is 254, but in RSS scheme it is only 22.8. And these are the performance of evaluations under SR uh, normal distribution, and this is for and double exponential distribution for 2010 and 44.
the conclusion in this paper srs scheme is used to construct a full chart type non parametric control chart for monitoring the location of the crochet the proper chart are based on bomb butter match type and modifier bomb butter test statistics replaced by its weight function the performance of the proposed chart is evaluated using arl and sdrl criteria and is compared with the respective srs counterparts the result of the simulation <coughs> shows that when there is a shift in process location the rss based chart detects shift earlier than the chart based on the srs scheme non parametric control chart based on rss scheme shows better performance than the chart based on the srs scheme for equal and unequal sample size these are the references okay thank you okay thank you thank you gadish uh, uh, gadish sir ha huh? i have just a little bit uh, one uh, query regarding this one of your sharing uh, you you had uh, claimed that one the rss based control chart is superior right yes what is motivation of rss in under which situation we are using rss in which situation we use rss already some uh, in literature mm -hmm. common use is uh, srs scheme srs simple random scheme is used by many authors yes that is the, that is 100% correct that's why i am i am asking you question what is motivation of rss uh, uh, under motivation of rss rss firstly we observe the sample and then rank rank them right hmm. am i right yes yes whenever we are doing so then obviously it will uh, uh, it will directly sh shows the shift na that's why uh, we, that that's why again uh, I, i am requesting you just go through the literature of uh, rss under which scenario we are using that one under uh, uh control chart can we employ it or not because of rss is most time used in huge forest or where the we could not make the observations under that scenarios visual observations are allowed but in your scenarios you are employing this kind of technique in company that's why just uh, go through the motivation of that one okay <laughs> next student is uh, Prakash, Prakash Chawan. Prakash, I think he is not there. Okay, then then next student is V V Gadge. Is he or she there? V V Gadge. I think she is also not there. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. She is there. Okay, she will present her talk on acceptance sampling based on truncated live test. or shankar distribution okay here your screen post to this please give access sir <coughs> sir give give access sir please please Correct, sir. Give her access to share screen. Sir, you are not audible. Correct, sir. Dad, yes, sir. Already you are post. Sir, uh, give access. Give access, sir. Dad, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Can you can you listen me? Correct, sir. There are two guards. Vijay Kumar guards. Ah, guards, yes, sir. And she. हेलो सर लॉग इन है 
just uh, unmute yourself then sir could sir, identify uh, give access please yes now now this guy yes i am rushali gargi but the name is vijay kumar rushali vijay kumar gargi <laughs> both have same name that's why Mm -hmm. now, now now you are ready to share the screen okay shall i start sir yes boy yes, and we pass good afternoon everyone my name is vishali vijay kumar gharge from department of statistics uh, punya shlok ahila devi holka solapur university solapur uh, my title uh, today i am presenting uh, my title is new uh, acceptance sampling plan based on uh, truncated life test so, truncated life test for shankar distribution under the guidance of uh, dr dm jumbade sir Uh, presentation outline introduction uh, shankar distribution uh, third computation of minimum sample size fourth computation of oc function fifth computation of minimum ratio of true mean life to specified life sixth conclusion uh, acceptance sampling plans uh, are used to determine the acceptability of product in Uh, where the consumer can accept or reject a not random sample selected from the uh, process begins with obtaining the minimum sample size necessary to ascertain as certain average life when the life test terminated we determine test uh, type such test called the uh, truncated uh, life test an acceptance uh, sampling plan based on truncated life test consists as uh, following quantities Uh, first, uh, the number of units n on test. Uh, second, an acceptance number c, where if c is uh, c or less failures happen within the test time, the lot is accepted. And third, uh, the maximum test duration time t. And fourth, uh, the ratio t upon mu not, where mu not the specified average life. Uh, in this, uh, the main object. And of, don't uh, read each and every word. Just comment and go ahead. These uh, these are the previous literature uh, re regarding acceptance sampling plan for truncated lab tests. Uh, these uh, these are the uh, PDF of Shankar distributions, uh, which is called Shankar distributions. And these uh, this is uh, this is the cumulative distribution function of uh, Shankar distribution. And this is the arc moment of uh, moment, and this is uh, this is the mean of Shankar distribution. Now, assume that a uh, life lifetime product uh, for the Shankar distribution defined uh, equation one, and here we assume a uh, lot size infinitely large, so that the theory of binomial distribution can be applied. Assume that uh, consumer risk. Uh, is determined uh, one minus uh, p star. That is probability that the real mean life uh, mu is uh, then mu not not ex uh, exceeds one minus p star. Here the problem is to determine smallest sample size necessary to uh, satisfy the inequality. Mm, this is the equation. Where C uh, is the acceptance number for given values of P star belongs zero comma one, where P is equal to f of t comma mu naught is the probability of failure within the time t, uh, which depends only on the ratio t upon mu naught. If uh, number of the failures within time t uh, at most C, uh, from equation five we can. Uh, Uh, probability p that uh, f of t uh, comma mu uh, less than or equal to f of t comma mu not, which implies mu not uh, less than or equal to mu. Uh, the minimum sample size value p star is equals to zero point seventy five, zero point ninety, zero point ninety five, zero point ninety nine, and t not upon mu not is equals to 
uh, these are the values. The values uh, of uh, T naught upon U naught uh, and P star are consist of corresponding values on the Sri and Alumni 2000. Well, is an almost 2004 uh, at all 2001 and two time growth 1961. Minimum sample, uh, minimum sample size necessary to ensure uh, mean life uh, to exceed given value mu not with probability p star and acceptance number c for Shankar distribution with uh, with theta 2. Uh, with theta 2, uh, we take a uh, value of P star uh, 0 0.75, 0 0.90, uh, 0 0.95, and 0 0.99. And we take uh, acceptance number C, uh, value of uh, 0 to 10. And we calculate uh, these are the values. The uh, uh, OC function of uh, sampling plan n comma c comma t upon u naught is the probability uh, accepting the naught. It can be considered as so so, so for choosing the for choosing the minimum sample size n uh, or the acceptance number c. The operating characteristic function of suggest acceptance uh, sampling plan is defined as. Um, these are the equation. And these are the uh, OC functions uh, when you we calculate the uh, OC functions. The producer is if the probability of rejection of the well, uh, the lot win is good, that is mu uh, greater than mu not. Uh, P, uh, uh, PR is equals to probability of rejecting lot. Um, summation i is equals to c plus 1 n uh, uh, ci p raised to i uh, bracket to the bracket uh, 1 minus p uh, raised to n minus i minimum ratio of true mean life to specified life uh, for the acceptability of a lot with producer risk of 0 0.05 for Shankar distribution with theta 2 and uh, these are the, uh, uh, we calculate uh, mean, minimum ratio. Uh, conclusion. Uh, e, uh, in the uh, in this paper, uh, new acceptance sampling uh, sampling plan based on truncated life test, uh, the Shankar distribution are proposed, the necessary tables are presented for the minimum sample size needed to guarantee a certain mean life of the test unit. The operating characteristic function values as well as the associated producer risk are provide, uh, also provided. The outcomes of this paper can be used to develop other kind of acceptance sampling plans such as group and double acceptance sampling plans for Shankar and other distributions. These are the references. Thank you. Okay. From the audience, is there any question? Madam, one simple question. Simple question. Why, why is it called the Shankar, Shankar distribution? Yeah, Why the name of that distribution is Shankar distribution? Um, author Rama Shankar uh, is developed a Shankar distribution, so he uh, his name. Okay, you have mentioned it in your uh, references. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. I mentioned. Okay. Okay. Ma'am, okay. uh, ma you as you mentioned that one, uh, the, there is some truncation. Truncation regarding the uh, mean at pivot or where? Mean, mean, sir. Okay. 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 I think uh, I, I think this uh, session is over, and I am very thankful to the organizers. For giving me the chance for thank you, for you, sir, for your, decision. <laughs> thank you, sir, for your patience. <laughs> <laughs>
very big technical okay. session is there yeah, there yeah, are yeah. 12 speakers uh, yeah. let's start thank you for uh, sharing this uh, first technical session uh, thank you once thank again you, sir. thank you sir now yes now due to short of time uh, we proceed for next technical technical session okay thank uh, you sir. for this second uh, technical session uh, chairperson is uh, professor n bosgude sir uh, let me introduce him uh, very quickly uh, he is a graduate from shivaj university post graduate from karnataka university again a doctorate from uh, shivaj university under the guidance of professor arun gatiyali uh, then of course uh, he worked in gokle college and then at present he is working uh, at uh, rajaram bapu college of sugar technology islampur as a principal so with this brief introduction i uh, hand over charge to bosude sir uh, to conduct this second technical session okay thank you sir ui patil sir and dr uh, kore sir welcome sir okay yes. am i audible yes yes sir. yes 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 okay okay good afternoon everyone i will take this opportunity to congratulate principal dr b g kore sir for organizing this conference in online mode and also i thank all the organizers for giving me this opportunity to chair this uh, second session of this international conference already uh, organizers have communicated all the rules and regulation regarding the presentation of the paper you are getting 5 minutes for presentation 1 minute or 2 minutes for uh, quick queries and uh, you have to finish up as early as possible because we are running uh, 45 minutes late minutes late so uh, we will not waste the time i will directly call upon the first uh, speaker uh, that is uh, mr od ghatge to present his paper on new approaches for monitoring simple and multiple linear regression profiles so gadge sir please yes gar gar ke just i okay okay sir gar gar ke okay yes you can say yes okay sir is my screen visible sir yes yes yeah. okay. okay thank you sir. be briefly Okay, I am Omkar Dadge from Department of Statistics, Pune Shlok Ayurveda University, Kolhapur University. Title of my today's presentation is New Approach for Monitoring Simple and Multiple Linear Regression Profiles. This work is done under the guidance of Professor Vijay Bhutesar. This is the outline of my presentation. Uh, here we consider only simple linear regression profile. Uh, all of us knew that control chart is. Uh, mainly used in a statistical process control to monitor various processes uh, in general shower type control chart exponential weighted moving average control chart cumulative sum control charts are used to monitor univariate quality characteristics in some situations uh, quality of the manufacturing processes depends on one or more variable is more than one variable in such situation we use multivariate t square chart multivariate twm chart multivariate kusum chart but in some situations uh, response variable is depends on one or more variable in some uh, in this situation quality of the manufacturing process is well monitored by functional relation between two or more variables and monitoring this stability of functional relation uh, between the two or more variables is known as proper monitoring here we consider only simple linear regression profile and the model of simple linear regression profile is given in equation 1 y is equal to a0 plus a1x plus epsilon where y is response variable a0 and a1 are regression parameter epsilon is random error term where small a0 and small a1 are uh, sample estimates of regression parameters sigma0 square sigma1 square and are the variances of sample estimates sigma0 1 square is the covariance between the uh, intercept and slope these are the few existing control chart for monitoring simple linear regression profile shevard tree control chart hotelling tree control chart ewm and control r control chart ewm3 and kusum tree control chart uh, in this study we have proposed a group trans control chart for monitoring simple and 
multiple linear uh, regression for permonitoring where group runs is denoted by gr and this chart is uh, based on uh, statistic t square fertility t square statistics gr t square charts uh, consist of two sub chart uh, where uh, one sub chart is based on t square statistics and uh, second is extended version of confirming the run rate chart t square sub chart t square statistics is calculated as zj minus u transpose sigma inverse into zj minus u where the zj is the vector of sample estimates of regression parameters and capital u is the vector of regression non regression parameter sigma is the variance covariance matrix and on the basis of zj u and sigma we calculate t square uh, statistics which is given in uh, equation 6 control limit for t square statistics is given as phi square p comma alpha where p is the number of sample estimates in zj vector or number of regression parameters and alpha is the probability of type one error this is the information about t square uh, sub chart crl sub chart is nothing but the confirming run length chart which is based on the confirming run length confirming run length is nothing but the Uh, confirming samples between two consecutive non-confirming items, and uh, this chart shows out-of-control signal when these run lengths are less than equal to L, where L is the lower limit for the confirming run length subchart. Here is the construction of GRT square chart. First, we calculate uh, t-square statistics. If this t-square statistics is less than equal to CL, then we uh, consider this sample as confirming sample otherwise the sample is non confirming sample and uh, based on this confirming and non confirming sample we calculate crl where crl is the number of t square sample between the current and previous non confirming samples and this crl is denoted by yr yr is non, nothing but the confirming run length based on rth group if this yr is greater than l l is the lower limit of crl subchart if yr is greater than l then process is thought to be in control and uh, the out of control criteria for group run control chart is that if first run length y1 is less than or equal to l or two successive yrs yr and yr plus one less than or equal to l then we say that process is out of control Uh, this is the operation of uh, grt square chart for grt square chart we have to obtain uh, optimal uh, parameter design the procedure for optimal parameter design is given here we have to specify first p d star d star is the design shift sigma not is the in control variance covariance matrix arl gr not is the in control arl and alpha first we will start with l is equal to 1 by using equation 10 we obtain value of This CL based on P not by using in control ARL not we use here bisection method to calculate uh, value of uh, alpha and uh, L based on this L and alpha we calculate ARL G D star where D star is the specific design shift for uh, this combination of L and alpha we calculate ARL G star next we increase L by one and again. Uh, repeating same, uh, same procedure we calculate arl d star and we select the combination of l and alpha for which arl d star is minimum and uh, after obtaining the optimal parameter we, uh, we can uh, set the control limits and uh, uh, check the performance of our process here we consider a simple linear regression profile y is equal to a not plus a1 x plus epsilon and the performance when the shift in intercept shift in slope and error variance is uh, studied in table 1 uh, all the charts are fixed to in control arl 200 and shift of size delta 1 in terms of sigma is given in intercept and uh, simulation study is done here we can see that for the shift size of uh, delta 1 is equal to 1 greater than 1 gr t square chart performs better than all remaining uh, control charts and uh, for shevard t chart and hotting t square chart for overall shifts gr t square charts performs better than 
these two charts, shower three and fourteen piece per chart. For uh, uh, example, for shift of size point two, GRT square chart shows AR and one zero six point eight, and shower three and T square chart shows one fifty one and one thirty seven, which are greater than one zero six. So overall, GRT square chart performs better than shower three and hotel T square chart when shift is considered in intercept. In table two, shift is considered in uh, slow. Here also we can see that for large shifts, GRT square chart performs better than uh, remaining charts, and for all shifts, GRT square chart performs better than shower three and hotel T square chart. Here in table three, uh, we studied the performance of Uh, ships under the standard deviation. Here we can see that for overall ships, GRT square chart performs better than all remaining charts. And for large ships, the performance of GRT square chart and all uh, remaining charts is uh, uh, approximately similar. Now this is the uh, simulation study for simple linear regression profile. Here we consider one real life example and. Uh, Uh, demonstrated how the GRT square chart um, can be used for monitoring uh, simple and multiple linear regression profile. Here we used only simple linear regression profile and calculated GRT square chart. Here we can see that on fourth day the observation is greater than upper limit, 6.9248. And for this example, year is 16, and run length is 4. So run length is less than year. So, out of control signal is detected. These are the overall conclusion based on these tables, reviews and references. Thank you. Okay. Is there any uh, question from audience? Okay. If not, we will go. Thank you. I'll uh, thank um, the speaker and I'll call upon the next speaker, Dr. R. H. Wadi, and he has to present his paper on inventory model in uncertain and uh, imprecise environment. Hello, sir. Please uh, allow me to share my screen. Sir, statistics. Statistics department. Ah, yes. Okay. 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 Doctor, where is them? Yes, sir. Yes, I'm there. I'm uh, sharing my screen. Oh. Please keep the time. Yes, sir. Okay. Within five minutes, sir. Where is it? Yes, sir. Okay, sir. Sir, is my screen visible? Yes. Thank you. Uh, I am Rahul Wadi. I am going to present uh, article on imprecise imprecise inventory model in uncertain and imprecise environment. Uh, introduction. Uh, most of the inventory models have been developed by uh, considering that the parameters on objective and constraint goals are fixed. but uh, however they are in some uh, most of the situations the parameters are uncertain and uh, uncertain and in that case this uh, fixed uh, model are not useful chris model are not useful so to tackle uncertainty and imprecision uh, we can use the stochastic and fuzzy approach and we can uh, solve the model uh, the more interesting part is uh, if there is some parameters are uncertain and some are imprecise then in that mixed environment the model becomes more uh, real life uh, model and uh, uh, i am going to present uh, uh, such a model uh, in case of inventory uh, so these are the notations 
CI is a price per unit, PI is a price per unit, and QI is the initial stock of item item. This is a multi-item model, uh, and uh, demand is exponential uh, demand. And uh, CHI is holding cost, CDI is a cost of deterioration, T is a time cycle, uh, time period for each cycle, and C2I is a cost of shortage. Assumptions are instant, uh, instant replenishment is available, shortages are acceptable, no lead time, selling price is fixed and cost. So uh, there is in, uh, initially there is a QI inventory for of item, uh, and uh, it is going demand and partially due to the deterioration, and it will uh, end at time t is equal to ti, and then shortages uh, going to occur. Uh, so equation first represent the initial inventory equation uh, for time interval zero to ti. And we can you uh, solve this equation by using the boundary condition that if there is initially there are QI items, uh, then uh, by using this initial condition, uh, we got the solution of equation one. It is given in equation two. At t is equal to ti, that is at time ti, the inventory becomes zero, and we got the value of ti. Uh, then uh, the differential equation describing the state of inventory in time interval ti to t, the t shortages are going to occur from uh, on time ti onwards. And uh, by using the, by solving this equation, we got uh, qi t is equal to that equation. Uh, then total holding cost over prior time period zero to ti can be calculated, and uh, uh, zero to ti chi uh, integrating qi t and uh, uh, we can uh, get that equation. Then total shortage cost is minus C2i uh, from Ti to T because shortage is going to open afterwards from Ti. And uh, this is the equation for the total shortage cost. And profit can be calculated by using the formula that total selling price minus total uh, uh, selling price minus purchasing cost into QI and total holding cost minus uh, to a total shortage cost. Then the problem is to uh, then the problem is maximize profit subject to the condition that is uh, so uh, uh, we have limited budget and limited warehouse uh, space uh, subject to that condition. Then uh, this is a crisp model, and uh, here uh, to the crisp model uh, in that crisp model we use that uh, CIs are uh, Invest, CI and investment are probabilistic and uh, storage area is uh, uh, fuzzy. And uh, then the model is given here. The way we bar shows that uh, this is a fuzzy and the cap shows that the parameter is, uh, uh, parameter is probabilistic and follows normal distribution. Now, uh, probabilistic in nature because in that also uh, CIs are coming. So, uh, the model is become fuzzy stochastic model and the crisp version of this model is uh, obtained by using fuzzy nonlinear programming technique that is maximize alpha subject to the conditions, uh, three conditions, four conditions and uh, expected profit and variance of profit can be obtained by using chance constant uh, programming concept. And uh, in that case, the expected profit and variance of profit is given by this formula. And uh, uh, I have solved a uh, crisp model, fuzzy stochastic inventory model for a uh, set of parameter values. And uh, crisp model solutions are obtained. And uh, for fuzzy stochastic model, uh, the solutions are obtained by using uh, Indo software. And uh, these are the results. Uh, thank you. These are the, some references. Thank you. It is thank you, thank you, the audience. Is there any question? No question. Okay, let me thank the speaker and call the next speaker, Dr. Rupali Shen Gupta, and to present her paper on an in, uh, inferential uh, respiratory uh, cross-sectional study on anthropometric measurements, diet patterns, stress uh, symptoms of vegetarian women between 50 to 80 years before and during uh, COVID lockdown. 
Good afternoon, sir. Uh, can you just make me a co-host? Ah, yeah, thank you. Yes, already made. Yeah, 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 yeah. <clears throat> Madam, be briefly within five minutes. Yes, sir. So, uh, good afternoon, everyone. The study of my uh, work is on the anthropometric measurement, diet pattern, stress symptoms of vegetarian women who are aged between uh, 50 to 80 years before and during the COVID lockdown. So, the study is like comparative study, yeah, study where we all know that the COVID has taken a manac in every human's life. So, the study was done to understand the behavioral pattern. Uh, such as the di dietary intake, physical exercise, screen time among the general population. And similarly, the data about the anthropometric measurements with a specific re reference to weight to height ratio, which is an in indicator of increase in visceral fat uh, among the general population after the outbreak of COVID and the lockdown imposed in the country in the March 2020, the data was lacking and the association was done in this study of the selected stress symptoms, dietary activity patterns, including the sleep in perimenopausal age group in India during the COVID, highlighting the gap in knowledge and warrant attention. So aim, I will not repeat again, I've already said in the title, coming to the objective to compare the dietary pattern during uh, COVID among the perimenopausal women with their diet patterns one year previously, and to determine the way, uh, whether weight and abdominal adiposity has changed in the perimenopausal women assessed one year before COVID, followed up during the COVID lockdown period. To assess the sleep health of these women and stress experienced one year before and during lockdown. Statistics from descriptive to inferential statistics were used. So methodology uh, to study the attempted to answer the following research question. Have dietary patterns altered due to the lockdown? Over a period of one year, particularly due to lockdown, has the number of women with abdominal adiposity using waist to height ratio has changed? Have sleep health and stress symptoms been affected by the COVID lockdown as compared to one year before? So sample was selected. Uh, the study was conducted on 54 older women in the age group of 50 to 80 years who were participated and given their consent to be a part of this study. All women were from a Gujarati Jain community, so they are all vegetarian. And they were they, the women were approached uh, in September to October 2020 again through online mode to understand their weight to height ratio, activity and stress symptoms. In addition, information was obtained regarding their present diet pattern one year before as well as about their sleep health. Uh, ethics approval was taken uh, for this and then the way uh, in the previous year it was found that weight and height were also measured and the body mass index was calculated this was before the covid uh, so which was very difficult during the lockdown period so here the waist and height circumfer uh, hip circumfer uh, circumferences were measured waist to height ratio was calculated coming to the first parameter anthropometric measurement uh, so due to lockdown, the weight and height could not be measured again as a follow-up, which was taken in 2019. So I will just discuss and brief one month a year from the graph. So this is the percentage of women who are suffering from various non-communicable disease. It was found that about one-fourth has a diabetes followed by hypertension and joint pain. When the distribution of the women, according to the frequency of consumption of the cereal uh, uh, preparation was observed, it was found that due to lockdown, there was a tendency to consume more of the macronutrients, which is a simple carbohydrate and tend to increase the metabolic syndrome, while the percentage of women consuming the millets, which is, and this is a millet here, uh, decrease, which indicates the tendency for consumption of more energy dense food without any physical activity. Uh, coming to this table, the percentage of women consuming pulse preparation, example of the Gujarati cuisines, when you see Dhokla or Dal was lower during the lockdown period. These are all encircled data. When this food frequency was taken on the consumption of these uh, pulses again, maybe the tendency to reduce, it was noted that due to the consumption is low due to the lack of availability and higher cost of these pulses. The third table uh, gives us the idea of the frequency of consumption of some leafy vegetables. It was increased. The data is 2020 and 2019 reflecting an encircled over here. Uh, coming to the next, the vegetable increase, uh, consumption of some vegetable was also seen increased. So for example, cluster beans, and if you see somewhere in the cauliflower, the rates have drastically increased and it shows a significant increase. 
when the consumption of the milk was taken as a dairy product so buffalo milk co consumption was more found in these women as compared to the uh, cow milk and also the percentage and there was a decrease in the uh, percentage women consuming buttermilk or the curd was found to be decreased according to the sir over madam uh according to the frequency of uh, fried snacks and sweets also there were more consumption it was noted coming to the last graph of this so when the bmi weight to height ratio and uh, change in the body weight during the lockdown was seen there was not an increase in this uh, bmi too much whereas weight to height ratio was observed the, this is below and uh, the above 0.5 level which we take as a standard the uh, last ea gives all over affected mentally yes they were affected mentally due to the lockdown pearson chi square test is used in this analysis which is an inferential part of the statistics whether to determine whether these two nominal categorical variables are uh, in association with each other and the test compares that observed frequency of each category with the expected frequency there is no relationship between the two uh, variables so sleep pattern also similar pattern was uh, given it was seen 73.3% of subjects slept for a same duration during the covid lockdown as compared to a year before but there were few percentage who have reported a disrupted sleep coming to the last slide sir uh, when the summary and conclusion the salient features were overweight 20% to obese category 70.5.75.6% point, were noted during the covid lockdown phase uh, energy dense consumption food were also you have seen high in fat and sodium content so the metabolic uh, syndromes has also gone high lower consumption of green leafy vegetables were noted because of the religious belief and energy dense food and increase in the risk of weight gain at a time was also uh, seen excessive visceral fat was noted and which is an indication of having all the diabetic hypertension and the metabolic syndrome uh, option so food groups such as cereals and pulse uh, contributed to the high dietary diversity score whereas green leafy vegetables contributed very little according to this uh, overall study so my final acknowledgement to my mentors who have guided me to take this short term study during this covid phase thank you all thank you thank you madam thank you is there any question from audience next okay i'll come on on the next speaker madam stop your sharing yes yes lakshmi men dr lakshmi menon to present uh, her paper on effect of sleep patterns on uh, uh, dietary habits of young indian adults residing in mumbai city yes sir thank you sir i hope the screen is visible yes yes um, thank you very much for the opportunity uh i'm dr lakshmi menon from the uh, dr b m n college of home science mumbai and uh i'm with the department of clinical nutrition and dietetics and as sir has mentioned this is my uh, topic for the current study uh the aim is basically to find out whether sleep in itself had an effect on the dietary habits of the uh, young adults especially during the covid uh, pandemic the objectives were very clear which was basically to understand what the sleep quality was like in order to understand the dietary habits and hence to compare uh, the sleep patterns as well as the dietary habits of these individuals much of which were working from home during the covid phase and hence there was a change in many of their uh, life dimensions and the quality of life the hypothesis that was set was that sleep patterns have no particular effect on the dietary habits and we went about the study to find out what the cause or effect may be this study was done under the ethical clearance by the seva mandal education society in mumbai and it's a correlational study where the participants were persons residing in mumbai city of the age group of 18 to 25 which is what the world health organization connects as young adults the selection of subjects was by a convenience sampling and both males and females were contacted this was using several social media uh, groups as the access to per people in person was not available the data was collected via a pre um, tested questionnaire link which was circulated through web surveys 
and validated tools have been used to collect the data in order to ensure that the data is comparable to the uh, population that has been selected. The pertinent findings which I would like to share with the August gathering here is that this group uh, was predominantly student-based. Um, they were from the location in and around Mumbai and the various satellite cities. The age group was primarily in the age of the undergraduate and postgraduate students. And a majority that uh, had signed up for the study were female students. The sleep quality using the Pittsburgh Sleep Quality Index was analyzed. And this basically looks at seven components of the quality of sleep. And it is on the basis of this PSQI score that they were divided as adequate sleepers and inadequate sleepers. We know, all know from various um, newspaper reports that sleep was uh, particularly affected due to the varying uh, study schedules and work schedules. And the inadequacy, however, was observed in two main components, which was the sleep latency and the efficiency, both to do with the quality and the time allotted for the sleep. Now, the dietary habits of these individuals were collected using what is known as a food frequency questionnaire. And primarily certain macronutrient energy giving groups were analyzed and certain micronutrient, those which help in the functioning of the regular body were also analyzed. Now, it was seen that adequate and inadequate sleepers had made particularly different choices when it came to sources like carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. And it was mainly seen that more wholesome foods and less processed foods were consumed by the those who got an adequate type of sleep, which meant that it also contributed to, and there have been researches earlier which suggested that uh, the quality of the diet does uh, attribute itself to the type of uh, sleep and vice versa. So this was a study which helped to support those findings. Similarly, inadequate sleepers were those who took more to processed foods and ultra processed foods that were high in carbohydrates and fats. And the quality of protein that each group consumed was better in adequate sleepers than in inadequate sleepers. These are the significant food groups that were identified using the ANOVA testing. Dietary fiber is also another important characteristic to prevent the metabolic syndromes and the cardiovascular diseases that occur. And you can see here that the number of dietary fiber sources that were quoted by the adequate sleepers as being consumed consistently were higher than that of the inadequate sleepers. Iron and vitamin B12, which owe to the blood quality and those uh, dealing with problems like anemia, it is again seen that the quality of foods were better. And overall, you find that the adequate sleepers did make much healthier choices in spite of the lack of availability or access in certain cases, but the choices made were more wholesome. So this is just a summarizing that the carbohydrates and fats consumption, there was a significant difference between the two groups. Fiber consumption specifically for certain food groups like green leafy vegetables and legumes were better. Iron consumption also the sources selected were more na uh, native and were more indigenous. So it was a better quality of diet that was seen. So I would like to conclude that from this particular study during the COVID period and certainly after also the relevance uh, still stays that the prevalence of sleep and the quality of sleep does have a role in the type of diet that each of them consume. And it was seen, however, from this particular study that inadequate sleep and inadequate diets can go hand in hand to cause a very, very poor effect on the health of these young individuals and will have long lasting effects in terms of the uh, public health. Limitation, however, in this is that these were self-reported data owing to the COVID pandemic. Uh, so recalls may have been faulty, but that is why we have used validated uh, questionnaires in order to back up the quality of data that was collected. And the relevance of the outcomes certainly show that this is uh, relevant to the Indian populations even now, uh, owing to different types of lifestyle habits, the sleep is a certain concern. And interventions and preventive strategies do have to come along uh, in addition to the type of lifestyle changes that each individual should bring about in themselves. References that have been used in this particular study, a few of them pertinent have been uh, shown here. Thank you very much for 
the opportunity that was given. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there any question from audience? Madam, I have one question. Yes, sir. So adequate sleep means uh, less than... Seven hours. Seven inadequate hours. is less than seven hours. Well, inadequate is... Inadequate is less than seven hours. hours. Inadequate is greater than seven hours. But in seven yes. hours, is it a continuous requirement of seven hours, a continuous sleep of... Yes, uh, that is why the seven components, sir. Uh, the components suggest that from, from the time that the sleep begins, hmm. that is, it's termed as sleep efficiency... From the time that the individual hits the bed and 30 minutes within, if a sleep has sound sleep has been achieved, then seven hours will be considered as good quality sleep, the hours that follow. However, in between, if you see there are sleep disturbances and there are certain components which suggest that if there is a disturbed sleep, then continuous uh, seven hours, if it is not achieved, that is definitely termed as an inadequate sleep. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. So, I will thank the speaker and our next speaker is Rajesh uh, Taluri and he is speaking on using sensor regression in threshold models for improving clinical decision making. I think he is not there. Okay. The next one is uh, M.A. Kamle. Impact of Plastic ban on daily life in Vita Tarsil. Kamble. She's, I hope she's there. Kamble. Monika Kamble. Okay, she's, I think, busy in the next. Okay. The next one is uh, M.B. Shinde, study of awareness about e-learning in Vita Tarsi. M.B. Shinde. Yeah. She's also. She's also. Shinde, madam. Sorry, sir. No, no presentation. Okay. 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 Thanks. Madam Kamle, Madam is presenting. No. Okay. Uh, no, sir. No. Next. Next one, Sinde. She is not. Next, Akshata Power. Akshata Power. Impact of social media on the educational development of students in Vita Tarsi. Yes, sir. Okay, you start your presentation and keep the time. Okay, you share the your screen. What nice, sir? Your course, no. No. Yes, you are now coached. At this screen. Yes, yes. Oh, good morning, all of you. Good afternoon, all of you. My name is Akshata Madhukar Pawar, TYBAC Department of Statistics, Adarsh College Vita. My research paper name is The Impact of Social Media on the Educational Development of Social Media on the Educational Development of Students in Vita Tehsil. Let's start introduction. Uh, we are going to see if social media is being used a lot among the students, whether it is useful is their educational life or not. Uh, social media is social media is most important in human life and also helps to study. We study how much can social media is important in student life and we also study the good and bad effects of social media. Now see the objectives. 
social media are being used in large quantities in the world today and so we plan to research paper on this topic first one to find out the amount of time spent by students on social media second to study which app more used by student and last to study the effect of social networking sites on the education of students now see the method of data collection we survey vita tahsil area and collect the data we select the convenient sample by the random sampling method we collect the data through the online questionnaire 399 samples are the optimum sample size we collect data from the online method the data of our project is primary because we collect the data by taking online methods from each of students male and female uh, we use statistical tools for graphical representation first bar and second pie chart uh, then see statistical analysis in first question we find out the amount of time spent by students on social media uh, for that question we have used bar graph in bar graph the male and female students spend same times to uh, 20 to 30 hours a week on social media this is the conclusion of our question uh, in second uh, uh, to study which app more used by students uh, for that question we have used pie chart in above pie chart we conclude that the maximum 26% students are using whatsapp now to study the effect of social networking sites on the education of students in that question we in that question we use chi square test for independence of attributes uh, h not a and b are independent of each other against h1 a and b are dependent on each other chi square value uh, calculated chi square value is 0.0182 and tabulated chi square value is 3.8414 uh, then find result calculated chi square value is less than tabulated chi square value hence except h not otherwise reject h1 that is a and b are independent to each other uh, con conclusions are both male and female students spend same times 20 to 30 hours a week on social media most of the 26% students are using whatsapp and last the social networking sites have a have an effect on students education thank you okay. is there any question from audience if not uh, madam how uh, it is optimum 399 is optimum you have said 399 uh, sample is an optimal one why it is 399 why not it is 4450 okay that the online questionnaire okay uh, fill uh, 399 students are fill this form okay but why then you should not say it is optimum okay okay whatever you have got the data you have presented but it is not optimum okay thank you The next presenter is top sharing. Next one is Vikas Pawar, and his uh, topic for presentation is statistical analysis yes. of milk production in rural area of Kautai Mankal Tasi. Vikas, hi, top top sharing. Hi. good morning good afternoon all of you i am vikas pradeep pawar studying just 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 akshata you just leave the meeting sir uh, i am unable to share my screen okay you share no just just a minute uh vikas pawar no yes sir vikas pawar yes now you are able to share i am unable to share my screen sir it is now saying that uh, yes yes now it is now you can try be fast okay okay
Hi. Okay, okay. Start. Start, start. Hi, good afternoon, all of you. I am Vikas Pradeep Pawar, studying in BSc third year at Padam Bhushan Vasantrao Dada Patil Mahavidyalaya Kauti Mangka, District Sangli, Maharashtra. The title of my research paper is Statistical Analysis of Milk Production in Kauti Mangka, Tehsi. Let me start, let start by the saying a few words about my project background. Milk production has been an important part of agricultural scenario for thousands of years. India is not only one of the top producers of milk, milk production in world, but also the largest consumer of milk in the world. Milk production creates lots of employment opportunities. In this article, we studied about milk production using statistical tools. Objectives. The main objectives of our study is to obtaining expected price of healthy cow as well as to study which factors affecting on it, as well as involvement of people by their age and profession. We also study about which breeds are mostly used in milk production. We also investigate between the quantity of milk and animal feed. Methodology. The 340, 340 skip, samples skip was collected. Don't read everyone. Skip, 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 go to your content. Keep this okay. slide. Results. From, from this chart, we conclude that Holstein Francian is most preferred cow and Mura and Maisana are more preferred in Buffalo husbandry. From the next chart, it observes that people in age group 20 to 20 to 30 is most active in animal husbandry. From the from next chart, we conclude that the problem. Proportion of farmer is more. For study, from the chat, we conclude that proportion test to studying people happy with cow and buffalo has been re We use proportion test. From this test, uh, from this test, uh, calculated Z calculated Z is greater than tabulated Z. So we reject H naught and conclude that the proportion of people happy in cow and buffalo husbandry is not same. Chi square test chi square test is used to check dependency between animal feed and milk. From this test, calculated Z is greater than tabulated Z. Therefore, we reject H naught and conclude that quantity of milk and animal feed are dependent on each other. For finding expected price of healthy cow, we use regression model. From this, from this model, we observe that the R square value of R square value is 0.9856. That means the regression equation is fit good. Resultant regression equation for healthy cow is expected price is equal to 516, 516 into lactation month plus 4,797 into quantity of milk plus 5,136 into fat test minus 3,622 into age. Conclusions. In this study, in this research, research we see that people in Kautimanga Tehsil gives more preference to Mura and Maisana for buffaloes and Holstein Frenchian for cow. Younger age groups are more engaged in animal husbandry. In the current situation, people in village are attracted to attracted to the animal husbandry as milk fetches as a good uh, milk fetches a good price. Reference references. Uh, research paper research paper name Introduction to Dairy Farming and um, Fundamental of Statistics book we uh, we used to refer this project. Okay, there is one Thank question. You. Why you have used the proportion test? Proportion test. Uh, proportion test is used to um, proportion between uh, people happy with cow husbandry and people happy with buffalo husbandry. Why you have used the proportion test? Why not the mean test or any other test? Okay. 
Okay. Let me thank the speaker and call the next speaker, Dipali Londe. Statistical analysis, her uh, topic is statistical or paper is statistical analysis of demand of bakery products in Sangli district. Dipali Londe is there? Dipali Londe. Purohit is there, I think. Who is Tanya. going to present? Tanya. Ah, Tanya. Tanya. Okay, okay. Sir, uh, okay, you can present. Good afternoon, everyone. First of all, I'll... First of all, uh, thank you for giving me this precious opportunity. Before presenting my paper, I would like to introduce myself. I am Tanaya Dhananjay Purohit and I am studying in BSc Third Statistic in Padmagushan Vasantrao Dada Patil Mahavidyalay, Kautemakka. We passed. Okay, the title of my research paper is Statistical Analysis of Demand of Bakery Products. First, I will introduce the main topic of my uh, research paper is bakery industry is the one of the major food industries in India and bakery products include food items such as bread, biscuit, cake, etc. And these products are rapidly gaining popularity owing to their pleasant taste and health benefit. As bakery products are fast-moving consumer goods, they are consumed on a daily basis by the consumer and that's why we selected this project. Here are some objectives of our uh, study. Objectives are to, uh, to study consumer behavior towards bakery product, uh, to, to study frequency of purchases of bakery product, and to study which bakery products are most prepared by consumer, etc. And also we study consumer behavior towards healthy and nutrition bakery products. And also study consumer awareness about buying bakery products. Here are some methodology of our project. We studied 228 consumers from Kaute Mankar Tehsil and is collected by convenient sampling method. And the data is collected by filling questionnaires from consumers by the interview method. Uh, method. We, re, we use pi and column diagram to represent various characteristics next, about bakery next, product. Next, next slide. Okay, sir. Here are some results and conclusion of our study. Uh, here we use pi diagram and column diagram uh, and conclude that 76% consumers are believe that bakery products have nutrition value and also easy availability is the reason of increasing demand of bakery product. And also we conclude that biscuits are most preferred a bakery product by consumer and 80.18% 80, 80 consumers are very satisfied from bakery products. We use chi-square test and proportion test to analysis and, the, and from analysis we conclude that the gender is independent on frequency of purchase and also the proportion of male and female likers of bakery products are same. Here are overall conclusion of our study that most of the consu consumer are very satisfied from bakery product and biscuit are the most preferred bakery product by consumer. Most of the consumer believe that bakery product have nutrition value and also according to consumer, the reason of increasing demand of bakery product is easy availability. Most of the consumer are aware about buying bakery product. Quality is uh, criteria should be used to build a good bakery product according to consumer and the gender is independent on frequency of purchases of bakery product. These are the our overall conclusion of our study. Here are some references of our study. We use Wikipedia and Google for reference and also fundamental of statistics by Gupta and Kapoor also uh, refer this book. Thank, Thank you. you so much all the organizers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Let me thank the speaker. And our next speaker is Vikran Desai, the statistical analysis of bike users in Kaute Mankav Tasi. Yes, sir. One is presenting now, Vikran Desai. 
नो सर दिस इज साइरस पाटिल साइरस पाटिल नंबर 3 आई विल बी प्रेजेंटिंग ऑन विक्रांत बिहार ओके साइरस यू आर लॉग यस यस ओके कैन आई स्टार्ट सर या Come on, quick. Okay, sir. Sir, uh, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Uh, here, uh, my project. Uh, uh, I, my name is Sairaj Nagar Patil. I am studying in third year BSc, and uh, I am part of team who is conducting statistical analysis of bike users as uh, their fine as part of their final year project. So, I would like to thank all my fellow students who helped me through this research, and I would like to start. Uh, as we all know that india is a booming economy and india ranks second largest as a consumer and a manufacturer of two wheelers in the world uh, we are doing this study with a motive to keep up with this booming economy of the two wheelers we can see the increase in numbers of two wheeler users in both rural and urban areas uh, in all, our own tehsil totemankal we can also see the increase in number of two wheelers we can also see some electrical vehicles uh, being part of the road traffic in a recent survey done by india's consumer environment also known as ic 360 degree it was shown that uh, every one in third household owns a two wheeler in india which refers to 36% of total indian population owning a two wheeler in this study we studied uh, not only the bike users but also the various problems faced by the bike users we had various objectives uh, in front of us while doing this study the one of the many among those objectives the first objective was to study the correlation or association between the bike users lifestyle and the bikes which they prefer or they use we conducted required tests to find the association between two random variables such as the occupations and the mode of payments they preferred while purchasing the bike we also turned to many uh, tests to find out the association between the daily driving average driving and the health issues faced by the drivers we uh, conducted a survey to found out uh, which rtu rules are need to be followed in order to avoid accidents we uh, use yamnes formula to conclude that 399 is a sample size we need in order to gain sufficient statistics we collected data from five different villages and the city itself we considered each village as a stratum since our data differed over large fractions such as occupation gender form of payments uh, which they preferred we had to use various forms of tables and graphical representations to showcase our data which included line chart pie chart and uh, bar graphs we used chi square test of independence to check the association between two variables such as age and the uh, health issues faced we conducted kruskal wallis test uh, to our non normal data to check whether the monthly expenditure on bike differed from village to village we used uh, software such as excel and r program to get our required outcome results uh, in the given graph you can as you all can see that splendor was the most preferred bike among the main male population and the activa turned out to be the most preferred bike among the female population in the next result as you all can see the expenditure on fuel uh, is larger in the urban area as that of the rural area in villages the expenditure uh, was somewhere about 86.5 rupees and that in the urban area or the city the expenditure was uh, on 92.12 uh, rupees in electrical bikes also the expenditure differed uh, by about 0.5 rupees as it was in 6. as it was 6.15 in rural area and 6.767 in urban area health issues faced by bike users are directly related to their age and daily driving habits we conducted a chi square test and uh, by using excel we found out that the p value 
was uh, very less than that of our level of significance which was set at 0 0.05 and hence we concluded that the uh, bike users who age more than 40 had to face more problems as uh, compared to that of those youngest bike users we also concluded that the bike users who drive more than 50 kilometers had to face more problems than that of those who drive less. We uh, conducted uh, required tests to find out uh, which uh, factors are causing most number of accidents in Gautamangal Tesis. And it turned out that uh, drink and drive and less awareness regarding government RTO rules is the leading causes behind the uh, accidents. Our calculated value of chi square turned out to be less than our tabulated value. And uh, hence, we concluded that uh, drink and drive and less awareness regarding our two rules are the most favorable reasons of ac accidents. As you all can see in the first table, we found out that people working professional jobs and owning businesses are more likely to use helmets as that of uh, students and farmers. We had to use uh, tabular formation, pure table uh, formations using Excel. And we found out that uh, calculated value of chi square is uh, very uh, less than that of our tabulated value. And hence, we had to reject the uh, null hypothesis and accept the alternate hypothesis. Uh, in next table and graph, as you all can see, that uh, people working jobs are more likely to turn to different modes of payment, such as uh, finance companies and bank loans while purchasing their bike, as compared to that. Uh, of the okay. self-financing was done by mostly rural citizens and farmers. We also presented the given data in form of a stack bar graph. While doing this study, we referred to the India's Consumer Survey, also known as IC 360 degree survey, which was published in 2016. It was available on the internet and uh, we found it very helpful. Okay. We referred to a research uh, paper uploaded on internet by Mumbai University professors Pandya and Dr. Kero and Dr. Pandya. The research paper was named Consumers Behavior in Two Wheeler Industry. We also referred to Times of India article okay, published okay, by Shangli Ao Shul, which well. said as two wheeler domestic uh, sales in India from year to. Okay. okay. Is, for from audience? Is there any question from audience? Okay, in your uh, objectives, you are written somewhere correlation between uh, the two and association. When you are using correlation and association, of your sharing, sir, uh, we uh, uh, used the uh, chi square test to find out the association between two random variables. Uh, where the two random variables we choose were the mode of payments and the occupation. Yeah, are the variables or any other thing, so that you have to check. Okay, and the correlation is between variables. Yes, sir. is between attributes. And you have said that calculated value is less than and the tabulated reject. value and reject. And no, reject sorry, sorry, sir. We had sorry. to reject, uh, accept our null hypothesis. Ah, okay. Okay, okay, that is there. Okay. The uh, top your sharing, screen sharing. Next uh, speaker. Thank you very much. Sir. The uh, Dhanasri Bosley. And her topic uh, presentation uh, is on statistical perception towards the online shopping in Kaute Mankal Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, start be quickly and be fast. Quick, quick. Start your screen sharing. One minute, sir. Mostly, you are the co host. Anju Mullah is going to present. Okay, I will make him co host. Okay. Okay, okay.
So you must be ready. That much of time is not there. Don't waste the time for technical adjustment. Sir, myself, Anjum Aulamulla. I'm studying in BSc third statistics in Padmabhushan Vasantrao Dada Patil Mahavidyale Kote Manka. First of all, I would like to thank you to all for, for giving me the opportunity to uh, conduct this uh, presentation. So the title of my presentation is... You wrote it your screen. Mm. Okay. So the, uh, the title of my research paper is The Statistical Perception Towards the Online Shopping. First of all, in introduction, the uh, online shopping, often known as online retailing, is a sort of electronic commerce that allows users to purchase directly from a vendor by using a computer browse or the internet, that means uh, e-shop or e-commerce. We also study which shopping apps, uh, which shopping apps or their shopping behavior of the consumers. We also study which age group as well as gender is, is affecting on mode of shopping. Nowadays, uh, the online shopping is uh, growing day by day. Uh, in in popularity over the year because uh, mainly you people find don't it read you don't read your each and everything just comment and go ahead uh, find it convenient and easy to shop bargain uh, convenient and easy to bargain shop from the comfort of their house and uh, comfort of their house and office so the consumers uh, without going to physical store the easily available uh, things are available in the online shopping. Next in objectives, the main objectives of our research papers are to study the effects of gender and age group on mode of shopping. We also study which shopping apps they, uh, are prepared by them, the statistical perception towards the various uh, products or uh, their shopping behavior or, uh, or the statistical perception towards the mode of payment. We also find it some advantages and disadvantages of the online shopping according to the consumers. Next in methodology, the sample of 200 consumers are collected from a Kautemanka Tulsil by a questionnaire method direct from an interviewer. For the analysis of data, the pie chart and column chart are used, up, are used in this uh, paper. The pie chart and column chart are effective, to, effective in nature because it is gives some, in, un, some information about the uninformed audience. We also check the chi-square test of independence to check the the association between gender and mode of shopping. We also test the proportion in between um, proportion of females in between online and offline shopping is the same or not by equality of proportion test. After the analysis of data, we get the some result. Uh, most of the consumers having age group 15 to 20, 20, 25 shop online. The Flipkart and Misho are, are both the apps are mostly used by the consumers. According to consumers, offline is better than the online. Uh, most of the 80% people uh, prefer online shopping, online shopping methods, uh, pays cash on delivery method. We also test the, we also uh, use the chi-square test to check the, check the association between gender and mode of shopping is dependent or not. In proportion test, we check the uh, proportion of female in, on, in online of shopping the same or not. After the analysis of data, we conclude that the, pro the proportion of female in online and offline shopping is the same. Of, uh, for the analysis of data, we use some reference or reference books such as Fundamental of Statistics, Gupta and Kapoor and the uh, research engine Google for the analysis of data. Thank you. Okay. Is there any question from audience? Okay, thank you. Next, next one, one more is there. Uh, Ragini Chavan. Ragini Chavan. Okay. Yes, sir. Hi. Uh, Ragini Chavan. Yes, sir. I'm there in the meeting. Okay, now you share the screen, and within five minutes, you have to present your paper. Be fast. Okay. Is the screen visible, sir? Yes, yes. Go ahead. Yeah. So, very good afternoon uh, to one and all present. In Do I have 27 day. slides? That much uh, time no, we not... no, no, sir. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm skipping skipping all the uh, not required things. Okay. 
So my title of the paper is some aspects of constructing model in a regression analysis. Uh, it is done by myself and Dr. Om Prakash Adho from the Bama University. Uh, the main uh, purpose of this uh, paper is to uh, find out the impact of COVID-19 on the Indian economy which is tested by using the uh, multiple regression analysis tool. Uh, for that, uh, main eight, uh, com uh, nine components are considered as an independent variable uh, in that GDP is considered, then transport and communication, trade value, uh, trade value, export, manufacturing production, crude oil production units, stock market units, government revenue, and consumer spending unit. Uh, so these... Uh, nine independent factors are considered in this study and uh, uh, since uh, these are many uh, independent factors are considered how to uh, find out the most uh, impactful independent factors so for that uh, in multiple regression we are having a black backward uh, elimination method so that method is implemented in this uh, paper also uh, to test the multicollinearity uh, VIF method, uh, variance inflation factor is also tested. So I'm just skipping all the slides. And this is the sample data. Uh, data is collected from 2013 to 2020. Quarterly data is collected. And this is the uh, output for uh, all, by considering all nine independent variables. So multiple R is coming in this case is 0.94, which is uh, quite large. And uh, this is the regression line, uh, which is fitted for the cons uh, by considering all independent variables. After that, uh, to test the multicollinearity, uh, as I mentioned earlier, that PIF method is implemented. So, in this method, we found out the value which having uh, the independent variable which is having a maximum VI, VIF value that uh, variable is uh, go on deleting in the uh, process. So in the first iteration, we found that transport and communication, this variable is having highest VIF value. Uh, it is highlighted in the another color. So it is 8.0. So that uh, variable is uh, eliminated from the process. After that, next, in the next iteration, we observe that uh, import is having, a, again, a higher VIF value. So that variable is also deleted. So in this way, four iterations we required to get a actual model. So this is iteration two, iteration four. So in that case, we observe all the VIF values are small. So finally, we found the equation by using the VIF method that this equation in that only four independent variables are remaining out of nine variables, okay? After that, now backward elimination method is implemented. In the backward elimination method, we observe the p-value. If the larger p-value is observed for the uh, independent variable, that variable is again omitted in the, from the process. So same procedure is implemented for this. And again, four iterations are required in the first iteration crude oil production, that variable is uh, get deleted. Then in second iteration, uh, import variable is again uh, deleted. Then in the fourth iteration, uh, government revenue, that independent variable is deleted. So finally, at the end, uh, we found these uh, three equations. First equation is uh, for all independent variable by considering all independent variables. And then this is by using the VIF method and another uh, last equation is by using the backward elimination method. So these are the certain references which are used for this. Thank you. Okay, thank you, thank you, ma'am. Okay, uh, is there anyone uh, want to ask any question? Madam, you have got the eight variables and lastly you have eliminated. So is what exactly the procedure to eliminate those variables? Uh, sir, uh, backward elimination method and VIF method. In backward uh, uh, elimination, when we observe larger p-value for that corresponding variable, that variable is uh, going to omit from the process. And in... A, um, VIF method. Yes, sorry. In other method. Hello. How you are eliminating? Sorry, sir. I'm not getting your question. So in elimination method, you are eliminating the uh, variables. 
but in vip method also you have got the uh, elimination no yes sir yes sir so that's why we found out both the equations by using backward elimination and uh, by using the vip method sir okay thank you thank you very much stop your sharing thanks a lot thank you everyone thank All you the presentations are good and one or two are absent or are uh, most of the people have presented their papers the papers are good thank you thank you very much thank you thank you basuri sir for your patience okay your participant is there yes yes can you hear me yes चौहान मैडम स्टॉप योर शेयरिंग चौहान मैडम स्टॉप योर शेयरिंग यस सर आई ऑलरेडी स्टॉप माई शेयरिंग यू स्कीप इट गेट युअर लुकिंग एनी वे मीन आई आई एम थैंकफुल टू and conducting his session successfully uh, now we are moving to third technical series that is in series uh a chair for this session is uh, principal dr mk patil sir from padma bhushan vasant dada patil mahavidyalaya kotemanka a uh, brief introduction is uh, he is uh, a uh, student of shivaji university graduate post graduate doctorate uh, he done his uh, phd under the guidance of uh, honorable uh, vice chancellor dr dt shetke sir uh, he has many publications and uh, at present he is working as a in charge principal also at uh, uh, pvp kote manta uh, mahavidyalaya kote manta so with this brief introduction i Uh, give him charge to conduct his uh, last uh, technical session welcome sir uh, okay uh, thank you uh, i am audible yes. yes 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 you are audible okay thank you this is a technical session three so we are running half an hour late so try to complete uh, your presentation before 5 minutes so first presentation is arguing millets an exploratory study of awareness and perception of millets so already you know aware that 2023 year is year of millets so on that paper is there so who is going to present jagruti madi yes uh, good afternoon everyone myself jagruti and i'm going to present this paper regarding international year of millets So I'll be sharing the screen. madam be fast yes sir just technically prepare before your call
Yeah, pardon, sir. So the title of the paper I'm going to present about is Reviving Millet, an Exploratory Study on Awareness and Perception of Millet. So this paper would be presented by me, the initial part, and from result and conclusion part, be presented by Manish, my coordinator. So next, in this paper, we talk about millet being basic Indian diet. So this title, this paper was being presented with the aim of celebrating international millet year as such. So while celebrating, this survey was being conducted based on the idea of awareness of millet and on the awareness regarding international millet year to be 2023. Further, when we discuss about it, we need to know one thing is millets are basic Indian everyday, everyday diet. We have been practicing this since ages. We have our tradition from since many years and it has been given out as a beneficial outcome. Various aspects are being covered under millet, nutrition, that diseases, consumption, cultivation, and awareness. These aspects were taken into consideration while collecting data. Also, millets have their significance in various diseases, such as CDB, which are cardiovascular diseases, obesity, and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, that is NAFLD. Along with that, diseases such as hyperlipidemia, diabetes type 2, were also having some type of contribution or relationship with millet. Millets also are superior to cereals in terms of climate change resilience, them being nutri cereals, they are gluten free, they have low glycemic index, that is, their rate for carbohydrates is very low, which also establishes a relationship between diabetes being cured regarding millet. Also, we, they are highly resident, highly fibrous in content. We also have their tradition in terms of nachini, bhakri, rajgira, ladu. We have been preparing from since ages. So no food has a nutritional level as millet. Further, we talk about questionnaire and objective we take into consideration. The questionnaire consists of aspects such as gender, qualification, occupation, recognition of millet and millet year, awareness regarding millet, production, consumption, cultivation, inflammation print in millet, role of millet in lifestyle, nutritional properties, and its entrepreneurship opportunity. The objectives behind carrying out this whole questionnaire is to understand the socio-economic status of respondents, to analyze the reason for the usage of millet, to examine the degree of knowledge of respondents, and to analyze awareness and purchase of millet. Further, we talk about material and methodology. So material was collected in two categories as sample collection and data collection. Sample collection, in that term, we, we got of kinds of people in Mumbai region, gender and occupation, and analyze various factors. And this was taken into consideration with an approach of knowledge, attitude, and practice. Then, in terms of data collection, we used the format of Google Form Questionnaire, which consisted of both subjective and MCQ type questions. In this questionnaire, again, we have military significance, gender occupation, production consumption cultivation, kinds of millet, application, and its role in lifestyle, recognition of millet, and nutritional properties. In methodology, we further go for there here is a flowchart regarding in what terms we conducted methodology. So in that, first, we prepared a questionnaire and we aim for a target with the aid of structured questionnaire. This questionnaire was developed, keeping in mind information collected, which needs to be there in order to understand what the awareness of millet are. The basis of questionnaire was knowledge, aptitude, and precision regarding it, and practice to be conducted, assessing diet and nutrition of respondents. Further, this study was conducted among people of New Mumbai. All questions designed were to gather data ranging use of millet in household to the awareness and knowledge about it in the society. Survey was conducted with the help of questionnaires under the guidance of Ram Ria College professors. Data validation was performed at regular intervals. Circulation was done for 30 days, plus or minus four days, which we took for it in the month of November, 2022. Collected data was fed in Microsoft Excel and R software. 
Now further, I give I give the chance to present Manish the further part of the presentation. Thank you. Good afternoon, all. Um, so now we move on to result part. So this year being millet year, we compose our first question based upon that. So from that we understand seventy seven point seven eight percent are aware that this year was a millet year, while twelve point nine nine six percent people said that twenty twenty four was millet year. Second question was composed of, on the basis of gender on male and female. So we gathered that seventy four point zero seven percent female and twenty four point zero seven percent male were believe that. Uh, they that they, they are aware of the millet and the pulses that we all know about. Third question was mostly dependent upon the um, uh, millet types and variety. So from that, eighty one point forty eight percent of the participants uh, reported that they know that the uh, millet zawar is a millet, while one point eight five percent people could not recognize that mil uh, zawar is not a millet. Uh, then we move on to the consumption pattern of millet. So from this we know that twenty seven point eight percent people and forty four point forty four point four four percent twenty four point zero seven percent for ragi uh, were consumed by people on a weekly basis, while uh, wheat was consumed on a weekly basis, and bajra was sixty six point sixty six point six seven percent, and zawar being fifty percent, which which is being least consumed while taking on daily basis into consideration what uh, into consideration wheat. Is consuming the most amount than millets. Then there's a graph you, you can see with consumption and culti uh, cultivation of millets. Um, in this, you can see that zawar is cultivated uh, like thirty-five point seven percent, twenty-five percent, and forty point three percent of bajra, zawar, and ragi respectively. In a similar way, for areas where ba bajra is being cultivated, twenty-one point four percent of bajra and eight point point eight point three percent zawar is being consumed. For the ragi cultivation areas, 100 percent of wheat has been consumed, 14.3 percent of bajra, and 8.3 percent of zawar, and 35.7 percent of ragi has been consumed. Then we move on to effect on inflation. From here we gather, uh, started to gather a p-value, and the hypothesis was based upon that at zero, which is uh, people who feel that there's an inflation uh, which affects it, affects the millet, is more than 0.5, is is 0.5, and H1 of people who feel that in there's an inflation. Affects the millet, uh, which is more than 0.5. From this, we uh, to, from the total participants, 79.63 percent of them agreed with the fact that there is an effect in the inflation of millet production, while 20.37 percent of them disagreed with that. The p-value we gathered of this was 0.7962963. Then we move on to the millets with, uh, and disease prevention crop. The hypothesis remains the same for all the uh, For uh, 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 all the coming graphs and pie charts, in this come to the conclusion. When this time is over, so, so can can we conclude it in the like conclusion? Yes. Directly come to conclusion. In conclusion, like if you go through all our slides, we can see like it has been observed that among all the types of millet. Zawar and bajra only consist of 73% of the consumption, and rest is con combined. There's a need to formally study about consumers' knowledge, which is KAP, the consumers' knowledge, attitude, and practice. Majority of the people prefer the commonly cultivated of millets of their respective area of their con consumption, while uh, one, while on the other side of the coin, on an average of one fifth of the population people uh, fail to identify the millet type, mainly ragi. So, for future recommendation of perspectives, we only select. A statistical model model can be done on the basis of domain knowledge using climate condition and data collected from websites is to understand the reason of less production of millet can be derived from it. Crop improvements and development of seeds needs to be done. As we can, uh, there was this uh, conference on ICM where millet man came as millet millet man came and said like the uh, seeds of millets are dying. Like we don't have seeds to you know cultivate millets. So proper conservation and improvement, uh, bio fortification of the seeds needs to be done, and basic information related to awareness of millets and its application should be taught in schools. With the help of this primary data, which uh, we make, we can make an effort in de decreasing the gap between uh, supply and demand chain. 
mid day meals should be more prominent in schools vending machines should be provided and of course transport cost increases during supply which has to be reduced being self uh, sufficient sop sh should be signed regarding on uses of millet and ensure its application thank you okay, okay. thank you thank you very much thank you so is there any question from our hands up your screen sharing if there is no question the second yes sir. next doctor is the department of adults Patel sir, your sound is not audible. Yes, yeah, sir, you are not audible. Next one is Neeta Patel. Neeta Patel, okay. Is there Neeta Patel? Okay, then next, Pooja Kadam. Is there Pooja Kadam? Hello. Yes, sir. Uh, Pooja Kadam. No, you are not adequate, Patil sir. Your sound is echo. Pooja, from which uh, name you are joined? Sir, Prajul Patil. Ah. No. Okay, now you, you can share the screen. Okay, sir. Hello, Pooja uh, Prajwal Party. Okay, Prajwal. Good afternoon to all. First of all, I want to thank you for giving me such a beautiful opportunity. I am Prajwal Shivaji Patil, studying, studying in uh, TYBS Statistics in PVP Mahavidyalaya, Kaute Mangal. Intra okay, sir. Hello. Different varieties or brands of the cosmetical products are available in the market. Customers prefer the varieties of high quality, low price and attractive cover. Most of the customers are satisfied with the quality products and some customers prefer other factors. In this context, we studied, we studied consumers' perception towards Himalaya products. In this study, we studied which factors affect the customer satisfaction level towards Himalaya products. Himalaya is a multinational Indian multinational personal care and pharmaceutical company based in the Bangalore. Objectives. The main objectives of the study are to know about the consumer's preference and awareness towards Himalaya products. Also, to study the level of satisfaction towards Himalaya products and the reasons for selecting particular brand. We also find socio-economic factors such as education, gender, income, profession, etc. affecting the customer's trend towards Himalaya products. Methodology. Sample of 242 consumers from Kautimaka Tessil, including rural and urban area, is collected by questionnaire method. The data is, collected by, is presented by five and multiple bar diagrams to compare the factors affecting on the consumer's trend towards Himalaya products. From, the, from these pie charts, we can see that most of the users belong to 20 to 30 age group and most of the users are unmarried. From these graphs, most we can say that most of the respondents using Himalaya products because products better quality, easy availability, and is suitability for the health. And from the second graph, we can say that most of the users are satisfied with the product. We used a chi-square test for independence of attrib attributes to check the association between area of respondents such as rural or urban and use of Himalaya products. And at last, we concluded that we reject H0. There is enough evidence to support the claim that use of Himalaya products is associated with the area of respondents. We also used a two-sample proportion test to determine whether the females use Himalaya products more than males or not, and concluded that there is enough evidence to support the claim that Himalaya products are used more by females than males. Overall conclusions. After analysis, we conclude that 
most of the respondents use himalaya products because of products products better quality easy availability and its suitability for the health most of the users belong belongs to 20 to 30 age group most of the users are unmarried and graduates most of the users are satisfied with the products the area of respondents and use of himalaya products are associated with each other don't read each and everything go ahead okay. Okay, sir. And the last conclusion is Himalaya products are used more by females than males. They, these are some references we used for our study. Okay, thank you. Okay. Kore, sir, I am audible now? Yes, yes. Yes, sir. Okay, any question? If there is Next no problem. question. Next. Next present is bank loan status prediction using different machine learning technique. Digambaru. Am I audible, sir? Ah, yes. Yes, yes. Uh, is screen visible? Yes, yes, yes. You continue. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I am Digambaru Fade under the guidance of Dr. A. A. Mule. Uh, I, my, I am presenting this paper. Uh, title of my paper is Bank Loans Status Prediction Using Different Machine Learning Techniques. Uh, thank you for organizers for giving me opportunity to present my uh, paper here. Content of uh, this paper is first is introduction, then methodology, then results and discussion. After that conclusion, and last one is references. Uh, when uh, we go to any bank uh, for the loan, so <clears throat> bank uh, manager asks uh, us some questions uh, whether we are eligible to give loan or not. For that, they ask the question like, uh, what is your monthly salary? Or uh, you have the government job or private job? So these type of questions, they are primary questions they ask. The slides uh, are not moving. Yes. Your slides are not Moving. Only first slide is there. Okay, continue. Continue. Uh, okay, now. Right now? Yes. yes, yes. Okay. Is second slide visible? Yes, okay. yes. It's visible. Yes. Okay, uh, so this is the introduction. Means we are interested to whether uh, predict whether is, is there any machine learning techniques? According to that, bank will uh, choose the deserving right applicant who is eligible for the loan. So uh, to find better classification techniques, we compare the different uh, classification techniques. Uh, methodology, we first we do the data pre-processing. So data we collected from the Kaggle website. There are 67 1460 observations and 35 features are available there. Uh, first, we drop the features like uh, ID, payment of the plan, which don't have any use to predict whether uh, the person is eligible or not. So we selected a total 33, 33 features. In that, 20 are discrete variable and 30, uh, 13 are the categorical variable. Uh, we use the different classification techniques here. First is logistic regression. Uh, we know uh, this, this is the most popular uh, learning algorithm and it is a supervised learning. Here the data, for that data is labeled data and the output for this logistic regression is a yes, no type, means zero or one type. Second one is a decision tree. Uh, it gives the tree-like structure and uh, because of it looks like a tree, it starts with the root node and uh, expand for, for further branches and construct tree-like structure. Then uh, next one is random forest. Uh, it is based on the concept of assemble learning, which is process of combining multiple classifier to solve a complex problem. It contains number of decision trees on the various subsets of the given data set and takes average to improve the predictive value. Then we use the K nearest neighbor classifier, uh, which uh, which is assumes the similarity between new case and available cases. 
and this is the non parametric algorithm and uh, for cl classification and regression we use this k nearest neighbor classifier last we use the navy base classifier it is based on bayes theorem and it is a probabilistic classifier and performance measures we use for the first one is accuracy it defines how often the model predicts the uh, correct output but only accuracy is not important we uh, study the precision recall and f1 score because sometimes accuracy is more but precision and recall are very less and uh, according to that we study this uh, tools also precision precision it can define the number of correct output provided by the model or output positive classes that have predicted correctly by the model and recall means uh, the output total output positive classes how our model predict correctly and f1 score is the uh, harmonic mean of precision and recall so these are the tools we are using then we uh, uh, these are the important features out of 33 features we got this uh, uh, six features are the important uh, we got funded amount investor loan amount or interest okay, so try to summarize okay. that okay uh, then we use the different uh, classification techniques like logistic regression so if you see here accuracy we got 91 but precision and recall are the zero so this logistic regression is not suitable for the uh, this bank loan data we got decision tree and random forest the values are near about one means uh, uh, precision and recall also uh, have the value near about one and k nearest neighbor and navy base classifier these also give the accuracy more but the precision and recall values are very less so my conclusion here overall conclusion first i uh, write here the these are the important features we got then logistic regression is the most suitable uh, logistic regression is not suitable for the uh, this blank bank loan data and decision tree and random forest are the important are the give the higher accuracy as compared to other classifiers so these are the references we use thank you thank you for giving me opportunity to present my research thank you sir okay, okay. thank you okay any question from audience if it is not next is. Oh. Ah, yes cg gardi sir control chart for uh, process variation based on downturn estimator uh, digambar sir please stop your sharing not getting option to stop is my screen visible yes okay good evening sir I am Chandrakar Jardi and I will be presenting my work entitled Control Chart for Process Variation Based on Downtown Estimator. This Just a minute. Right. Just a minute, Jardi, sir. Yes. Previous one is, uh, yes, now. Yes, sir. What's okay. okay. Uh, so, this is my joint work along with Professor Vikas Bhutte, sir, from Puneshlo Kajla Dev Hulkar, Solapur University, Solapur. So all the manufacturing and service processes always need a constant follow-up to check whether the process is in statistical control or not. By statistical control, we mean that process is acting only under the influence of chance causes because those are the causes that we cannot eliminate. So we have to accept those causes. And whenever only those causes are present, we say that process is in statistical control. Or if, if there are any assignable causes present in the system, then we say that process is out of control. So how to verify whether the process is being influenced by chance causes alone or whether, whether there are assignable causes present into the system. So in order to answer this particular question, Shiard proposed control charts, the idea of control chart. So in the construction of Shiard type control charts, certain thresholds are set and the process is declared to be in control as long as those uh, charting statistics are within the threshold limit. So as soon as any charting statistics falls beyond these limits, process is declared to be out of control. So this was just a pioneering attempt in order to have a uh, controlling over the system, whether in order to know whether the process is in statistical control or not. So several researchers have made certain amendments to improve performance of these control charts. Whenever we want to improve performance of any control chart, these three things has to be given consideration. The first one is charting statistics, then subgroup selection and out of control tracking. For charting statistics, it simply means that suppose if we want to monitor process dispersion 
then instead of range instead of using range as a charting statistics we can go for the standard deviation because the standard deviation is having more stability with respect to uh, as compared to range therefore just by changing the charting statistics we can improve the performance of the control chart the second thing is subgroup selection the way in which we are selecting the subgroups that also matters because as we know uh, simple random sampling that is that gives more fluctuating results in order to have more stable uh, subgroup selection method we can go for systematic sampling or one can go for the recently developed uh, rank set sampling schema then the third one is out of control strategy the way in which we are declaring process to be out of control that also matters the sure type control chart is the uh, plain strategy where we are having certain limits and process will be declared out of control as soon as charting statistics falls beyond it but it has certain drawbacks and therefore different uh, attempts have been made such as pwma to some charts are there which are uh, revised out of control strategy we are having revised out of control strategy one such strategy is uh, synthetic chart uh, another one is group trans control chart also. so so uh, the strategy the sampling scheme that we have used in this research is rank set sampling scheme rank set sampling scheme was proposed by mcintyre in 1952 so what what happens whenever we are going to have a rank set sampling scheme so suppose we want to have a sample of size n so basically what we will uh, will have is we will take n units Uh, n uh, groups from the population each of size n so we will have n square sampling units these units will not be measured with respect to the underlying characteristic simply by visual observation just by visual inspection we will have some arrangement we will have, have ascending order of these observations so here we are not noting down the observation we are not measuring the variable just by visual inspection or by uh, use of some auxiliary variable we will rank these observations once these observations are ranked then the first unit is the first sample that will be taken second group the second observation in the second group uh, second uh, unit in the second uh, sub group will be taken and n uh, unit in the last group will be taken and then these units will be realized we will take realization of the characteristic only on these units we will not measure characteristic on each n square units we will have only n readings so we, uh, by doing this we are making sure that we are having a proper representative sample of the process so uh, here instead of having a uh, sub group from this dotted distribution we are having a uh, realization or we are having a sample uh, the first unit in the sample that will be a realization of distribution from x bracketed one first order statistic we will have second unit from this second distribution x bracketed two and the last observation will be from the nth order statistic so in short it is just a stratification of the distribution and we are making sure that we are taking one unit from each strata the statistics that we have used is these statistics So down the uh, downtown has proposed these particular statistics. As we can see, this is just a weighted sum of ordered statistics. So whatever sample we are having, we are having ordering of that. We will take ordered statistics from the subgroup, and then by assigning certain weightages, we are taking this D as a statistics. And this D statistics, whenever the process is normally distributed, is it is found to be unbiased estimator of process standard deviation sigma. So instead of uh, just we can go for D uh, uh, for the control chart for monitoring process dispersion. Uh, these are the uh, regular setups for the uh, control charts this is the probability of detecting shift uh, shift suppose there is shift of magnitude delta then the probability that it will be detected this probability is given like this and as we know that in control arl is simply reciprocal of this uh, detecting probability the so arl will be 1 upon 1 minus f at k plus upon delta based on this b statistics we have constructed synthetic d chart using rank set sampling scheme synthetic chart is a uh, combination of sure type chart and confirming regression chart that is crl chart the subgroup selection method that we have adopted is a rank set sampling scheme and whatever results we have obtained those results are compared with the that of rajman and gute they have developed a d chart based on simple random sampling scheme we have proposed synthetic d chart based on rank set sampling scheme so results are quite promising we have uh, made one more amendment also uh, the regular approach in synthetic chart is like this if the charting statistics is greater than k sigma then subgroup is identified as non confirming so we are not declaring process to be out of control we are just marking that particular subgroup as a non confirming and you, this process will be continued and whenever the non confirming whenever the confirming run length that is the uh, length between two uh, non confirming subgroup samples whenever that length is less than n only then we are going to declare process to be out of control So just one amendment is there in this particular synthetic approach, and we will form a group run control chart. So it is not, always not advisable that based on one subgroup we take the decision. So we will wait for another decision whether the process uh, gives another signal that it is going out of control. Only then we will declare process to be out of control. 
So the first thing is uh, similar as that of synthetic day chart. If the charting statistics is greater than k sigma, so group will be identified as non-confirming. But whenever that uh, confirming run rate goes below n, instead of declaring process to be out of control, we will wait for the another signal. So if successive two confirming run rates are less than n, only then process will be declared to be out of control. So it is just like a runs rule, uh, two out of two runs rule applied to the synthetic uh, strategy. Therefore, it is called to be group run control chart. So these are the results that we have obtained. This was the synthetic SRS D chart proposed by Gutierrez and Rajmanya. For this particular chart, we have applied rank set sampling scheme and we have got these results. As we can say that, as we can see, for different uh, sizes of shifts, the synthetic RSS D chart is uh, showing smaller ARNs as compared to synthetic SRS. Uh, in addition, we have applied uh, group run strategy and results are uh, better than the synthetic RSS D chart also. And this GR, uh, GR chart uh, with SRS that has been uh, improved by the application of rank set sampling scheme. So this is the GR chart with rank set sampling scheme and that, uh, this one uh, performs better than all these three control charts. Therefore, as we can see that synthetic, uh, in uh, comparison with synthetic SRS D chart, synthetic RSS D chart uh, uh, is uh, performing better. GRSRSD further improves the uh, efficiency and GRRSSD by application this sampling scheme, the uh, performance is further improved. These are the results for obtained when subgroup sample is, subgroup size is 5. So these are the results. Into the conclusion. Yeah. 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 concluded. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, these are the results when we have uh, subgroup sample as A. So uh, this uh, GR strategy as well as rack set sampling scheme, this improves the uh, performance of the control chart. That those are the conclusions. These are the references. I thank organizers as well as chairperson for giving me opportunity to present my work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Tukaram Navgare. Speech yes, recognition yes, using yes, deep learning technique. So can I share? Uh, yes, sir. Which name your my PC? Yes, yes. Yes, sir. Uh, is my screen visible, sir? Yeah. 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 Okay. We passed. Good evening, everyone. Uh, myself, Tukaram Naugare, uh, from Swami Raman Tirthi University, uh, Maratara University in Nandet. I am doing PhD under the guidance of uh, Dr. V. A. Jadav, sir, and co-guide Dr. Aniket A. Mune, sir. <coughs> uh, first, I, I would like to thank you, say thank you, sir. Uh, give me a okay. uh, give me an opportunity <clears throat> to present my paper in this conference. Uh, my paper title is Speech Recognition Using Deep Learning Technique. So nowadays, this is contained uh, introduction, aim and objectives, methodology, result and discussion, conclusion. <clears throat> nowadays, this is introduction. Uh, the in each and every field, the vice is uh, very important. Like this, uh, suppose when we call someone, so the our vice is records. Okay, and uh, <clears throat> I work on this uh, vice recognition. So uh, the process of converting speech signal into the text. So it is uh, one of the concept. It is called automatic speech recognition. That is called ASR. And this ASR is a, a diff, uh, has many uh, applications like uh, <clears throat> voice detection, uh, informating system, voice command, and speech to piece recognition. So I I use some uh, deep learning technique uh, like <clears throat> or some model, uh, Mark, hidden Marco model that is called HMM in this paper, uh, short form. And uh, another is machine learning based method such as uh, artificial neural network are the most one of them. So uh, the, one of the problem is that uh, to exist it, uh, in this paper, it increase the accuracy and efficiency of the this system. Uh, deep learning which introduced in recent years <coughs> has been widely used to address this problem. 
so i use uh, the another some techniques uh, like uh, long short term memory uh, by directionally long term uh, long short term memory uh, in rnn and uh, sir 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 fast so next is hello sir time is running okay oh, fast so my uh, aim and objective to recognize of voice of different age and uh, age group and different people category using this algorithm so in this uh, this in this <coughs> experiment i use uh, the data the name of the, the, i use second uh, secondary data so the name of data is first that data set so in this data set uh, 6000 uh, it 80% audio signal and uh, the divide this 80, uh, audio signal in containing 386 sentences and 3 uh, 3000 sorry 304 percent speaker in this and the uh, languages are for this biology these are the languages okay in this now uh, <clears throat> my proposed methodology is that to extract the in first step to extract the features uh, using that is mfcc that is called male frequency uh, castral coefficients in the second step i <clears throat> Uh, use uh, extracting features using deep blue network and in third step this is a uh, my uh, proposed algorithm okay so these are the some <coughs> this is my algorithm that is dbn dbl stem and uh, this is acoustic model like this mcc mcc okay and this this is the comparison that is hmm lstm lstm blstm curl dnn okay these are the some uh, Uh, model that uh, these are some uh, deep learning technique that i use in this work so <clears throat> this uh, work uh, or this data analyst uh, using python so some library uh, or some packages are scalar os pandas numpy copy matplotlib pi pyplot etc these are the some uh, library i use in this uh, and uh, in this analysis so these are the some results okay and lstm and this is the blstm so the, we compare this one so now in the co conclusion so among this uh, different uh, net models so hmm model is uh, giving us 80 percent 81% 88.1% uh <clears throat> and curl dnn by 3.1 uh, percent so uh, our aim is to that the the to extract feature and its signal each signal is converted to uh, higher ms to lower ms so in this paper we convert the signal 60 ms frame to overlap the 8 ms uh, yes so this is conclusion so these are the reference thank you thank you thank you very much is any question from audience if it is not the next presenter is sm momin inventory policy with stock dependent demand momin madam momin madam is there Momin, madam. If she is not present, she is there. Momin, madam, can you hear me? She joined, but not. Okay. Next. Momin, Next, madam. Uh, last call. She is not there. Okay, we'll take next. Okay. Next presenter. His title is "Ranking of Test Cricket Players Using Principal Component Analysis and Weighted Average Method." A P Mani. Sir, the screen is visualized properly. Yeah. Yeah.
गुड इवनिंग ऑल ऑफ यू टूडे आर आई एम गोइंग टू प्रेजेंट माई रिसर्च पेपर इन ऑनलाइन इंटरनेशनल कॉन्फ्रेंस ऑन रिसेंट एडवांस इन एप्लाइड स्टेटिस्टिक्स आई एम अर्जुन प्रकाश माने सतारा वैस एस डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ स्टेटिस्टिक्स दिस इज द माई टाइटल ऑफ रिसर्च पेपर इट इज रैंकिंग ऑफ टेस्ट क्रिएट प्लेयर यूजिंग प्रिंसिपल कंपोनेंट एनालिसिस एंड वेटेड एवरेज मेथड दिस इज द माई प्लान ऑफ प्रेजेंटेशन Uh, nowadays we know that cricket is most popular game in the world but measuring the individual performance of the player it is a very difficult task for the uh, team selection members and uh, we know that uh, individual uh, individual performance of the any player it is directly impacted on the result of the match and it is directly impacted on the uh, profit of the country profit of individual profit also and uh, profit of team okay and uh, also we know that uh, uh, icc that is international cricket council do not have any uh, quantify measure to measure the individual performance of the player uh, that's why here I, here i am using principal component analysis and weighted average method and to get a uh, principal weighted average model which is a uh, uh, more efficient for the ranking this is my uh, literature review this is the uh, principal component model what is the principal component model principal component model it is a technique of multivariate analysis and basically principal component analysis uh, which is commonly used for dimensional reduction and uh, data simplification data interpretation etc these are uh, uh, some steps to build a principal component model first one is a uh, uh, standardization second one is to compute the correlation matrix third one is uh, to compute eigen values and uh, eigen vectors and th fourth one is create a feature vector to decide which principal component keep in the analysis to build the model and then ranking this is the weighted average method uh, data is collected from uh, uh, stats.espn crickinfo.com and data is uh, uh, collected from december 1877 to uh, 1929 uh, uh, these are some uh, batting attributes that is uh, such as uh, total matches total run total innings highest score etc uh, this is the standardization which is a uh, first step of principal component analysis this is the uh, second step of principal component analysis that is correlation analysis by using heat map uh, heat map shows the strong correlation strong correlation uh, uh, between the runs and 50s runs and 100s average and 100s inning and 50s and not all run matches and also it uh, indicate that uh, the negative relationship between average and ducks here we can see that in this table first uh, column uh, represent the eigen value second uh, column represent the Variation explained explained by the each principal component, and third one is cumulative variation. Here we can see that script plot. Uh, by using by using script plot, we can uh, take uh, how uh, we get the idea about the how uh, which uh, how many principal component taking into the analysis. From the from this heat map, uh, uh, we consider first uh, three principal component in the analysis, and uh, first uh, three principal component explain near about. 90% variation about the data set here we can see that uh, see that this these are first three principal components and corresponding uh, their features uh, this is the yellow one uh, yellow one uh, this is the yellow one pre first principal component model which explain near about 60% variation about the data set and yellow two also uh, second principal component model which explain near about 20% variation about the data set and yellow three also uh, third pca third pca model Which explain near about seven percent variation about the data set. This is the weighted average method. Uh, weighted average method uh, uses uh, uses for the combining the first three principal component model and uh, to improve uh, efficiency or variation about the data set. And uh, here we can see that uh, principal weighted average uh, uh, model explain near about ninety percent variation about the data set, and it is very efficient for the ranking. and uh, in the previous slide we can see that uh, near about uh, mostly uh, element in the uh, first uh, three principal component are uh, negative uh, that's why uh, our model uh, indicate the negative value of the pw model indicate that the better performance of a, a batsman and negative value uh, sorry positive value indicate that the uh, weak performance of the batsman from this pw model we can uh, we can conclude that the sachin tendulkar was uh, best uh, batsman forever and another indian uh, uh, ranked at sixth number uh, that is uh, he is a rahul dravid this is the my result and conclusion these are some references thank you
Okay, any question from audience? Okay, next, and it is the estimation for blood pressure of undergraduate students based on root transformation implication for hypertension prevention. FS Jamadar. Jamadar is there. FS Jamada from Sangli. I think he's not there. Next. Okay. Next. Latika Shinde. Non parametric test. Hello. Comparing. Ah. Ha, yes, sir. Sorry, you are ready. Ha, yes, sir. Its title is Non parametric test for comparing mean functions of multiple functional samples. Okay. Latika Shinde. Okay, thank you, sir. E screen visible? Yes, yes. Yeah, okay, Bye. thank you. Uh, good afternoon, all of you. I am Ms. Latika Shinde, uh, working as assistant professor in Department of Statistics, Professor Dr. N.D. Patil Mahavidyalay Malkapur. I will be presenting my research work on the topic, non-parametric test for comparing mean functions of multiple functional samples. Uh, this is the outline of my talk. Firstly, with the advances of modern technology, more and more data are being recorded continuously during a time interval or intermediately at a several discrete time points. Here in a graph, we are having a height of a boy which is measured at 31 time points between the age 1 to 18. So uh, now treating it as a, instead of treating it as a 31 variate, 31 variate observation, we smooth it and treat it as a function. Now, like this, we are having a n functions, uh, n functions or say n curve, this constitute our data and it is denoted by xi of t. So now we are having xi of t with n functions on an interval i where we only observe values of these functions at a predetermined time points. Functional data analysis deals with the analysis and theory, uh, theory of a data that are in the form of functions or say curves so our problem is let us suppose we are having xi be the iid samples of ni real valued functions defined on an interval i with mean function mu i of t then we are interested in testing whether the uh, whether the all populations have the identical mean function mean function or not uh, these are the some existing tests which are available in the literature for two samples as well as for more than two samples as uh, for more than two samples as well. Out of which we are we are going to use uh, ANOVA test uh, proposed by Kovas uh, for our uh, comparison purpose to uh, compare our uh, or our our test to uh, his test. Notion of data type for multivariate data. Let F be a probability distribution in the p-dimensional Euclidean space and script X be a random sample from F. Then depth of the point X measures how deep or how central the point X is with respect to distribution F or say data cloud X. So larger is the depth, deeper is the point with respect to distribution or say data depth. Recently, notion of data depth for multivariate data has been extended to functional data also. So instead of uh, multivariate observation now we are having a collection of real functions the say xi of t uh, f with the collection of all real uh, functions defined on interval i so depth of a function x of t with respect to f majors how deep or how central the function x of t with respect to skip depth that is collection of real functions uh, so depth of these functions can be measured using various suitable depth functions some commonly used depth functions are freeman's muniz depth function h model depth function Function, random projection depth, uh, depth function, band depth, and modified band depth also. So due to a time constraint, I'm just keeping these uh, introduction of the all uh, functional depth functions. Uh, this is our proposed test. We are uh, we are here extending the test proposed by Power and Shirke for multivariate multi-sample location problem to our functional data. So now here we are having XI, which is a IID samples of NI real valued function defined on, on interval I, and PI is the common probability law function. So script X is the uh, pool, our pooled sample, that is collection of all XIs together, uh, collected together, and PL of had 
denotes the empirical distribution of L sample. Then uh, capital D i j denotes the depth of function, uh, depth of function or depth of curve x i j with respect to sample x l. So uh, our observation is if we are having k different population and these uh, population have the same mean function, then capital D one, D two, and uh, D k are approximately equal uh, for all observation in the pool sample. But if they are having a different mean function, then there will be uh, there will be a variation in these values. So the variation in these values can be indicated as an unequal mean function. So uh, we, uh, let us suppose we are having small t1 that is a range that is uh, it is another form uh, or another tool uh, for measuring variation in d1, d2 up to dk. So range standard deviation and mean absolute deviation we calculated it by uh, using uh, d1, d2 and d3. So if k population have the same mean functions then the values of these small di's uh, will be smaller and if mean function is uh, not equal then the these values are larger. So our pro proposed test statistics are average of these things. It means average of D1, uh, D1, average of D2, average of D3 are these uh, three test statistics and the maximum of D1, small D1, maximum of uh, small D2 and maximum of small D3. These are again uh, another our test statistics. So we are having T1, T2 up to T6, that is six uh, test statistics. And here we are rejecting null hypothesis for the larger value of test statistic. Uh, this is our simulation study. For the simulation study, we are considered the k, uh, k equal to three samples. In the samples, uh, we are considered three models. First one is the Gaussian model with a uh, with three uh, three uh, means mu, mean functions mu one mu two and mu three where in first situation we are having a all identical mean function in second situation there is a contamination in the third sample and in the third situation there is contamination in second as well as third sample and in fourth situation there is a completely different mean function uh, uh, than the first and second function in model 2 we are having a non gaussian process uh, and the model 3 is also our non gaussian process so in model 2 and model 3 there are also three different different situations in first situation uh, we uh, we we will have a same mean function in second situation contamination in the third sample and in third situation contamination in second as well as third sample here we are simulating a uh, total uh, 30 uh, sample curves from each sample and the uh, each curve is observed at 30 equidistant point we are using fmd hd and mbd as a depth function uh, 1000 simulations run and uh, 500 permutations for approximating p values is taken so we are using anova test developed by kuwas and all uh, in 2004 for the comparison uh, for comparing performance of our test and this is uh, this routine used to undertake simulation we are developed in r this is our simulation study for model 1 which is the Gaussian model for this model we can see that uh, the uh, performance of our tests are as good as uh, the uh, test developed by Kuwas. And whereas for model two, we are having a good result than the Kuwas test developed by Kuwas. In uh, uh, situation three, when there are a contamination in the second and third sample, we are having more greater value of test statistics second, uh, second than the uh, Kuwa test developed by uh, pro test developed by or test statistic developed by uh, Kuwas. And for the model three, uh, here is also the second. Uh, very good result we are having a good uh, performance of our test than the test proposed by kuwas and what is proposed by kuwas with this i concluded that simulation study our simulation study reveals that proposed tests are performing better than the existing test used for comparison these are some of our results which are uh, which we uh, we already used for our references thank you Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, madam. Thank you, sir, for giving me opportunity. Okay, thank you. Okay. Stop your sharing. Uh, uh, yes, sir. Next, Dr. Somanath. Non parametric test for homogeneity of yes, species sir. assembled. <clears throat> so you have just one minute left. Or 530. 
Okay. <laughs> so so try to complete in five minutes. I hope my uh, screen is visible to you. Yeah, yeah. So good evening, all of you. Uh, I'm going to present my research work entitled some non-parametric test for homogeneity of species assembly. This is joint work with uh, Professor D.T. Shirke, sir, my research guide. This is the outline of my talk. So in this uh, presentation, the, the new word is there, species assembly. First, I shall discuss about what is species assembly and what is the problem of testing homogeneity of species assembly. Species assembly in biology or in ecology, it is nothing but the, all the species that exist in a particular habitat. We will uh, discuss this with, uh, with the help of one example. Suppose we are having one forest which is divided into n plots and we are counting the number of trees of type, number of different trees available in that particular plot. Suppose this is x1 is the number of trees of type 1, x2 is number of trees of type 2 and number of trees of type P. So you can imagine the forest in which the different number of trees will be very high. That means the dimension of this P dimension of this particular data is very high as compared to this year. So this two is nothing but in plot one, there are two trees of type two. So like that, suppose if that particular forest is divided into two parts by say river. So, uh, and in first, in first part, we have N1 plots and in second uh, part, we have N2 plot and we want to test whether these uh, tree space joint distribution of this particular random vector is same for both the part or not. This is nothing but the problem of testing homogeneity. If we are having such K partitions, this is the problem of multi-sample uh, testing homogeneity of space species of this multi-sample problem. So this is the formal uh, problem. I will not go just now. I have explained with the help of example. We have K samples, which denotes the count, which is abundance data. And the F1, F2, Fk be the joint distribution of those K. And we want to test whether these are identical or they are not equal. So we have proposed a test based on data depth. The concept of data depth is just earlier speaker has explained this. Uh, so there are well-known depth functions. To case half spread depth is there, robust Malnovich depth is there. But these well-known majors are not suitable for this, uh, this type of data, abundance data, because of high dimension uh, is the first issue. And second issue is, as the majority of the zeros are, zeros are more frequent in that particular. So uh, Bray Curtis has defined a distance uh, to measure the distance between two observations. This is the formula for uh, formula given by Bray and Curtis. And Lee and others in 2011 has defined one distance based depth to, uh, which is most suitable for such type of data. This is the uh, definition of distance based depth. Here D denotes the distance. For this particular problem, distance defined by Bray and Curtis is used. We call here onward, we will refer this as a Bray Curtis distance based depth. This is sample version. If we have n observations, then how to estimate? This is the formula for that. So, what we have did uh, first, Lee and others have developed a test for testing. Uh, homogeneity of spacing accessibility for two groups. And this test is of Kolmogros Murino type and Kramer one Mises type. So what is the idea? Combine these observations from two groups, compute its depth with respect to first group and second group. Then we will have DFNZ, DGNZ for all the observations in combined sample. Then take absolute of the difference and the square difference supremum of that and summation of that. They have considered these two uh, test statistics. We have extended these tests for multi-sample problem. How I shall explain, I shall explain with the help of one uh, data set. Suppose we have these three groups, combine these samples, 
for every observation come put depth with respect to first group second group third group and then come put its minimum and maximum now we have got only binary data so we can use the same test defined by those in 2011 this is the idea for simulation purpose we uh, Uh, for performance evaluation we have conducted a simulation study we have generated a, a random observations from poisson log normal distribution poisson gamma distribution and poisson wibble distributions these are the uh, di di multivariate discrete distributions i will not go into the details few scenarios two scenarios we have considered like uh, f1 is poisson log normal with mu1 mu sigma1 f2 is poisson log normal f3 is again poisson log normal with different mean function and uh, mean vector and variance covariance matrix so uh, this is first scenario and in second scenario we have considered three situations in first sample is generated from poisson log normal second is from poisson log normal and third is from poisson gamma so it is um, they are heterogeneous so this has to be detected or uh, by the test so this is the result of the simulation study for comparison purpose we have uh, used the test defined by this uh, these authors so this is when location change is there this table is for scale change and this is for scenario second so in all the cases it has been observed that our test is as far as power is considered our test is performing better and within between our these two tests the test tcm is performing better than tks so this is one real data set uh, real data set we have analyzed which is uh, of uh, baro carlo island three count data set is there and that uh, island is divided uh, depending on the slope it has been divided into three uh, groups and we have seen whether the joint distribution is same or not and the p value of the all the test rejects the null hypothesis it indicates that the joint distribution differs with respect to these three group this is these are the conclusions permutation test for problem of homogeneity of species assemblies are proposed their performance is studied by simulation both the proposed tests are performing better and between these two tests tcm is better than tks thank you these are some references thank you thank you very much uh, dr somnath yes uh, my one query is there uh, you are told that in the plot if there are extra zeros are there yes excess zeros are there yeah so can you apply any zero inflated model there actually uh, here the problem is so different we want to compare these two groups and uh, this uh, break root is distance takes care of that but i shall see whether some zero inflated uh, distributions uh, can be used i will see uh, i shall think in that direction okay okay thank you okay Uh, I hope that all the participants uh, they have. Pardon, sir. Uh, Pardon, sir. Uh, just one more. Uh, Momin, madam, is there? She want to present. Okay. 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 Momin, madam, just share the screen and go to present. Momin, madam, your topic is inventory policy with stock dependent demand. And uh, complete your presentation within five minutes. Omin madam can you hear me You called me and asked requested to you for presentation Is there but what is the problem i don't know oh. Omin madam can you hear me टेक्निकल प्रॉब्लम बेनाट 
হ্যালো इंटरनेशनल कॉन्फ्रेंस एंड ट्राई टू प्रेजेंट सम रिसर्च मे नॉट बी कॉल्ड एज अ रिसर्च but uh, some project work which is given assigned to them they tried very nicely and uh, really appreciate to them and, and uh, your college you is very much your college is leading your college is at leading oh yes 22 students are registered oh yeah 22 students and uh, five teachers yeah okay total maybe 25 uh, 22 okay thank you very much once again uh, i hope that this session is uh, completed so continue with your next program yes uh, thank you patil sir uh, for conducting okay. this last session <clears throat> now we are moving to predictory function स्क्रीन दिस हेलो थैंक यू वेरी मच गुड इवनिंग ऑल ऑफ यू माय टॉपिक ऑफ प्रेजेंटेशन इज इन्वेंटरी पॉलिसी विथ स्टॉक डिपेंडेंट डिमांड जनरली इन इन्वेंटरी मॉडल द इन्वेंटरी पैरामीटर्स सच एज डिमांड रेट डिटरेशन रेट एंड वेरियस इन्वेंटरी कॉस्ट आर कंसिडर टू बी कॉन्स्टेंट इन्वेंटरी इज डिक्रीज मेनली ड्यू टू डिमांड बट डिटरेशन आइटम इज ऑल्सो एन इम्पॉर्टेंट फैक्टर to decrease the inventory level which results into increase in total inventory cost hence in this paper an inventory model for deteriorating item is developed for stock dependent demand further total inventory cost economic order quantity reorder point are obtained and the solution procedure is illustrated by numerical example the sensitivity analysis of the optimum solution with respect to the changes in different parameters is also discussed keywords the basic eoq model developed in 1915 had the specific requirement of constant demand rate and lack of deterioration rate of the items in stock but deterioration of an item plays an important role in the inventory management system deterioration of an item can be defined as decay evaporation dryness damage loss of utility value of 
commodity that results in decreasing the usefulness of inventory from the original condition vegetables fruits gasoline oil milk medicine oh, mean, madam oil. don't read word to word okay okay sir these are the introduction certain models have been developed in the area of deteriorating inventories considering the demand rate to be constant time dependent ramp type or selling price a significant research has been done in constant demand these are the researchers now some assumptions are made while preparing this as this model and these are some notations the figure shows the inventory of our model at time the initial stock level is q at time zero then inventory level decreases due to demand mainly and partially due to deterioration the stock level reaches zero at time t1 the differential equation describing the state of inventory in the interval 0 to t1 is given by equation 1 by solving equation 1 we get the inventory level at any time t and the time at which the inventory get zero that is t2 t1 in equation number 3 by using equation 2 one can obtain the deterioration cost which is expressed in equation 4 and the holding cost in the period 0 to 2 is given in equation 5. The total cost is obtained by adding the holding cost and the deterioration cost which is calculated in equation number 6 and to obtain the minimum optimum order level one can differentiate the total cost in equation 7 with respect to q and equate to 0 and that will come out to be in equation number 9 that is q0 equal to 2a upon b minus theta where a and b are constant and theta is the deterioration rate. Numerical example input we are uh, taken the numerical values a, b, c1 holding cost, deterioration cost, cd, theta deteriorating rate and output are obtained. After this we calculate the uh, we done the sensitivity analysis which is expressed in table number 1.1 1 .1 for the constant deterioration rate theta and the deterioration uh, cost per unit that is 0.3 now conclusion sensitivity analysis for optimum values of total cost optimum order quantity and reorder point of an inventory model are calculated for various values of A, B and holding cost C1. From the table, we may conclude that the total cost, optimum order quantity and reorder point are highly sensitive with the values of A and B. For the increase in <coughs> the values of A and B, the stock dependent demand get decreases, which results into the decrease in total cost. For increase in holding cost and decrease in the stock dependent demand rate, the total cost, optimum order quantity and reorder points are also decreasing, which are shown in table 1.1. These are the references which I use for preparing this model. And thank you. This is my representation. Thank you. Thank you very much, madam. Okay, okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Stop sharing the screen. Sharing stop kara. Exit. Okay. Okay. Sir, continue. Yes. Now, uh, finally, this presentation is completed. Uh, okay. Now we are uh, at the end of the this function uh, that we are uh, starting validity uh, ceremony of uh, today's uh, international conference. So, so what 
this today's uh, valedictory function uh, chief guest is honorable uh, professor dr mrs s b unnoli madam from karnataka university dharwad so okay. i welcome her and also i welcome all the uh, participants and delegates uh, for this last uh, ceremony uh, now i request uh, principal dr b g kore sir Uh, to introduce uh, today's chief guest and we just give prepares to our today's uh, good evening to everybody it is great pleasure to me in the valedictory function as organizer today since from Nine o'clock. Now there is near to six. That is more than eight hours. The participants, the invited speakers, are spent in this international conference. Overall, more than one hundred and six. participants are registered for this conference out of them 35 researchers are the registered for the paper presentation and out of 35 28 researchers have presented their papers the quality of their presentation is really appreciable as an organizer i say that more than expectation beyond my expectation all the participants all the respected invitees are given responses to me today's inaugural function chief guest honorable professor dt sirkesar the note addresser honorable sanjay sethe i really appreciate to professor dr arel sindhe sir till he is present for the valedictory function professor sv but madam and now for the valedictory function as a chief guest professor dr mrs sp munnoli madam is present madam it is great pleasure to me to introduce in this valedictory function madam is presently working as a professor and professor of the statistics in karnataka university darwad she has more than 50 publications in renowned national and international journals she has written some book chapters she has also published the popular articles she has under under her able guidance more than 5 students have completed phd degree till two students are pursuing the phd degree under her able guidance more than 55 times in the conferences seminars she has presented the papers she has delivered invited talks as a speaker in more than 18 times she worked as a resource person in various occasions more than 15 times she has many more responsibilities of the university just as a board of studies board of examination nac equity coordinator etc and etc really i am thankful to munori madam for accepting my invitation it's pleasure as, sir as a chief guest for this very function and it is great pleasure to me to introduce sir once again 
I am thankful to all the participants, invited speakers, chief guests, and present chief guest, Honorable Munori Madam. Thank you. Thank you once again. Thank you. <coughs> Yes, now I request uh, Professor Dr. Uh, Mrs. Uh, Munori Madam to uh, give her valid state address or present again. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Respected Shri Vaibhav Patil, President of Lok Nete, Honorable Hanumantrao Patil, Charitable Trust, Professor D.T. Shirke, Professor S.S. Shete, Patrons, Authorities of this institute, Dr. B.G. Kore, Principal of Adarsh College, Vita, Dr. P.Y. Patil, invitees, participants, an enthusiastic team of organizers and student friends. Indeed, it is a great honor to be part of this valedictory function of the International Conference on Recent Advances in Applied Statistics organized by Department of Statistics of Loknete Honorable Anumantrao Patil Charitable Trust Adarsh College, Vita. This international conference is organized in collaboration with Shivaji University's Statistics Teachers Association. At the outset, I would like to express my appreciation to all the organizing team for having conducted the conference so meticulously. This is possible only when we have uh, a supportive and encouragement uh, uh, patterns and authorities. And uh, now coming to the participants, uh, I think in the journey of your life, this day is one of the most remembered days of your life because you have spent a quality time with great statisticians, industrialists, and co-researchers. A variety of talks on different fields of statistics, such as causal effect, non-parametric estimation, statistics in life science, monitoring of simple linear profile, process capability indices have been deliberated. About 28 research papers were contributed on wide spectrum of theoretical statistics and their applications. I congratulate all those budding statisticians who presented their work on this platform. And definitely, this conference has given you more clarity about the work that you have to proceed with. Also, some of the participants got motivated to study more by attending this conference. Friends, as long as your desire to explore is greater than your desire, not to screw up, think that you are on the right track. You have to use appropriate words to move an idea from one point to another effectively. And such conferences provide the platform to do this. So dear teacher fellows and students, please keep doing good research, discuss with your mentors, share it with co-researchers and improvise the findings. Time has changed. Research aids are handy. Nowadays, we need, need not toss the coin, say, 50,000 times or 60,000 times to enumerate probabilities as our elders had to do. Computers, software, programming languages are for our aid to validate our research. If you are well versed with Excel and R programming, 90% of your research can be progressed. Knowing C, C++, Python would be an added advantage. However huge data our study has, we have cloud computing platform, data analytics, machine learning techniques to substantiate our research. When we were doing PhD, we had to wait for three to six months to get a research article of our interest. Now, this time has reduced to three to six hours. This is because the libraries are interlinked. Only thing is, 
you have to explore all facilities and make best use of them. The need of the hour is to convince the society that the fruits of statistics are very much needed for happy, healthy life. And let all of us try hard not to let this tree of statistics get dried up. The efforts of organizers is commended only when you all the participants and students have made best use of this opportunity and come up on canvas of statistics with flying colors. At the same time, be a proud alumni, proud senior, proud neighbor. Madam, I think you are. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. At the same time, be a proud alumni, proud senior, proud neighbor, proud citizen by helping your alma mater, juniors, siblings, and a kid living in your neighborhood. Be courageous in all walks of life. I wish you all the best for your bright future. And once again, congratulations to Professor Koren, Dr. P.Y. Patil, and the army of organizing team. Very meticulously we have organized this, sir. And thank you. Thank you, one and all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, one thing I want to add this: anyone has to give feedback. Orally, from participants or invited speakers, is welcome. Hello. Okay, welcome, sir. Uh, uh, I am Kosti Vivi from PVP College, Kautamanka. Yes. Uh, uh, the conference is uh, organized very nice. All the invited talks and all the papers presented are very nice. In all, the conference is very nice, especially for researchers and students. So thanks to all the organizers and participants. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Sindhu sir, you have to say. Hello, hello sir. Good evening to all of you. Yes. Uh, I have gone through almost 90% presentations and uh, invited talks, everything. Very good conference. And uh, it was good attempt at university uh, college level also. But uh, uh, you know, uh, Shivaji University as well as your college have taken good initiative and uh, organized very well planned conference. And uh, I am congratulating Professor uh, Kore for full day he is available for, for this conference. And one more uh, important issue is there was no network issue from your side. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, almost 100% it was successful. Generally, uh, virtual conferences, people are uh, experiencing those problems. But even though at college level, you have maintained this properly and it is good experience. That is why the conference is successful because each and every word one should listen properly in uh, virtual conferences, it is as good as like a physical conference. Yeah, yes. And uh, we are very happy to uh, see you in this conference and all experts. Uh, I offer my best wishes to college, Professor Principal uh, Kore and uh, uh, Dr. Patil and uh, your team. And I hope this college will grow like anything. Thank you. Thank you. Best wishes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Also, time is also managed. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yes, thank you for your encouraging uh, remarks and uh, guidance and encouraging uh, young researchers. Uh, thank you, madam. Thank you, sir. Now, I request uh, Mrs. M.B. Shinde, convener of uh, today's function, uh, to give vote of thanks. A very good evening to all. I am Ms. M. B. Shinde, ma'am, Assistant Professor, Adarsh College, Vita. It gives me an immense pleasure to deliver the vote of thanks for this event to all dignitaries assembled here. I would like to thank 
chief guest of this validatory function honorable professor dr mrs s b muloni ma'am karnataka university dharwad who honored this function with her valuable knowledge i would like to thank you our beloved principal coordinator staff members students participants volunteers and last but not least our beloved participants for making this event a grand successful lastly i mention thanks to one and all everybody thank you thank you thank you very much one one thing i want to announce here all the participants have give the feedback form feedback form is already i have shared once you get uh, i get the feedback form from you i will circulate you the your certificates of participation okay and within 2 3 days i will uh, circulate you the uh, souvenir of this conference all it is almost ready thank you thank you very much thank you sir congratulations sir and thank you thank you so much thank you sir thank you you are participant thank you thank you sir shall i leave yeah yes sir yes, yeah. yes, sir. yes thank you sir. it was a great honor sir thank you yeah. no no <laughs> very much thank you to you yeah thank you thank you Omna sir, thank you. Patil sir, congratulations. Uh, you have handled this whole day. I, I, <laughs> special last time to thank this network. This last time to thank this network. At the last moment, you are given the responsibility. Yes, yes, yes. Special uh, thank from, from, from my side. I mean, <laughs> also we have to thank this technology also. Congratulations, uh, Patil sir. Congratulations. Oh, thank you, madam. Actually, this is for Korea, sir. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, Korea, sir. Thank you, thank you, madam. Thank you very much. Ah, uh, congratulations to all the organizers. Really, really, I'm very much happy. The great success is only by uh, only by your cooperation. Oh, thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Shall I end the meeting? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. Okay, we'll end the meeting. Good evening to all of you. Patil sir, once again, thank you. Yes, sir. Yes. Good evening.